Okay, well, I think we can go ahead and get started. We want to make sure that we um, keep to our time today. I'm sure everyone's time is valuable and you have um, things to do this afternoon. Um, so let me introduce myself. I'm Deborah Chapman. I'm the Associate Dean and the Director of Graduate Studies at the University of South Alabama. Um, I'd like to welcome you to our workshop um, on TTP, Transition to Practice, um, focusing on cybersecurity. Dr. Alec Yazensak, Professor of Computer Science here at South, and myself have been working with the Trusted CI Group over the past couple of years working on cybersecurity TTP. Alec, would you like to introduce yourself as you take a big sip of your Coke? <laughs> sure. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I have uh, been working with uh, Deborah now for two or three or four years, with Michael Chambers uh, for two or three or four years before that. Oh, a lot of thanks to the Trusted CI Group uh, and to Anita Nikolic, and to several of, uh, to, of the other uh, uh, members at uh, National Science Foundation that helped us get this going. Uh, of course, I owe the biggest thanks to, to uh, Becky Bass and her. Uh, she was a tremendous contributor to this effort early on. And uh, I am she, she did so much good work in this that, that blazed a trail that's allowed us to keep it going. We're very happy to be where we are. We're extremely happy to have each of you on this call. I hope that you find the uh, workshop to be helpful to you. And if you uh, hopefully it will give you more resources that allow you to carry on in the future and to do a better job of uh, transitioning our funded cybersecurity research uh, into practice. That's really our goal. And so if you don't pick up tidbits, let me know and I'll point you to resources later on. But uh, keep your eyes open because there's going to be a lot of good stuff, I think, through the next uh, next two sessions of the next two days of the uh, workshop. Thank you, Deborah. Um, so as we said, this workshop is funded through an NSF supplemental grant um, with the Trusted CI team, which is headed up by Jim Basney at, at Illinois. Jim will have a presentation at three, but Jim, is there anything you'd like to say now? Um, nope, uh, just uh, looking forward to the workshop. Thanks everybody for coming. Okay, um, so just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, everyone should have received a copy of the agenda. Um, I have it on the screen right now. Um, we'll work today um, till about 3.45 and then take a short break. Um, we have a couple of presentations um, on working with the university research offices and the trusted CIS TTP um, project or program. After the break, um, Florence Hudson is going to talk to us about academic and entrepreneurial collaborations. Um, and then we'll close for the day. And then tomorrow we'll come back and have um, some good sessions, um, a panel discussion and some lightning talks and Q&A um, tomorrow. Um, housekeeping again um, we have over 90 people registered so people will probably be coming in and um, go, coming out throughout um, the workshop please be sure to mute your connection except um, if you're speaking or a um, asking questions um, probably the best way to handle questions is going to be to put them in the chat and we'll try and get to them um, at the end of the segment if you have any problems or issues um, you can email me directly um, my email address is dchapman at southalabama.edu um, we did have um, NSF funded supplements for the first 30 people who registered and attend both sessions. So if you're one of these people, you will be contacted next week with mm -hmm. details for how that will be um, handled. So um, just as an introduction for those that are not aware, um, as um, starting out the workshop, NSF, uh, I'm sorry, TTP is transition to practice. Um, NSF spends billions of dollars um, on research, including cybersecurity research, that at the end of the grants um, term ends up sitting on a shelf and is not being used. So TTP is the process of determining if some of these results are appropriate to develop into a fully functional product or business, and if so, how to go about um, doing that. Um, the workshop will discuss some of the benefits and downsides of TTP and some of the best practices associated with it. So we are going to start with a session on working with university research offices. Um, Dr. Michael Chambers is the Associate VP of Research here at the University of South Alabama, and he will be presenting um, on, on this topic. Uh, so as Deborah said, my name is Michael Chambers. I'm the Associate Vice President of Research and Economic Development here at South. Um, in this position, I serve as Director and PI of the uh, i -Core site from NSF. And I've also had the privilege of serving as site director and PI of a IUCRC, which was focused on digital forensics. And uh, this is an IUCRC that Dr. Yassensack put together and organized, and he uh, deserves all the credit. And I just had the honor of, of uh, 
uh, managing the process for a while. Uh, I am not a, a career academician. I've been here about eight years. Uh, I have a law degree and a PhD. Before that, uh, I practiced law for a while and then having a love for business, uh, started a pharmaceutical company, uh, then sold it. And that one was for ocular drug delivery, then another one for ovarian diagnostics um, and <clears throat> had some time working as chairman of the board for a NASDAQ listed company. So what I'm going to talk about today is very general to tech transfer. Uh, and most of it, it comes from in the context of having a lot of scar tissue uh, in the business area. Uh, so I'm happy to answer any questions that any of you might have. And I've Put, and let me just uh, pull up the chat here. If it's, I ask you uh, in the chat to give me an idea of what question you would like answered uh, during this webinar. And it can be general, it can apply to something other than tech transfer, but specifically if you have one related to tech transfer, uh, send, it, send it to me. You're happy to post it uh, for everyone to see in response, or you can do it uh, specifically to me so that other people cannot see uh, who sent the question, if you'd like to handle it that way. So the first thing I wanted to do is talk a little bit about uh, what's happening today in the last decade and last couple of decades. What I find very interesting is the speed of change. Uh, and I think this is critical when you think about your technology, uh, because we come now from an academic uh, framework uh, and we're used not particularly used sometimes to working at the speed of business. Uh, and the speed of business has increased dramatically in the last couple of decades and literally in the last uh, 100 years. If you look at aviation, for example, uh, you know, the Wright brothers flew 30 yards roughly 100 years ago. Uh, and then all of a sudden Lindbergh, 20 years later, flew across the Atlantic. In 1969, we landed someone on the moon. And in Mobile, Alabama, for example, at the turn of this century, year 2000, there was no aviation or aerospace. Today, 23 years later, and literally it, it happened, started in 2012, we are the fourth largest manufacturer of commercial aircraft in the world. And we'll be putting out 16 A220s uh, and A320s monthly uh, in the coming years. And you know whether it's Mobile, Alabama, or throughout the United States and the world, things are happening much, much faster. If you go back 100 years ago, uh, there were roughly 2 billion people on this planet. Today, there are over 7 billion uh, people on the planet. And that has implications for business, for uh, resources, obviously. Medicine is uh, a fascinating one to me. Uh, at the turn of the last century, or going back to the 1900s, there were four, four things that killed 90% of Americans. And now those four things kill less than 5% of Americans. At that time, uh, Wilbur Wright, when he died in 1912, was 45 years old. The life expectancy of a male in the United States in 1912 was 48 years old. Now, adjusted somewhat for the pandemic, uh, for men, it's roughly 76 and it's 82. If you have children or grandchildren and they live right, there are very smart people predicting that they will easily live beyond 100 years uh, or more. We, if you're uh, familiar a little bit with medicine, uh, the advent of what we call CRISPR-Cas9, it's a gene editing tool. Uh, two women, uh, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier, received the Nobel Prize for discovering this gene editing tool, which has literally opened up the world of personalized medicine. And computing, here's a trick question for you. Um, what do these things have in common? A camera, a radio, a camcorder, a level, a compass, a weather radio, a guitar tuner, GPS, scanner, encyclopedia? Well, I mean, the answer is this. Uh, January 9th, 2007 was the birth of the smartphone. Before that time, all the things I just mentioned had manufacturers, distributors, retailers, think Radio Shack. And that's from 2007. So a lot of things have changed and they've happened very, very quickly. So I just wanted to 
give that kind of slight introduction before we go into some of the other items to get everyone's mind thinking about it's it's the speed at which we're able to work now that is very critical as well. So um, these are the consequences. You have to work faster, you have to work smarter, and you have to know the market. And critically, you have to know, deliver what customers want. Uh, if there's one message coming out of NSF and NIH and others, it's basically, uh, you know, from uh, uh, from lab to bedside, and really the, the thrust of this webinar is transition to practice. NSF, for example, gives away $7 billion to universities uh, throughout the United States every year, and whether it's i or some of the other programs that they've launched, they want to see a return on that investment. And that literally is being able to uh, deliver something that customers want or that uh, customers or patients actually need. So diving into tech transfer uh, just for uh, a, a little while here. This, if you looked at the South website, this is what you might see. And I just wanted to dwell on a few of the items. Uh, if you look down at the bottom, uh, you know, the tech transfer office is where a lot of the resources that if you have an invention or a technology that might be commercialized, this is the group, whether it's called tech transfer or here it's the Office of Commercialization and Industry Collaboration. Great name. We still call it tech transfer just because it's easier. But this is where you will find most of the resources that, that you might need. So if you look down at the bottom, if you have an in invention, typically the procedure is you file an invention disclosure so that it's clear that you came up with the idea, when you came up with the idea, and you include some language in that disclosure that demonstrates you reduce this idea to practice. And of course, the rationale there is this gives something for your tech transfer office to analyze, perhaps do a market assessment, which we'll talk about in just a second, perhaps file patents, which we'll talk about as well. But you, you also then can have what we call a commercialization roadmap. And I'll show you an example of that a little later. It shows the different steps that one might see along the way. Now, here's another thing that you might uh, find useful. Most or many tech transfer offices have a portal where they post all the technologies that are available for license uh, at your particular university, for example. So if you were an inventor and uh, tech transfer had your invention disclosure, perhaps filed a patent, then it would be posted here in the hopes that someone might, from a company, see that technology when they're looking and uh, be interested in licensing it. So this is a very convenient tool for tech transfer offices to use to uh, market your technology and that of others. Now, conversely, uh, you could also uh, do a little due diligence on your own, seeing what other technologies at your institution are similar to yours, or you could go to some other institutions and see what technologies they have that are being offered that may be similar to yours as well. So it cuts both ways. So tech transfer done best should be something like a one-stop shop for people who have ideas, inventions, and want to get their idea or technology into the marketplace or to help people. Uh, typically, you might find a listing for available seminars, which would teach you about uh, you know, patents in general, maybe about copyrights, particularly in the uh, computing space. Uh, so there would be opportunities for you to learn about that process. Um, also something FAQs frequently ask questions. Usually a tech transfer office will have a list of those that where they will try to answer most of your questions that you might have. Uh, the other thing that you will see uh, are likely forms. So for example, there may be examples of material transfer agreements. There may be examples uh, or a form for a student research agreement or a non-disclosure. Uh, I'll tell you, those are there as uh, in most cases for you to know that they exist. It's not in most cases an invitation for you to take that form and unilaterally sign it on your own and send it to a company and have them sign it. And for reasons we'll talk about in a second, 
uh, you may not have authority to sign the agreement, and perhaps it should be edited or tweaked uh, to be broader uh, than you perhaps thought. But the other thing that you can find there, too, are policies, the policies of the university about intellectual property, in, including patents and copyrights, but also policies that may impact your ability to serve in a certain role for a startup or, or with a company that licensed. There may be limitations on what you can do, uh, even though you were an inventor. So that would be under the area of conflict of interest. And that's an area where you really want to get it right, because you can get at odds with your institution uh, pretty quickly if you don't. And I mentioned the commercialization roadmap, which we'll take a look at in a second. So how can tech transfer help you? Well, what they can do is help you on the patentability uh, of your particular idea of technology, whether it might be copyrighted. And then a somewhat overlooked area of intellectual property is know-how. And this could be described as you know method, but th there are method patents, but there are some things that people do that may not rise to the level of a patent, for example, or copyright, but it's the way you do it and knowing how to do it that could be protected. Now, typically that would be protected uh, in a non-disclosure agreement, but uh, you would make sure that in that non-disclosure agreement, it was clear that this was know-how. The other thing tech transfer can, can help you with are barriers to entry. So what does that mean? Well, a patent or a copyright is a barrier to entry. What that means is you're trying to prevent other folks from marketing or benefiting from your proprietary idea, whether it's a patent or a copyright. And the reason, obviously, barriers are, to entry are so important is when you or the university wants to sell or license that idea, the value of that uh, is determined uh, in part by how effectively you can keep other people out of this market or how big a mark, part of the market uh, you and your idea will actually uh, be. And that raises the concept of a commercial assessment. The other thing tech transfer can invest in, in you, is they can take your idea, your product, and do what's called a commercial assessment. Uh, most, perhaps not all, tech transfer offices will farm these out to specialists who will look at your invention disclosure, uh, then do an analysis uh, of the market, the market size, maybe take a look at some of the patents and determine you know, what is the relative value uh, of your idea or technology. And they do that by looking at the next category, the, the market, the size, and who's already, who's already in the market that does in fact have the ability to compete. Uh, the other thing that tech transfer can do in many cases is provide you with industry contacts. So for example, they may have already been dealing with Pfizer or Cisco or Novartis or whoever, uh, and they know the people that you should contact. And that's a lot different uh, when someone from your university who has a warm contact at the company emails them or calls them about your technology rather than uh, someone on the faculty just sending a random email to someone they think by virtue of their LinkedIn title means that this would be their area. Um, so it's a much, much better way to start the process. So the specific help areas are general advice, invention disclosures, uh, non-disclosure agreements, or sometimes called confidential disclosure agreements, uh, and license templates. Uh, license templates, I'd just like to draw your attention to those because there are some forms out there put out by people like uh, Autumn and others that are kind of generally considered a, a standardized form that sometimes people try to agree to, whether industry and a university, but they, they can vary. So for example, um, when I was on the private sector side, I never even sent my preferred template for a license to a university because I knew the likelihood of a university changing their form was almost, it was negligible because that form has gone through multiple layers of counsel and critique. Um, and in many cases, like at the University of South Alabama, 
because we are, in fact, a public institution, part of the state of Alabama, literally, we cannot um, agree to the application of another state's law. So that's usually one that always comes up. We never agree to indemnify anyone else for that same reason. So there are little quirks like that that appear in the license agreements of your particular state or uh, institution. Uh, specific help areas I've already mentioned on programming, which are, could be very helpful. And then the other thing is once you progress uh, along this commercial commercialization roadmap, which we'll see in a second, you're going to be looking, uh, at least if you're in startup mode, for funding resources. So much of the time we spend as people move along this development timeline from convention disclosure, patent filing, maybe an SBI or STTR, then they're looking for money from the private sector, whether it's angel funding um, or at some point um, venture funding. And then if much farther along, uh, private equity sources, uh, we can, Tech Transfer can provide information about that timeline and about whether people are ready. One of the biggest mistakes some startups make is thinking they're ready for venture funding when they're really not ready at all. Uh, so Tech Transfer can give you advice on those issues as well. So this is a little bit um, what the invention disclosure process uh, could look like. So I'm looking from, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but you start here in the top left, you make the discovery, you submit an invention report, uh, then tech transfer typically will sit down with you at a meeting and go over it and uh, discuss um, kind of what the idea is, um, potential ideas on the market. So tech transfer will review the invention report, discuss it with you as an inventor, um, and then make a decision. And the, and the decision is really, are they gonna go forward? And this is tech transfer. Are they gonna go forward with your idea and pay for a provisional patent application or are they not? And when they do not, this longer arrow coming down to the uh, lighter uh, royal blue, I guess, is they uh, make a decision not to do that. And if you're an inventor, uh, my advice to you at that point is, you don't want to lose the opportunity to uh, file a patent or uh, copyrights are much easier, but you you could ask them to simply, if they're not interested, the university, assign the technology to you, and then you could have the patent filed. But the process would be, you know, filing, in most cases, a provisional patent application, and those range, usually, they're very general, they're much like just putting a couple of tent stakes in the ground to say, you know, this is this is my area. Uh, they're usually in the range of uh, three to ten thousand um, dollars because they don't take that much time to put together. But then you're on a timeline, and uh, roughly a year later, you're required to file what's called a non-provisional, and that will cost uh, much more money. So one of the issues in this process is who's paying those bills. If the university um, likes the idea and intends to pursue it, then the university will be footing that bill. Um, so here you're moving along this timeline for intellectual property protection and then actually uh, publishing on that basis. Obviously, um, I'm sure you all know that you don't want to publish before you have that intellectual property protection nailed down. So this is... Uh, Oops, kind of small print here, but it just gives you an idea in a little more detail. You go from the top left, the start, to the market analysis, um, and then you're going through due diligence. Um, you know, on, on the far right where you end, you either end at the top of marketing and licensing your technology, and you see some of the categories that um, become relevant, field of use, um, the geographic region someone might have if they license your technology, how many, how much must they pay up front, uh, and then milestones. And, and what are milestones? Milestones um, are those deliverables that someone who licenses your technology must achieve to keep the license alive. And why do we why do we do that? Well, 
if we license, say, your technology to a company and then it just appeared, wow, they've got another competing technology in the hopper and they're doing nothing with your technology, we don't want them just to hold your technology hostage. So we have these milestones that they have to achieve. In the healthcare context, it might be, you know, successful filing of a um, IND um, or, you know, um, providing the once approved uh, by the FDA or treatment of X number of patients, but it's milestones keep people honest. And on the startup side, to flip that a little bit, uh, if it's a startup, whether it's yours or someone else, and you're just not able to achieve those possible milestones, the university doesn't want to be put in a position that they are just married, so to speak, uh, to a young startup, whether it be yours or someone else's, without having the ability to go, okay, we've given you a chance to um, commercialize this. It's not working out. You can't raise the money. Uh, we're going to pull back the license and um, go with a larger company and see if there's any interest, for example. So if you, whoops, keep, um, if you look in the middle there, a development plan uh, and de-risking, that is what happens most of the time. Most of the time, a mentioned disclosure comes in, it's not ready to be marketed and licensed. Usually there's some proof of concept required. Um, a development plan should probably, should be uh, implemented kind of laying out what's going to happen in the next, uh, say, 24 months. Uh, and what you're doing there is you are de-risking this technology, but you're also increasing the value to the university and to you because the less risk the technology has, the greater the value in the eyes of someone who might license it. All right. Now, how is revenue distributed uh, at a university? And I can tell you, this is uh, kind of what we do here at South. This will change everywhere. So uh, you cannot assume that this is what your particular institution does, but it does give you an idea of what happens to the money. So you come up with an invention, you, uh, you de-risk it, and we license your technology to a, a large corporate player. Well, at South, what we do is, if you look at the top line, that's the gross revenue of royalties that come in. The first thing that happens is we take 10% off the top, and that 10% goes to the foundation for research and commercialization. If uh, we have a foundation that's only about 10 years old, but it's modeled after WARF, the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation. And if, you have, if you've never heard of WARF, uh, it is huge. They have over 2 billion in their foundation. They routinely deliver about 160 million in faculty support every year uh, to their Madison campus. So that's really the, that's what everyone wants to have in their foundation because you're taking money that's come from research and you're turning it right back around and financing some of the programs that faculty should benefit from or maybe seed funding pools, or maybe payment of patent expenses, et cetera. But if you look in the, um, column, or rather the row across beginning net revenue, we split it up according to how much comes in. So the first 10,000, the inventors get the most. If it gets over 50,000, that goes down. Uh, and then other folks get more because there's more to share. So that's, I think, pretty common at most institutions between the inventors, the inventors department, uh, and then a uh, foundation SAMSEF here at South is the medical side of the house. And you can see uh, as you get 50,000 and up, we have a US, USA Innovation Investment Fund and some of the money would go into that fund as well. So again, this is uh, purely an example of how it's handled uh, here at South, but it's likely that at your institution it's handled in a similar way. And I should add that it says inventors. So if you um, have a partner or a colleague and both of you invent something, then you will share in that uh, royalty stream. Now, if, and this is a word of warning to you, many times all inventors are not created equal. Maybe someone 
literally had 80% of the good idea and someone else had 20% of the good idea. If that happens, you should let tech transfer know right away. And in many cases, they'll ask you because they'll get uh, people to sign, faculty to sign an agreement. This is the way the um, split should occur, 80-20 or 50-50, whatever. Well, why would you do that? Well, um, you know, let's say you're the inventor and your colleague, uh, Sam, gets hit by a truck and he's no longer here. Then there's a, then there's a, a problem about uh, what's the split. And maybe Sam's family is uh, pretty adamant that it should be 50% when you knew that, you know, you had a handshake deal, it was only 10%. Or what if Sam goes to another institution and the the breakup was not pretty. Uh, unless you've got something in writing detailing what the split should be, uh, then it can be tough to figure out and ultimately could even result in litigation. So let's talk about uh, ownership of intellectual property. And most of you probably know this, but if you work for a university, uh, typically you do not own the intellectual property that you create. Let me say that again. If you work for a university, uh, typically you do not own the technology that you create, but you are the inventor. And as I just uh, showed in the earlier slide, you're entitled to a slice of the royalty stream as the inventor. Well, why, is it, why does it work that way? Well, the university's position is, we're the university, we pay your salary, uh, research is part of what you do. And if you come up with something uh, on our watch, so to speak, then the university owns it, but you are going to be a beneficiary of any benefit that comes from it if the university licenses it. So your status as an employee is really critical under those circumstances. And we're going to talk a little more about uh, some wrinkles to that in a second. But so where do you go to look at for some of this information to uh, figure out what this is? Well, critical documents, you know, if you're at, a, at an institution, a university, you know, the faculty handbook, uh, specific university policy on intellectual property, most everyone has one. Uh, uh, your actual employment contract, take a look and see what it says. Typically, that will adopt the, uh, the terms of the faculty handbook saying that you got a copy uh, and any university policies that will apply. So typically, the contract will just say it's adopting policies. But not always. You may be able to strike a different deal and carve out something. And if you were lucky enough to do that, then your employment contract is going to help you. And I put promotion and tenure policy in here because um, not all efforts to commercialize patent copyright um, are treated equal at institutions throughout the United States. Um, many of the uh, Provisions in a faculty handbook will say that entrepreneurship and innovation and patent applications, invention disclosures are considered in promotion and tenure, uh, but sometimes it's not that specific. And then I would just encourage you, particularly the younger that you are, uh, it's not just your university policy, but take a look at your department policy as well to make sure that it mirrors the university policy assuming it gives you credit for this type of entrepreneurial activity. If it does not, um, there has been an effort um, to put together a form, form language for university policies that give people credit for this type of entrepreneurship and innovation policy. And I believe it's stie.org. That's uh, Stephen Thomas India Echo.org. And I will, I'm not convinced that's right. So when I get off here and finish, I'll look that up and then shoot it to Deborah to make sure. But that's just something else you might consider if your particular university uh, doesn't have it. So what about student inventions? Uh, this has been the policy of South for quite some time. Take a second to read that. So what this says is that if you're a student, um, 
And if it's in the course of your employment, you come up with an invention or you're doing research in a university laboratory uh, as a grad student or a postdoc, uh, or you're doing work that it results relately from your student employment or research responsibilities, or you're doing work under a grant that's faculty directed, then the university owns that technology. So this is kind of the, if you harken back to Harvard and the Zuckerberg days, you may remember um, Harvard, I believe, had some language that said, if you substantially use university resources uh, in coming up with your invention, then it shall be owned by the university. And I think likely that was the case because Zuckerberg had spent two straight weeks, 20 hours a day uh, using the university uh, computers to come up with some of his work. So maybe there was an argument there, but Harvard did not enforce that. And so here, um, what is absent from this? If you look at some of this, if you have someone who is an undergrad, uh, they might slip under the canopy here. So that's something for you to be aware of. In many cases, what we do here at South, if people are working on uh, projects as undergraduates, and I think uh, this may have been something implemented by Dr. Yasensack, um, you know, they sign agreements uh, basically saying that any anything that they come up with under these circumstances is uh, university policy, uh, property rather. So something to be aware of, to check your own uh, policy for students that you have working for you under certain circumstances and make sure that you are protected. So let's talk for a second about uh, particular pathways. So you have an invention or a technology or a product, you go to tech transfer and they say, we love it. Um, you know, we wanna talk to some companies, whether it be Cisco, Pfizer, whatever. So what are some of the key terms that uh, make a difference in the agreements that you should be familiar with? Well, one is um, the scope of the license. So for example, and I'll use healthcare here because it's one I'm familiar with, um, you may have a molecule or uh, a platform technology, so to speak, that's not just for ovarian cancer. It might be for all cancers. And so the negotiation is the university wants to limit that license uh, in scope to perhaps just one indication. Let's say the company on the other side has uh, real expertise in ovarian, but not other stuff but they have dreams of expanding to other types. And this would apply in computing as well. So the university wants a narrow scope, the company wants broader, so there's a negotiation there. Again, the milestones, as I mentioned earlier, uh, can vary depending on whether it's a big company with a lot of resources, maybe more flexible milestones, maybe not, to a smaller company, and you really wanna make sure that um, they get it right. My own experience has been that if you license to a smaller company, you have to realize that not all milestones will be met. And so most of the time we take a pretty flexible approach with startups and younger companies because uh, things always go wrong. Conversely, with larger companies, we might actually take a harder approach to make sure they uh, hit those milestones particularly if we don't see any progress and it looks like they're just holding the technology hostage. And that's why the milestones are there. Uh, and obviously the royalty stream. And I've got an example that we'll play, uh, play with in just a few minutes on how much that royalty should be. Because there are, rep there are resources where you can look by sector to see what particular royalties are typical. Um, now, here's a little bit of a minefield the involvement of inventors. So if we're licensing to a third party company, that company may say, well, Professor Sam, uh, we want you as a consultant because you know all about this. And uh, we want two days of your time every uh, on a weekly basis to help us transition this from you know, the university to our company. Well, uh, there may be and probably are provisions at your university that limit how much time you can actually spend as a consultant under these circumstances 
without it being a conflict of interest, because in theory, you're paid for at least perhaps nine months and perhaps 12 months full time. Uh, and so the issue becomes whether the university concedes that you can spend some time as a consultant to help. And if so, how much of your time can you spend? So this is a little bit of, of something that tech transfer can help you with. You may have to get the particulars from your department, but it is an issue that can cause trouble for you down the road. So let's look at a different path, for example. Let's say tech transfer is not licensing to a large company, but rather to a uh, startup. And this could be your startup or it could be someone else's startup, but the, the uh, key factor here is it's a younger company. So again, the scope might be very limited here because they only have you know, one goal, one expertise, even though they might want a larger scope. Uh, the university is interested in making sure they get this right. And perhaps the university has the ability to license this technology in a different area to someone else. So the milestones might be tighter. The royalty stream might be higher simply because it's a startup. So the university is taking a um, larger risk. Patent expenses, um, that's going to vary by institution, but obviously universities like to other people to pay patent expenses. And so this is from a tech transfer office. Not many people think about this, but let's say you take year one, two, three, four, five. Well, year one, they spend 100000 in patent expenses for technologies. Year two, they're going to be spending some money on all the technology they filed for in year one, but they're going to be new technologies coming in. So year two is probably going to be more money. And then that whole process repeats. New technology comes in in year three, and they're paying for uh, additional filing fees for, you know, the PCT or uh, Patent Cooperation Treaty to file in Europe or other countries. So it's a constant uh, buildup of demand on the resources uh, from the tech transfer office to pay patent expenses. And that's why at some point tech transfer offices can be um, very rigid, I guess would perhaps be a way to say it in, the, in managing their money. And, you know, they may look at your technology or that of a colleague and say, I think it's, you know, it looks good, but we, uh, we're we not gonna, going to uh, pursue a patent application at this time. Could be, they just don't have a lot of money. In those cases, you might wanna say, well, you know, uh, assign the technology to, to me or license it to me or to my friend who has a startup. Um, and again, with the startup, it's the same issue on how much time you can spend. If it's your startup, it's a real minefield. You have to be very careful. If it's some, someone else's startup, it's kind of the, the same list of issues we discussed with a larger company. So uh, these are a little corny, but I thought it might uh, lighten the mood a little bit. So here are a couple of case studies that I thought we could run through quickly. So Professor Smith has learned that some business training might be available through a program on campus called I-Corps. Uh, what's i -Corps and why would it be a good idea to participate? Well, if you're not familiar with i -Corps, it's an NSF program, but it's really a, a kind of typically an eight to 10 week program on rapid commercialization. Uh, student teams, perhaps with a faculty mentor, maybe with an industry representative. This varies from uh, university to university, but typically teams get up to $5,000 to travel, interview potential customers, um, and buy materials and supplies. Here at South, uh, I'm the director of that program, and Deborah Chapman has uh, been a loyal teaching team member for many years. Thank you very much, Deborah. Um, we give them an Innovation Scholar Certificate, and, you know, it's really very simple. This is not a heavy dose of business. Uh, it's really based on a single page document called the Business Model Canvas. And we talk about, you know, customer segments and value propositions. The way I like to explain it is three simple questions. What's the product? Who's the customer? Why will they buy it? Many people have come to me and say, oh, Michael, I have this beautiful molecule. And I say, well, uh, what's the product? Who's the patient? Michael, I have this beautiful molecule. So, uh, 
you know, you need to dig down deeper and figure out, and this very simple tool helps do that. So take a second to read this one. Anybody want to take a shot at tell me what they think the problems are here? This one, this one is kind of interesting because he perfected the software at his current school, but he created it at the last one. So reading just up to there, you would say, well, looks like his former university is the owner. Uh, he's the inventor. Maybe if he perfected it at his current institution, maybe that's an improvement uh, on the technology. Uh, but it looks like it could have been reduced to practice at its former university. But then you read further, and the breakthrough came from the work of an unpaid intern, an undergraduate student, who did the work on his home computer. Well, you remember our conversation earlier about if they're unpaid, if they're an undergraduate, and then they're doing the work at home, not at school, uh, then the inventor may in fact be the student, not the professor, which may mean maybe the ownership belongs to the student, not the uh, university. Uh, and so obviously a problem. Take a look at this one. So, Professor Smith gets a suite of anti-malware tools. He wants to uh, uh, perhaps patent these. And uh, he wrote and published an abstract that specifically described the key elements. He's not worried because if he recalls, he has a year to file a patent application. So what are the issues? Well, obviously he has disclosed uh, to the world the key elements of the technology. Um, I think the 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 emphasis here is that perhaps he reduced it to practice before he published this, but the world changed in the United States for patents in 2013. Before that time, it was all about who, who patented it first, who reduced it to practice first. And in 2013, we joined the rest of the world and it became we became a country of first to file. So if you have an invention uh, you need to separate from the disclosure. That's a separate problem. Uh, it's And someone else, maybe later than you, comes up with the idea. Now it's whoever files first. So uh, this demonstrates why it's important for you. Once you think you have enough to patent or copyright, make your way to the tech transfer office, engage them, and uh, get them to move on it. And if they're not moving as fast as you think you should, uh, be a sharp stick because it's it's your invention and your revenue stream through royalties. All right, um, scenario four, take a look at this one. So, Professor Smith has two great students, Bubba and Buffy. Uh, he gets them to form a new startup, and license the technology from them. He uh, negotiates a 10% royalty and secures to himself 80% of the equity non-dilutable. Well, what, is, what does that mean? Well, it means anything that happens from a commercialization viewpoint, there's a 10% royalty to the professor. Uh, I can tell you that in many circumstances, that would be artificially high, depending on how much money had to be spent to develop the technology. With uh, computing, maybe not. Healthcare, absolutely, given the timeline required. What does that mean, 80% of the equity in the new company? That means 80% of the ownership of the new startup uh, belongs to Professor Smith, and however many shares they sell down the road trying to raise money, Professor Smith will still own 80%. So this is an excellent example of what I would call a huge wart, so to speak, that would prevent this company from success because Professor Smith has been too greedy, too unreasonable, 
and having uh, non dilutable non dilutable uh, non dilution equity provisions is pretty much a killer when you're trying to raise significant money. All right, so I think this is the last one. Take a look at this one. So two professors, partners. Um, Professor Smith gives Hacker Hank 50% of the stock of the startup. Then Hank moves on and he's working at a competing institution and it's actually uh, the arch nemesis of Professor Smith. And they take the core research and take it to the next level. So Professor Smith is furious and decides to cancel all of Hank's stock. Well, uh, as I'm fond of saying, uh, Love may be fleeting, but equity is forever. So the point here is before you think about giving someone equity in your, your startup or uh, think very hard whether they're going to be executing on the business plan, because that makes a huge, huge difference. Uh, you can hire lawyers, you can hire accountants, and it's much cheaper to pay them, believe it or not, than it is to give them equity. Um, and if you're not familiar with stock options, Typically, the way this could be handled is as you pull new people into your company, you give them stock options that they earn over time. Uh, and, you know, if they stay with you a year, they get X. They stay another year, they get, you know, X times two. Uh, and that's the way it typically does it. People do it. And they set aside a pool of shares for the startup uh, to reward the management team and other people on an advisory board, for example. So um, the biggest mistakes you can make uh, really not managing the whole process, uh, getting involved, knowing who you're working with, getting the agreements signed, non-disclosures, student research agreements. Uh, you can really make a bad mistake by publishing too early before you get patent protection. Uh, you can really get in trouble with your institution if you start signing documents, forms that you find online and think that you have authority to sign them. And of course, you may not have. Um, and conflicts of interest when you're doing things that are perhaps are outside your employment relationship and may not have realized it. Uh, so things that you need to be aware of. All these things, uh, in theory, could be resolved if you work and reach out with your tech transfer office. So that is the end of the uh, presentation. I'm going to pull up chat and just see if we have any questions. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Chambers? I'm looking here. Well, one of the questions from Anita is what IP considerations should PIs think about when approaching their tech transfer offices and how should they be prepared to think about IP as research is progressing? So, <clears throat> Anita, I'm not sure this is what you're talking about, but as you you should think of intellectual property as an evolving process. You don't just file once and that's the idea. Typically, I've never worked on anything that hasn't been different by the end and the time I sold it. So it's an evolutionary process. So you may file for an, an initial idea and then you have an improvement and you need to file on that improvement as well. Um, and you have to be careful as you bring other people into the research because you may have to include those people uh, on the patent for the improvement because if they're not included, it could affect uh, your overall patent. So uh, TTP funding proposal. Yes, some tech transfer offices can help you pr perform an initial commercial assessment or develop a preliminary commercialization plan. Uh, I will say it depends on the infrastructure of your tech transfer office, how well staffed they are. Um, with some tech transfer offices, that could be a challenge. All right. I think those are all the ones that fell into my, my area. We're at 258, Deborah, so. Perfect. Thank you so much, Michael. All right. Well, it was a 
pleasure and honor to talk to everyone. And I, I know I didn't say this at the beginning, but I'm sure there are some people on this call that know more than I do. So uh, be gentle in your critique, but I'm happy to um, help anyone. My email address is down at the bottom of the slide. If I can help in any way, please let me know. Thanks, Michael. All right. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Alec. Take care. Okay, so from here, we're going to turn things over to um, Jim, Jim Vasney with the Trusted CI uh, program. It's very good to be with you today, and um, uh, that was a, a great presentation uh, by Michael. Thank you, Dr. Chambers. Um, that's a great lead-in to, uh, to what I'll be talking about today. Um, so I am uh, Jim Basney from NCSA at the University of Illinois, and I'm director of Trusted CI, the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. And I'll be talking about the uh, cybersecurity TTP program in Trusted CI that was developed primarily by Florence Hudson and Ryan Kaiser. Uh, Florence is um, in the workshop with us today and she'll be presenting after me. So um, uh, all the good ideas in this presentation probably came from Florence. If, if I get anything wrong, it's definitely my fault. So um, uh, the kudos to, uh, to Florence for all the help that she gave to Trusted CI in building up this program. Uh, so uh, just a, an, a quick introduction into Trusted CI, um, where uh, the, as I mentioned, where the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence and the CI in our name is about cyber infrastructure. Um, so we are building, uh, uh, working to build the NSF cybersecurity ecosystem to support trustworthy cyber infrastructure that enables trustworthy science as part of the, the NSF vision. And we're a distributed center. I'm at NCSA, but we have um, team members at Indiana University, University of Wisconsin, Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, Berkeley Lab, and Deborah and Alec at the University of South Alabama, um, our, our partners in um, running this workshop today. So uh, what is cyber infrastructure and how does it relate to cybersecurity TTP? Um, uh, cyber infrastructure is the the hardware and software and, and networks and um, and the, the people that operate it, the organizations that, that operate that infrastructure that enables uh, 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 scientific discovery uh, funded by the National Science Foundation in, in the US. And uh, so as Trusted CI, we're focused on ensuring that the cyber infrastructure in our nation meets the cybersecurity requirements of the researchers that are depending on it. And in terms of cybersecurity TTP, I think we there's there's a couple different ways that cyber infrastructure is really relevant to the, uh, the cybersecurity researcher looking to transition a, a new innovation into practice. The first is... You know, this cyber infrastructure ecosystem has a lot of cybersecurity challenges. And so you might look to the cyber infrastructure operators and the, their operating organizations um, as a source of um, cybersecurity requirements or needs that you might address in your cybersecurity research. Um, it could also be a source of um, uh, uh, partners for piloting your cybersecurity research um, and uh, they might also be a place where your cybersecurity research gets actually deployed in practice in production on an ongoing basis. And so part of my, my goal in being with you today is to help you make those connections between your cybersecurity research and the, this cyber infrastructure ecosystem. So our TTP program is about making those connections so that you as cybersecurity researchers can connect to the cyber infrastructure pr practitioners and the broader community to accept that, uh, to accelerate that cybersecurity TTP uh, transition of the research to practice, uh, be that in academia, industry, government, or via open source. And so we can help with matchmaking between your research innovations and uh, cyber infrastructure practitioners. Uh, we have some resources to help with technical readiness level assessment of your innovation. And um, uh, we already saw from uh, Michael an example of a TTP canvas. Uh, we've got some resources around a TTP canvas and a playbook to help you uh, pr plan your TTP um, process going forward and some success stories that um, might inspire you in your TTP journey. 
So here's a list of some of the uh, cybersecurity TTP success stories on the Trusted CI website um, that you can you can find at that URL, um, uh, varying from you know machine learning and and payment processing, um, uh, multi-party computation. Uh, 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 hardware security and, and behavioral cybersecurity. So looking at uh, a variety of aspects of how to take your um, research results and apply them in practice. Um, and so I'm going to uh, highlight a few of those. Um, the, that second bullet actually has my name by it. Um, one project I worked on, uh, uh, I continue to work on, is about simplifying logon to cyber infrastructure. So I'll, I'll talk about that one. So this uh, project is called CI Logon. And uh, so uh, this is a slide that I presented at the Trusted CI Cybersecurity TTP Workshop back in 2019, when we were just finishing up an NSF grant that had a, a TTP component to it. And we were, um, we were moving into our sustainability model for CI Logon. So, our innovation was around single sign-on and, and federated identity and access management. And the customer base that where we wanted to apply this to is the cyber infrastructure ecosystem that I talked about earlier. So that we wanted to um, you know, solve the challenge of seamless identity and access management for research collaborations. So we had some innovations and we were working on uh, connecting those innovations to the, to the customer base. And so part of what I uh, emphasized in this presentation back in 2019, and is still true today, is that TTP takes time. Uh, our, our first NSF grant on the CI Logon project, I think that was CI Logon 1.0, was over 10 years in the past at this time. Um, and, uh, you know, we looked at programs like SBIR, STTR, and, and i about um, partnering with a startup company on this. And uh, in our case, we found it wasn't really a good match because we wanted to stay in the uh, in the academic world in uh, supporting a research cyber infrastructure. And so, by uh, having that uh, having conversations with our campus TTP office, it was really helpful um, in helping us understand the opportunity, helping us understand our path to TTP for this project, um, as as uh, you heard Michael describe. And um, so the uh, the NSF grant helped us um, do some initial uh, TTP business development and uh, do the transition from um, uh, uh, grant funding to self-supporting under uh, um, a subscription model operated now by the University of Illinois. Um, and I'll say uh, some of the lessons learned that um, that I talked about back in 2019 and still hold uh, true today. Um, one is uh, as part of the business plan, understanding your customer acquisition costs, what it takes to set up a new deployment of your innovation for each customer, um, what uh, how what it might take to sign a new contract with each customer. Um, that's uh, we, we've certainly found that that's a, a big part of our overall business model. Um, and uh, so uh, the, the experience of understanding that has been very important for us. Um, and then of course, uh, you know, and not uh, to make sure that the, the signatures on all the contracts are the appropriate signatures on the contracts, both on your side as the, the one delivering the technology to practice, but also with your customers, making sure you've got the, you're getting the authorized signatures on those contracts. My second success story that I want to highlight uh, is hopefully one that uh, you're all very familiar with. Um, this is the Zeek Intrusion Detection System um, that was initially developed at Berkeley Lab. Uh, back in the day, it was called Bro. And so uh, there's this is a nice timeline that Robin Summers presented at our 2019 NSF Cybersecurity Summit. And uh, this timeline highlights again that tech transfer takes time. So um, you see, uh, you know, initial bro versions used at Berkeley Lab all the way back to 1995. But uh, then after some publications and open source release, they saw growing operational deployment in open science networks and some uh, NSF funding that included a tech transfer component in the, in, in the NSF program. 
enabled uh, the the project to um, to develop a business model to um, uh, improve the software so that it's prepared for a wider deployment to work with um, more um, uh, deployers and, and understand their needs better so that those deployments grew became pervasive and that um, around that time uh, at the toward the end of the NSF um, funding for the Zeek project, the Corelight startup was funded and is now um, providing commercial support for the, the Zeek software. So um, you can see more details on the commercial side at the, at the corelight.com website. So you can find more of those examples on the um, Trusted CI TTP website, but let me uh, also highlight some of the other resources that you'll find there, including the Trusted CI TTP playbook. So this playbook is a step-by-step -step guide for planning your transition to practice for your cybersecurity innovation. And there's two important components there as part of that planning. One is to assess the readiness level of your technology. How ready is it actually for commercial adoption or um, you know, uh, uh, actual operational adoption? Um, and then uh, the canvas helps you understand your business model. Do you understand who your customers are and the needs of your customers and how you'll move from the research mode into sustainability to, um, uh, to uh, wider adoption? So let me talk more about that first one. So understanding your technical readiness level or, or TRL, this is a, a notion that um, you know uh, has been modeled, uh, has been provided in the NASA technology readiness level model, um, and uh, so we've got our version of it at the Trusted CI website. And so this tool is helping you assess the maturity of your technology. How close is it to transfer to actual use outside of the lab? And uh, it helps you identify the gaps in, um, uh, in operational use of your technology to plan your development efforts to, uh, to, to work iteratively, iteratively through um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the technical uh, readiness of your technology so it's, it's ready for adoption. And so this is all about you know, moving from uh, your research idea, your proof of concept through um, testing first in the lab and then through broader adoption to pilot projects of your technology demonstrations and to the point where it's really ready for wider deployment, uh, right, uh, a wider adoption in, the, um, in, in your target customer space. So there's seven levels of the um, uh, of this readiness model um, where you understand uh, if uh, do you have the technology concept clearly formulated? Um, do you have the proof of, proof, proof of concept that uh, you've now validated in the lab environment and demonstrated a, a prototype and begun to see adoption in uh, in a prototype environment? And then uh, have you uh, done thorough testing? and proven the use of your technology in an operational environment and gotten that, that feedback from uh, the actual day-to-day -day oper operational use of your innovation. And the, uh, the TRL worksheet that we provide on our website talks about how to, um, how to uh, dig into the different subsystems and components of your technology because they may be at different readiness levels. Um, and so maybe uh, your technology is delivered as a web in application. And so um, different components of that web application may be, um, uh, may be closer to production use or uh, uh, closer to operational readiness than others. And so um, that worksheet allows you to evaluate the TRL level for your different components and then um, and then uh, start that iteration on bringing all the components up to uh, a TRL level that prepares you for actual tech, uh, tech transfer. So in this web application, maybe you know, you're using um, uh, uh, off-the-shelf components like At Apache HTTPD, very widely used. That's got a, you know, a, a TRL level of seven, but um, maybe your 
uh, custom API ha has been uh, you know written in your lab, and it's it's gone through some basic testing um, in pilots, uh, but there's more testing to do. So you could rate that as a TRL level four, and uh, but maybe your uh, your front end web GUI has. Uh, has had more uh, full testing. And so you've um, got that up at a TRL level five. And so by understanding your readiness level for the different components, you might decide, okay, now in our next iteration of developing our technology, preparing it for TTP, we might focus our next round of effort more on the API to get that um, uh, ready in line with the other components of the, uh, of the technology. So um, to complement your you know, iteration and preparation of your, uh, your technology for, uh, for use and adoption, you also have to think about um, who uh, the problem that you're solving and who is going to be the actual adopters. So you know, you've, got the, you've got the research problem defined and you clearly understand your innovation, but then how does that map to a customer a community that would be willing to pay for your technology? And how does it ad address real challenges that they have so that you're truly delivering value to them? And then how do you match your innovation to that value? Um, so the activities to actually deliver that value involve um, uh, making your technology ready for adoption. Um, it may involve um, doing pilot studies to better understand the match between your innovation and the actual needs of your target user community. And, and through that uh, pilot process, you may iterate and find, uh, in our experience, we actually find that the, the technology is a match for a different customer base, um, and you can pivot your technology to, uh, to uh, uh, maybe a better fit there. And then how do you get there? Um, what are the resources required to further develop your technology, develop your business plan, and how do you fund that? So here's an example that Trusted CI went through with uh, Professor Yang at Rochester Institute of Technology uh, to fill in this, um, this canvas and uh, to better understand the, the TTP plan of an innovation of Professor Yang's called ASSERT. So, um, uh, uh, so, so Jay Yang has this uh, really nice technology about um, understanding cyber attack models um, using uh, machine learning. So this is the you know the, the research problem that that his group tackled and the technical innovation that came as a result. But then, how does that match to a, a set of target customers that would gain value from this innovation? So in this iteration of developing the TTP plan, you can see that Professor Yang said, um, you know, good uh, group of target users would be security operations center staff, analysts, and the operations management in a SOC. Because we know that the staff in those security operations centers, they're inundated with alerts, security alerts that, um, that they always have to research and it takes up all their time. And so can, uh, you know, this, this innovative model can help them in addressing those alerts, um, help them um, uh, focus on the, the real attacks that, that need investigation. And so then the next step is to understand uh, better that the innovation is able to deliver that value. And so, um, uh, you know, I, I, I do the software development so that the technology is ready for deployment, build partnerships with some uh, SOC staff that are willing to do a pilot and um, prove out the technology, um, build channels for finding more connections to, um, uh, to potential customers, and, and iterate on that so, uh, um, so that uh, you're, you're the technology is, is ready for broader use. And so um, Professor Yang identified a number of sources of funding for continuing that uh, development of the TTP effort um, that, uh, that included um, uh, grants and, um, and, and other sources of sponsors. Um, so in this case, um, Professor Yang worked with a trusted CI partner at Indiana University called ResearchSoc. Um, and so part of the, uh, 
the value um, that uh, he received from the connection with Trusted CI is that match matchmaking value where we can connect him to potential early adopters, potential um, uh, pilot project sites so that um, he can get that early uh, feedback on his research. And so he identified uh, federal grants as a good source of funding that TTP journey. And so here are some examples of NSF programs that include a TTP components. So as you're transferring from the basic research uh, activity in your, uh, in, your, um, uh, in your TTP journey to developing the business model, to doing pilot studies, to um, increasing the technology readiness level of your innovation, here are some NSF programs that can fund you on that journey. So um, we did have already a, a question in the chat about the SATSI TTP program. That's a significant source of funding for transferring that um, uh, SATSI research might be funded in an earlier round of the SATSI program, and now you're ready to do a TTP round. Um, so check out the SATSI solicitation for more details on that. Um, the uh, the two examples I showed, uh, both CI Logon and Zeek, were funded under another NSF program called Cybersecurity Innovation for Cyber Infrastructure, which is really helpful for, um, for cybersecurity technologies that uh, are addressing needs in the cyber infrastructure ecosystem, because uh, then it can... Uh, uh, you can work with the cyber infrastructure providers to help pilot your technology, get that early feedback on the technology, and um, and uh, potentially provide uh, real value in the cyber infrastructure ecosystem. Uh, we already heard um, from Michael about uh, you know working uh, licensing your technology or working with a startup, and uh, so the SBIR and STTR programs are really value valuable there. The Innovation Core program is another example, um, I, and I think uh, I think we're going to hear tomorrow from Anita about an example of a project around the Convergence Accelerator um, NSF program. Is another uh, is another program uh, for building out um, uh, technologies into practice. And NSF has a lot of uh, support for TTP involving open source software that can include um, you know, uh, getting your innovation used through the, the open source channel. And so the, uh, the Pathways to Enabling Open Source Ecosystems program is a, is a good program there. Um, Partnerships for Innovation is, an, is another one um, and uh, that you'll find listed on the NSF Directorate for Technology Innovation and Partnerships website. So um, I would say start there at the, the NSF TIP website and you'll see all these listed and, and you can uh, you can start to compare uh, the, the different um, uh, types of TTP that each of these programs supports. Uh, so some some uh, some more about uh, matchmaking opportunities that Trusted CI can help with. If you'd like to hear more about cybersecurity challenges in the cyber infrastructure ecosystem, uh, and meet with the cyber infrastructure operators that are meeting addressing those cybersecurity challenges, please join us at the annual NSF Cybersecurity Summit. Um, I included that uh, example earlier about a uh, cybersecurity summit presentation about about Zeek where uh, Robin was um, talking about how Zeek has been adopted through the, the NSF cyber infrastructure ecosystem at the, at the summit. This is a hybrid meeting, so uh, you can join us in person at Berkeley Lab, or um, you can also join us over Zoom. And um, it's an opportunity, uh, I, I guess this year, now that we've got the, the agenda um, finalized, uh, this year would be an opportunity to hear about what's going on in cyber infrastructure. And then maybe next year is an opportunity for you to present about your own innovation to the, um, to the cyber infrastructure community um, when we do the call for presentations for next year's summit. And uh, let me highlight uh, a variety of Trusted CI partners that we can help you connect with. Um, so a research SOC is the Research Cyber uh, uh, Security Operations Center um, that uh, uh, Professor Yang connected with for proving out his uh, his TTP uh, innovation. Um, but uh, 
you can see uh, lots of others here. Um, if you're uh, addressing uh, cyber security challenges around um, uh, uh, big data, uh, you can see uh, we've uh, NSF funded uh, big data hubs. Um, uh, we've got uh, uh, HPC centers through the Access Program and, and other um, uh, high throughput computing uh, support through the PATH Program, um, identity and access management uh, channels through InCommon, um, web applications and science gateways through SGCI. So um, Trust the CI is here to help you make those connections uh, so that you can find potential customers and early adopters for your cybersecurity innovation. To uh, further help you make those connections with your customers, I invite you to participate in our monthly webinars. We're always interested in um, presentations about new cybersecurity innovations that might be applicable to the cyber infrastructure ecosystem. And um, so you can, you can check out our YouTube channel for some previous presentations of uh, SATSE and, and CC awardees um, and uh, contact us about getting on the calendar for presenting about your own research um, and hopefully uh, get some good connections with uh, potential customers. So um, uh, join the, you can join the mailing list to um, uh, get the announcements of those webinars uh, once a month on the fourth Monday of the month. And so here's some more details for connecting with us. Um, you can uh, send email to info at trusted CI at any time and uh, join our mailing list. We've got a discussion list. If you've got questions about um, you know, what sort of challenges cyber infrastructure operators have in the cybersecurity realm, start a discussion thread on our discussion list. Um, it's over a thousand subscribers to that list. Um, and so um, you can uh, have a good uh, connector there. Thanks to NSF for supporting Trusted CI and for all those uh, good uh, TTP opportunities. And uh, so that's um, the end of my presentation. So I'm interested in uh, any questions or comments you might all have. Let's have an interactive discussion. Okay, great. Well, hey everybody, my name is Florence Hudson and it's always wonderful to be with the cybersecurity and transition to practice team and community. So I'm going to talk about the future of TTP and some learnings that I've generated over the years. Um, and really to focus us on a, a new idea, I always try to bring new innovative ideas on academic and entrepreneurial collaborations. And Michael already talked about that in some ways. I'm gonna give some other examples of that. And so I'm currently executive director and PI for the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub at Columbia University and for the COVID Information Commons, both funded by NSF, some NIH funding, and we actually just got our first Department of Transportation grant earlier this month, so we're super excited. Um, I was also, as you heard from Jim, thank you, I was the TTP leader at Trusted CI uh, in like 2018, 2019, that, that range, it was a lot of fun. I'm still in the pictures, that was so cool when you were showing them, Jim. Um, and then also I have to thank Anita, uh, when I was at Internet2, she actually awarded us or awarded me with a, um, a cybersecurity transition to practice acceleration grant. And that's kind of what got my head in the game when she invited me to a meeting with Alec and we were like, hmm, what else can we do? And the rest is history. And now we're still building the history. So it's always great to reconvene with everybody. And I'm just going to jump right in. So the topics for discussion are going to be developing and blending academic and entrepreneurial collaborations and then creating collaboration mechanisms and communities to enable TTP. I don't need to talk about what they do at Trusted CI that I helped with because Jim did all that, so that's great. So I'm gonna give you some new examples. So I mentioned that one of the programs that we have funded by NSF is the COVID Information Commons. Um, and that's an example of research and researcher discovery and collaboration funded by NSF. And we actually include NIH, NIH researchers now since COVID is a disease, we, we pulled them right in. Um, also, we're going to talk about the NSF Big Data Innovation Hubs. I, I run the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub. I'm the executive director. And there are four big data hubs around the country that were funded by NSF in 2015 to be regional big data innovation hubs to understand the challenges our region is dealing with and then to figure out ways to leverage data for good. 
Um, so I'm going to talk about the data sharing and cyber infrastructure working group that we have and how we have leveraged that for cybersecurity TTP. Um, and then I'm going to talk about another initiative that I have, the Cybersecurity Risk Initiative, which is a separate grant from NSF. And we leverage that to share AIML, artificial intelligence and machine learning for cybersecurity research with academia and industry and actually to engage students. And then I'm going to talk about another effort I'm involved in with IEEE and UL or Underwriters Lab laboratories where I lead a global working group on clinical IoT or Internet of Things data and device interoperability with TIPS, which stands for trust, identity, privacy, protection, safety, and security, and how we're leveraging that to bring cybersecurity TTP in. So the way I approach life is like everything kind of connects to everything else. And so what I'm encouraging is that we enable connections and we help with the connections and we teach people how to keep doing that so that we can move things forward together. And that goes into the ongoing multilateral and multi-institutional collaborations for future TTP. And I can't see the chat when I'm, um, I'm presenting. So if there's something, Di or Deborah, if you could kind of give me a clue, that would be great. I will. Thank you, ma'am. So first, let me give you a little background on the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub. So I was actually working for Trusted CI when they asked me to come run it. <laughs> I was like, what? Um, so I was on the um, steering committee or advisory board for the hub since they were born in 2015, the Northeast Hub. And then in 2020, they asked me if I'd like to lead it. Um, and so that's what I've been doing since then. And so the Northeast Hub is a community convener and collaboration hub. That's really our job. People hear Big Data Innovation Hub and they ask me, how much data do you have? You know, they're expecting me to say like Bronto Bytes or something. And I don't have a lot of data, but we connect to a lot of data and to a lot of people. And we're a catalyst for data science innovation, originally in the Northeast region and now around the world. So we're now a community of over 8,300 individuals from over 1,300 organizations across all 50 states and 61 countries. And when I when I joined as the executive director in 2020, the beginning of 2020, we'd only reached about 1,400 humans. And now it's grown like five or six times. We do a lot of outreach and we enable a lot of collaboration. And that's what helps move things forward and find new funding opportunities for researchers. And I'll talk about that. We're very focused on building a diverse, equitable, and inclusive community with accessible resources, and that's very essential to our work. So all our information is available in English. We have a lot of Spanish resources, and so that's another opportunity to get more people involved. As you can see in the bottom left, we're funded by these um, USNSF grants. Um, these are the hub grants, the one, 2015 and 2019, if you know how to read NSF numbers, the first two numbers of the year, which I learned when I got one. Um, and then our cybersecurity grant was in 2017. And then the COVID grants were in 2020 and 2021. We also have an NIH aim ahead grant, um, which is artificial intelligence and machine learning to advance health equity and researcher diversity. And that was last year, we finished that one up and now we have a new Department of Transportation Federal Highway Authority grant um, on using data science for uh, the transportation pipeline. And one of our use cases is probably gonna be about reducing um, fatalities. Um, so we try to use data for good. That's what the whole story is. So we have four main focus areas, education, data literacy, health, this is the Northeast Hub, urban control communities, and responsible data science. And your key security is tucked right in there, security, privacy, and ethics. So cybersecurity TTP is like right up our alley. So if you go to the main website, uh, the about page of the hub, you'll see that these are all of our activities. And we enable a lot of researcher collaboration, including student researchers, to and which can support transition to practice. Within these four focus areas, and if you went to the page now, you'd see all these living color things. I'm going to talk about the COVID Information Commons, which is a researcher collaboration mechanism. Then I'm going to talk more about the Cybersecurity Risk Initiative I mentioned briefly, the um, IEEE UL TIP Standard Working Group I mentioned, and how we've actually had cybersecurity researchers participate in both of these programs, and also in the data sharing and cyber infrastructure working group. And Jim has been involved in some of the work we've done with the TTP researchers and uh, the working group. So first I'll talk about the COVID info comments and I try to have like the little lozenge or like good and plenty thing at the top or I can mic or whatever you like, um, different colors. So the NSF came to us in March of 2020, which as you know, was when everything hit the fan with COVID. And they said, could you create a portal for anyone to be able to easily find NSF funded COVID research? 
So we said, sure. So we went into the NSF Simple Search website and there were exactly 32 awards that day. Now we have over 10,000 in the kick. So um, they wanted to enable researcher collaboration so the researchers could work together to bring valuable research to practice. That's really what they were trying to do, really accelerating research to practice. So um, it was funded initially by the Convergence Accelerator, which is now tucked under the new TIP directorate. If you, if you stay on top of NSF News, the Technology Innovation and Partnerships area, um, and we have a few key search mechanisms. We actually have a COVID awards and PI database, and then we have a COVID research explorer machine learning maps tool, which makes a lot of sense since we're a big data hub. You know, we do AI and ML. Um, we have other resources, data sets, um, videos of, of PIs presenting events, all sorts of stuff. But I want to show you how we enable collaboration. So the purpose, as I mentioned, and the plan um, with the first award, which is a rapid award from NSF and rapid awards are, I call them rapid in, rapid out. You rapidly create a proposal, they rapidly give you the money and you rapidly execute. So they funded $200,000 in May of 2020. And then this portal was launched in July. And originally it was just gonna be this like portal and I was afraid it was gonna be very dry. So we invited a couple of PIs to present. And I'm telling this story for a reason. So um, a couple of PIs presented, I begged them and they said yes. And while we were having this webinar, this to, to kick off the, the kick, I expected like 40 people. We had 178, which kind of blew me away. And after I begged two researchers to present, 40 more begged me if they could present. I was like, wow, that's interesting. There's Paul, you know, and they want to meet each other. So we told them, well, welcome to the KIC portal. And now welcome to the KIC community. You're now part of a community. And we'll keep doing these webinars until everybody's done presenting. And we're still doing them. <laughs> and that was three years ago. Um, so the KIC was designed to facilitate knowledge sharing and collaboration across these research efforts and serve as a resource for researchers and decision makers to leverage each other's findings and invest in and accelerate the most promising research to mitigate the broad societal impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. So just change that to cybersecurity. Invest in and accelerate the most promising research in cybersecurity <laughs> to mitigate the broad societal impacts, right? So I think there's an opportunity to do something like this as we're looking for what could the next phase of this be. So let me go further. So this was designed, this COVID information commons was designed in collaboration with the four big data hubs, um, initially funded by the Rapid Award. And um, we also, NSF asked us to provide a way for the PIs to provide more information beyond just the NSF abstract that's available. So we created a survey mechanism where they could give us um, their ORCID ID, links to their research website, keywords. And so we have that all as part of the kick. Then NSF said, well, could you keep doing this? And we said, sure. And you know, that's when we, we had been saying, you know, this is a disease we really should be working with NIH too. So they liked that idea. So they gave us $2 million at the end of 2021. Um, for a significant expansion and the award now goes into 2025, it's four year award. And so it's enabling multilateral researcher, academia, government industry collaboration, starting from nothing. It, um, and from the end of 2020, there were about 732 awards. It's over 10, 10 times corpus growth since the end of 2020. Now over 10,000 NSF and NIH COVID awards, RAPID, SBIR, STTR. So Michael was talking about entrepreneurs, SBIR and STTR, they're all in here too. So any NSF or NIH award related to COVID, the coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, um, mRNA, you know, there are terms that we say very easily now that we didn't before, long COVID, you know, so a lot of those different implications, mental health implications, education implications, so many things. There's been 10 times community growth since the end of 2020. It was nothing like in 2020. We created it. We had about 250 people in the community at the end of 2020. Now we have about 3,000 individuals at over 700 organizations in the U.S. and 35 countries that are part of this community, and they get a monthly newsletter, and they're invited to webinars. We have done 26 webinars since we started this in July of 2020. We've had 128 researcher lightning talks, and there have been over 11,000 views of these talks. And it's like accelerating and people are looking at the research from 2020 now. So there's really a lot of interest. And I think cybersecurity is in a similar place. I know when I was at IBM and I was creating a cybersecurity strategy and I 
could not find a market size number because there wasn't a market size 15 years ago because it wasn't a market. It was like a gazinta. Sometimes it went into what you had. Now it's a huge market. Um, so I think, you know, cybersecurity is in a, in a similar place where there's a lot of growth in the interest, as you know, because there's a lot of risk and the risk is growing. We also do a, a global a kick. We call it the kick, the COVID Infocom as a student paper challenge. And we have winners from across the U.S. We have one from South Africa, God bless her. And they were actually recently invited to the Academic Data Science Alliance, if you know the ADSA organization, um, to their meeting in San Antonio in October. And they're going to be coming and presenting posters about their papers. So getting broader impact and actually having the student research have broader impact, which is so cool and creating a real community. Um, we actually, I just saw actually the... Uh, the alpha or beta site for um, a new advanced COVID data and metadata search and discovery tool we're going to be adding. So now when you go into the the, res the site and you put in like epidemiology, it just goes against the 10,000 awards corpus, which is pretty big. But now what we're going to do is comb like data sets and the research outcomes and things like that and find more content to, to present. And then our plan is to leverage Dryad, which is um, a free archive database for research, to archive the kick corpus so that it can live on a posterity. And so this is what we've we've done. Now I'm going to give you a feel for how this feels. <laughs> we actually do. So this was a webinar uh, we did in September 2020. Um, and so it started out as a portal and it quickly became a community. And one of the PIs who presented on um, one of the first webinars, uh, Nora Garza from the Laredo College, said, your site and the ability to come together is marvelous. I thank you, especially for thinking about this and bringing us together. People will be able to use this as a proper, safe, true information source, which could be kind of cool for cybersecurity research too, just saying. So we did the launch webinar. We created the community and we're, you know, ongoing uh, webinars, which we're continuing. Um, so if you look at the COVID awards and PI database, I know this is, oh, I'm aiming for Halloween. It's a little orangey, but orange is one of the family colors for the kick. And you go into this award and has this database that has over 10,000 awards. You can put in a keyword like epidemiology. And what it will return is NSF and NIH awards, because that's what we have in the corpus. You can click on any of these and look at the abstract. For NSF, you can click through and go to the abstract on the website. For NIH, you have to put in the award number when you go to the reporter tool. You can click on the PI name, see their PI profile. You can see how much their award was for. And if you wanted to, you could actually use a faceted search. By funder, you could look at NSF or NIH at this point. You could uh, look at S NSF directorate, and it'll come up with the different directorates. You could pick like bio directorate or size, NIH institutes and centers. You could pick NIAID or whatever you want. You could put in Indiana University or University of South Alabama. You could put state, PI name, program officer, and official. When we started this, they were trying to figure out which program officers were like delivering on a lot of these research awards um, and start an end date. And so all this is open, browsable, 24 by 7, um, and we encourage everyone to use it. And the students are especially enamored with this because they can easily find research, which is very cool because sometimes it could be elusive to them. So this is an example of, this is my PI profile, so no one has to get upset that I use their information and image. Um, but so if you saw my award and you put my name in there and it came up and you clicked on it. Um, you'd say, you could see, oh, you can see the grant description on the NSF site. You can click through to that. When did I get the award? When is it, when is it over? Who's my program manager? He's program director now. Um, the amount, ARP, the PI is on the PI. Jeanette Wing is our EVP of research. Uh, she's the co-PI, which is how we do it now. So she's part of it, but I, I can, you know, spend my time doing it. And then this is what we have in the profile. I provide my email address, which is on the an NSF website, not all the NIH awards um, expose the email of the PI, so it's a little different. So we only expose the emails that either the PI provides or are made available through the funder. So, you know, we're a security and privacy crowd. Um, these are the, the websites I provided that are my professional websites, you know, for the COVID Info Commons, the hub. If they did a lightning talk with us, we put the video in here. And then we also have a list of our grants and then my keywords. And if you click on one of these keywords, it'll go back to the database and use that and show you all the other rewards with that keyword. So it's a really very easy tool to use. Uh, this is the more fun tool for me because I used to have a kaleidoscope that went like this when I was a little girl. I don't know if any of you remember those. 
Um, and so this is the research uh, machine learning maps, ex research discovery and topical visualization or explorer tool. So this is powered by Lingo4G, which is a from a company called Carrot Search in Poland, if any of you know them, very small company. Um, and NSF actually uses this internally. So they turned us on to this. So we had to create our own instance of it so we could put NSF and, I and NIH awards in it because you know NSF uses it internally for their awards. And so this will show you, you know, these are I have 10,000 over 10,000 documents in scope now. And it will give you um, a high level view of clusters of topical areas of the research. So you can find research and researchers by PI name, by institution, by the state that they're in, US state, uh, NSF only funds US, NIH has a little bit outside the US, Canada and some of the islands, um, and it's clustered by topic. And what you can do is over here in the query, you can use Boolean algebra which I always loved, and you, or just a word, and you can actually, you know, look by keywords. So if I put in epidemiology, it returns 413 documents versus 10,000, which is a little bit easier. And then you could look here and say, wow, training social infectious diseases, that seems like a very big topic regarding epidemiology. That makes a lot of sense. So, um, and then you could click on one of these awards and it'll show you the abstract COVID inspired data science education for epidemiology. Very interesting. You could click on any of these. But then let's say um, you want to see like, well, what does this all mean? So you could look at it and you could view by PI or institution. So here you see on the left, and I tried to use the institutional colors <laughs> to color um, who they are. So here, like you're, let's say you're looking at by institution, you can see there's something going on at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Gosh, I wonder who the PI is. Then you just go to this like little gearbox here and you click PI, and then it shows you this view. And this view shows you it's Clarence Buddy. Crap, I don't see too well. I can't see little letters, but so this is the institution. This is the PI same here. Who's at Purdue? Jung Hyun Choi. Who's at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center? Dan Baruch. So it shows, so you can toggle and like, you might see someone and say, oh my gosh, Laura, where is she now? We were postdocs together and you can find what institution they're in. Then you can click on it. You can get the abstract information. You could get their email address. You can find their institution. Um, you could also do some, you could do, use your Boolean epidemiology and security. And there were 18 that came up here. Um, there's one at ASU, um, improving the privacy and security of data for wastewater-based epidemiology, which as you might know, is very important as we look at COVID. A lot of higher ed institutions uh, were looking at the wastewater. And so you could see some of the awards that came out through that. Very interesting, you know, multivariate views. This is an example from one of the PIs. She's actually NSF and NIH funded. Um, she is NSF funded for COVID. She has other NIH awards. Uh, Sarah Bowman, she's up at the University of Buffalo. And this is her slide. This is how she used that tool to find researchers that do stuff that she does. And these three are actually active collaborations that she has now with her group at University of Buffalo. She also was uh, discovered, her research was discovered through the kick by a student studying open access data in South Korea um, who reached out to her. And then they got their mentor in the UK involved. Um, and she was on a Bunker Hill Community College panel. And so she's she's used it for a lot of collaboration, which is really cool. And so this is a way that researchers can find each other and maybe help transition some of their research to practice together. We also do student and research working groups. We validate students as researchers at at the big kids table. Uh, we do a student research symposium every year. And so they are the ones presenting, they are the researchers. So we really validate them as primary researchers and we have challenges that they do and they can join this working group. So we have a student working group every month and a research working group every month. And we have listservs for people to join and then we send them the meeting notice. We do an annual COVID Info Commons student paper challenge, as I mentioned, to inspire research for potential future TTP. Um, and undergraduate community college and grad students and recent graduates are invited to, to participate. Since we started this in 2021 during the pandemic, and a lot of students either couldn't get a visa to go back to college, seriously, as some of you might know, or they couldn't get a job because there weren't a lot of jobs. We said, okay, if you're a recent graduate, you can participate in this too, because it's a valuable professional development opportunity for them. And we have a little incentive that's built into the, uh, the award that we can give them. And then these are some of the winners. This young man, Aditya, actually, he reached out to me when we created the first Kick Student Paper Challenge. And he said, you know, dear Dr. Hudson, this is whatever he said, um, 
I'd like to participate in the undergraduate student paper challenge. I'm currently a junior in high school. I was like, wow. He said, but I take math classes at the University of Minnesota. I said, okay, well, that's cool. Just get me something from the registrar or one of your professors. So he did. Uh, he ended up winning third place in the undergraduate student paper challenge while he was a junior in high school. And now he's at Yale and we keep in touch. And that's one of the messages here is helping them network and keeping in touch with each of these researchers, the cybersecurity TTP researchers, the students. Um, Samson went on to MIT Business School and now he has a real job. Um, Jane, I think, is at Princeton now in grad school. And then we also have um, Jin Ming Wan, um, who actually is going to be presenting at the Academic Data Science Alliance meeting in San Antonio. Uh, Toby, who keeps in touch with us in the student working group. Um, Jin, who I haven't spoken with recently. Eveline from South Africa, who will be flying over from South Africa to present at the Academic Data Science Alliance in the health focus area. And then we also have a couple of students from GW or George Washington University. And so we nurture them and encourage them. They win this. We invite them to present at a, at a student research symposium. We invite them to present shoulder to shoulder with NSF and NIH PIs. And when Aditya was presenting, and, and I said, you know, we're so proud of him. He, he was in, he's in high school. And he said, and people were saying, we thought he was a PhD student. I'm like, I know, right? So during the webinar, one professor offered to offer to fund his research that fall, and another one offered to give him an internship the next summer. It was amazing. Um, and out of the work that he did with us, we provide mentoring calls when they're doing their papers if they've never done a research paper before. And a D one of the DTS mentors ended up submitting a paper to Springer with Aditya as the first author. So there's so much opportunity to engage students, to engage researchers and bring them together. These are examples of the Lightning Talk webinars. Um, the researchers collaborate with each other and with the community. These are some of the topics. You could see there's NIH, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, as you imagine, NIAID for COVID, um, NSF size, um, there was a professor we found that's um, published in the National Library of Medicine, NIHNLM, on drugs for COVID and knowledge graph about drugs used in the clinical controls of the coronavirus. Uh, Hong, who uh, has a PIP grant. PIP is another NSF solicitation we stay very tight with, which is predictive intelligence for pandemic prevention. So that's how do we try to mitigate this in the future. Um, and then Evelyn, um, who's uh, our South Africa student. So this is just an example. We've done 128 of these things. We also have a partnership with Columbia University Libraries and the PIs. Um, we take their, their videos. We, we post them separately and post them as the webinar. Then we create an English transcript and a Spanish transcript. And then we offer to them to have the transcripts and their video uploaded to the Columbia Academic Commons so they can get a DOI. Um, and a digital object identifier. And so most of them have, some of them haven't. They're going to be using the paper for their thesis or publish it separately or whatever, but that's another opportunity. So we continue enabling people to find them and their research. So that's the kick. And what I think creates an interesting view of what's something else we could try, because we've been trying things, right, Anita, for a long time and, and Alec. Um, so we should think about that. Just a thought. Um, now I want to talk about some of the other areas in the responsible data science focus area, as I mentioned before. So first, the data sharing and cyber infrastructure working group. This was created by the South Hub. Remember, I said there were four big data hubs. There's the Northeast, the South, the Midwest, which is actually at UIUC, where Jim is, um, headquartered there, and the West, which is a collaboration between Berkeley, um, UW, University of Washington, and UC San Diego. And uh, the South is at Georgia Tech and Renzi. Um, in North Carolina. And so the South Hub created this big data hubs, data sharing, cyber infrastructure working group. And we have a leadership community, a leadership committee with um, one of the CI or cyber infrastructure experts from each of the uh, each of the hubs. And they lead that. And I'm kind of like their VP of marketing. I, I help them with um, getting the word out and things like that. And we host the information about it on our website. So we made cybersecurity a very big topic in in the data sharing cyber infrastructure working group. I kind of brought that with me from the from the trusted CI role. And Jim actually has helped us a lot with this, Jim Basney, who spoke earlier. So um, actually before I even got very involved, 
uh, Rene Bastone, who was the prior executive director for the Northeast Hub, he actually did a presentation in November 2017 on the data sharing and CI working group on big data and cybersecurity risk management. And then you can see here, actually, Von Welch did this presentation, a trusted CI, the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. Then Jim helped us out by leading this trustworthy, he created the trustworthy data working group. Um, and then he presented the results of that guidance and survey results in the Trustworthy Data Working Group. So we're keeping cybersecurity top of mind as much as we can. Um, then we had a cybersecurity planning discussion. We talked about needing to view cybersecurity as a data science problem. And Jay Yang, who was talked about before, Dr. Yang from Rochester Institute Technology is very involved in this too. And then he actually co-hosted with us leveraging a cybersecurity risk conference award that we had the Northeast Hub, um, a um, the BD Hubs and J a, a Cybersecurity as Big Data Science Interactive Workshop. Then uh, there was a data-driven pattern analysis and can you learn of cyber attacks across organizations um, panel, which included uh, Jay Yang and a couple of his students uh, from the summer. And then the role of NLP or natural language processing in cybersecurity operations, including Jay and some of his students and some students that he knows um, at MIT CSAIL. And so we keep cybersecurity top of mind because it's so important in research. So this is a way we keep the cybersecurity TTP researchers in front of people. And so I'm trying to help as much as I can. I'm not the only one, but these are the things I know about since I'm involved in them. Um, the BT Hubs um, funded this interactive workshop, as I mentioned. After we did that, you know, and Jay actually led it from RIT, um, I actually used some of my funding from my Cybersecurity Risk uh, Conference Award to fund Jay to lead a 2022 student summer program on AI and ML for cybersecurity. And then the students presented their research results on the November 2022 data sharing and cyber infrastructure working group webinar. And then in January, 2023 at the Northeast Hub inaugural student research symposium. So once again, making people think this way, bringing it forward and helping them collaborate. And these work, the, the workshop we had in April of 2021 included industry, um, academia, researchers, students, all sorts of people. So once again, we're trying to keep them top of mind. Another effort where we have the cybersecurity researchers involved is this TIP standards work that I'm leading um, with IEEE and Underwriters Laboratories. This started when I was at IBM, actually, I was a VP and a CTO at IBM, and I was creating the Internet of Things strategy. And um, ARM actually contacted us and said, we'd like to talk about end-to-end -end trust and security for IoT. We said, what a great idea. Actually, they said, we wanna work with you and let's work on end-to-end -end trust and security. And so um, we created this TIPS idea, which Anita actually helped fund. I'll talk about that in a minute um, with a workshop um, when she was uh, leading the SATSI program. And I worked with a gentleman named Oleg Lagvinov um, from IEEE. And we were actually both on the Cisco IoT World Forum steering committee. I was coming from IBM. He was at, um, I think he was at ST Micro at the time. And we were talking, you know, on the side saying, nobody's worrying about end-to-end -end trust and security for Internet of Things. And we both said, this is a problem and no one's fixing it, so let's fix it. So we we uh, created this TIPS idea and uh, TIPS trust, making sure that devices, and this is at the device level, the way we're looking at it, that devices can assume that connected devices are reliable and trustworthy partners, you know, like the trust and identity and identity and access management beyond the human to the devices. Um, identifying, make sure that devices have a consistent method of identifying each other. Um, privacy, ensuring device personal and sensitive data is kept private. Protecting devices and users from harm. Uh, physical, digital, financial, reputational. Um, it includes the humans, it includes the institutions, which has financial and reputational risk regarding data protection. Um, and of course, there's regulatory issues. And then safety, providing safety for devices, infrastructure, and people. And then maintaining security of data, devices, and people. One way that we look at this is this, this is kind of like the, the next step after CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. CIA was really created more at the nation state and enterprise level, you know, keeping the people you don't want in your data out. Now that we have devices like in humans that are technical and, and connected, or we have cars that are connected with humans in them, or we have other things that directly connect to humans, we feel that there needs to be a new paradigm. And that's what we believe TIPS is. So we're working with IEEE on this and UL. And NIST actually would like to take this across all their smart infrastructure domains. I presented this to their communications working group last fall. I said, wait till we get the first standard out the door and then let's you know, morph it to other areas. The smart agriculture group came to me too. 
So TIPS was envisioned in this 2016 IEEE Trust and Security Workshop for IoT. And um, we got some money for the workshop. Thank you, Anita. Um, and then IEEE hosted it at George Washington University. And um, we had academia, industry, nonprofits, technical organizations, consortiums, governments um, from around the world. We had people fly over from Europe. Um, and so you could see we had DOE, Department of Energy, PNNL, NREL, MITRE, all sorts of people. I was internet too at the time. Um, and so we had this workshop and it focused on ways to address the TIPS elements of IoT. Um, we had talked about physical environments, um, you know, IT and OT, um, information technology, operational technology, intelligent highways, connected vehicles, connected healthcare, all these different areas. And what came out of it is I, I worked more and more with IEEE and Maria Palombini, who leads the healthcare and life sciences group there. And um, we did a pre-standards effort. And then after that, we uh, we created a TIPS framework. And then we launched this clinical IoT data and device interoperability with TIPS Working Group in 2019. And so it's be it's the first standard to, to be developed from the beginning with IEEE and UL together. It's the first MOU they've had to develop a standard. Usually one creates it and then throws it over the transmit and says, here you go. Um, but we're doing this together. We actually had to change the number um, because we, it was 2733 in IEEE. But then when we connected to UL, they said this really should be part of our 2900 series. So when we got married to UL, we changed the name. Um, and now it's 2933. And the goal is for this standard to establish a framework with TIPS principles for clinical IoT data and device interoperability, including physical and virtual clinical IoT devices, wearables, and interoperability with other healthcare IT systems, EHR, EMR, devices in hospitals, hospital at home, home to hospital, in the wild, everywhere. There are over 250 working group members, which is amazing. Um, we thought there would be 25 <clears throat> with our best friends. Um, and we have 22 countries. And it includes device manufacturers, technologists, um, healthcare providers, healthcare payers, caregivers, pharma, health IT people, researchers, academic startups, regulators, all sorts of people. And so what we did is one of the, the PIs that uh, Jim had on his slide, um, I told you we've already been working with Jay Yang and some areas, but Shantanu Chakrabarti from WashU at St. Louis, he has this really cool quantum tunneling timer technology. And we first saw it at one of the events, the TTP events, when I was at um, Trusted CI, I was like, wow, have you thought of putting this like in medical devices? <laughs> so uh, we started talking about that. So we had him as a guest presenter on the P2933 working group, the IEEE working group, which actually started some interesting discussions with different industry people, standards people. And then um, I recently visited down at WashU, and since then they've created an AIM Institute, Artificial Intelligence and IoT for Medicine, to bring together researchers with AI and IoT expertise and clinical investigators to forge new paths to solve complex medical problems with advanced tools. So these are examples of the longitudinal opportunity, how you have to keep nurturing it and moving it around and introducing people to people and encouraging growth and encouraging investment. And so I'm really delighted about that. Um, and so that's just an example of what we do. And so these are ideas that I wanted to present to see if we could inspire new ideas for cybersecurity TTP. Um, I was very lucky to work with Trusted CI um, and get the initial TTP award from Anita. Um, but now I think there's some new stuff maybe we can think about. So I encourage developing and blending academic, academic and entrepreneurial co collaborations um, like we do with the hub, we do in the IEEE work, we do in our workshops, we do through the kick webinars that we do and leverage, develop and leverage collaboration mechanisms to support research and community building like the kick portal that we have. Um, we should include established and new researchers and undergrad and graduate students. They're the future, right? Maybe they can help you TTP. I know Shantanu had a couple of grad students that he brought with him to our TTP workshops at the time when I was at Trusted CI, and then subsequently they're trying to bring it to market. And so I've been working with them on that too. Um, and we should support ongoing multilateral and multi-institutional collaborations for future TTP. And get connected and stay to get connected is my recommendation. Um, create portals and communities to connect with researchers and enable them to connect with each other. And um, yeah, the hub collaborates with, I think, everybody that Jim mentioned. 
uh, with Jay Yang, Anshu Regev at Temple University actually got a seed fund award from us to continue her research. Jay got a seed fund award from us. Shantanu presented at this other um, thing. And Jim and I, you know, continue to collaborate um, inside and outside some of the projects we're doing. So that's my recommendation, or those are my recommendations and my stories. And so I'm happy to stop sharing and look at the chat and take questions and recommendations. Oh, no questions. Oh, that's so uh, easy. Florence, this is Amit from the University of West Florida. Hi, nice to meet you. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for such an informative presentation. I have one question about any tips, initiatives being taken out for industrial IoT? Yeah, so the question is, um, is there going to be tips for industrial IoT? Yeah. That, that is where we want to go. I actually spoke with um, one of the researchers at NCANT about that. He's very interested in helping us with that. And um, I've actually discussed it with, um, you know, some of the high energy physicists. Um, and we have talked about IT and OT and how to apply tips to operational technology, which is the industrial IoT. And actually we had the Industrial Inter Internet Consortium folks at the workshop with us in 2016. One of the guys um, who actually created the at the time, the IIC, you know, security blueprint. So our goal is to bring it there. And that's what Chris Greer at NIST want to works, wants to work on with us. And I've also talked to IEEE about bringing it across all their domains. So smart grid, smart cars. I actually already presented this um, at an autonomous vehicle event in November, 2019 in Berlin. So then things kind of got quiet, as you know. Um, so they're very interested in it on that side. And um, they want me to talk to the smart agriculture group about it too, because they have issues um, and their their security and privacy um, issues with you know being able to hack water systems or whatever telemetry systems uh, regarding agriculture. So yeah, we're very interested in that. But I want to get the first I want to get the first standard out the door so we know what we're working with. But I'm happy to talk to people about starting to think through what the tips issues are in different domains. That would be very valuable because, you know, some of the medical ones are very particular, you know, because you're talking about implanted, you know, cardiac devices, which is a little bit different than, you know, like a water filtration system. Um, but there are similarities on the privacy and security side. So I'd be happy to chat about that if you want. I can put my... Um, my email in the chat and I'm very easy to find. Oh, that that would be great. I actually work with both. I, I work a little bit with the healthcare IoT and I'm also interested in the industrial IoT. Oh, that's so, great. Well, yeah, yeah, I'd love to chat because the smart ag people want to start jumping into it. I Shipley has asked me to reconnect to the autonomous vehicle folks when we're ready. Chris Greer said, come back when you're ready at NIST and we can bring it across smart infrastructure. So yeah, I'd be happy to. That would be great. Thank you so much. Great. Any fog network infrastructure related to any IoT? Um, I was never a fan of the term fog because it doesn't have any clarity. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's fine. Yeah, yeah. It, Nothing it, personal. It, it, no, no. I agree with you. That, but there's a lot of, uh, you know, the articles and journals actually trying to move that area is, is, is around a lot of that. But you, you're right. I mean, nobody put the feet on it very well. Um, yeah. just, just move around things. But whenever we disturb with the IoT, somehow this thing comes up. That's and okay. That's, yeah. You can be the adult supervision and tell them you don't use that word. That's what I do. Okay. So what I ask them to do is tell me what you really mean. Which are the devices? You know, what's mm -hmm. the application? What's the use case? So when they say fog, they probably mean edge and cloud, mm -hmm. you, right? That So edge computing is part of it. So, you know, in the in clinical IoT, like think of, you know, you have an implanted medical device um, and you have um, a device at home that's connected to your router that the doctor connects to, which then queries your device that's in your in your body, right? So that that's has an edge computing element that has an IoT element. Um, it has a wearable element. It has a cloud element. It has a network communications element. It has an EHR element, you know? So I don't say fog, um, but 
it can apply to any anything that um, is connected, really. Yeah. And, yeah. And, Absolutely. Good question. Me. Yeah. But tell them yeah. not to use the word fog. I don't <laughs> yeah. Right. I'm a clarity type of girl. I was an engineer. So. <laughs> well, thank you, Alec. Yeah, I'll, I'll plan to be here in the morning. I'm in and out in the morning. I have a lot of meetings tomorrow, but I'll be here a little bit. Any other questions for Florence? I don't see any more. Anything else? No, thank you so much. It, it Certainly this um, workshop is hoping that we can foster some of those multilateral and multi-institutional collaborations. And that's kind of one of our goals here is to introduce people to each other and to the TTP process. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great job. I appreciate you having me too. Well, thank you. And we are, we'll start off the morning with um, Anita Nikolic for, talking about the Accelerator Program. So um, Anita, we'll turn it over to you. Hopefully you should see that. Yes, we do. Okay. So um, I put together some slides that are a combination of kind of what the Convergence Accelerator is and our experience. So um, it's a small group. Give me a shout if you want me to talk more about some stuff or skip over some things. But um, I will talk about our Convergence experience. So the uh, TLDR for us is our team, which I'll talk about, has a game called Deep Cover, which is a mobile video game aimed at senior citizens, and it is launching November 15th in time for holiday season. And the point of the game is to inform seniors about uh, digital uh, in, inauthentic behavior. So informing them about scams and phishing and things like that. So that's the end result of our accelerator. And in fact, in a parallel meeting right now, uh, we're actually going with our marketing people over the logo, the website for the launch. So that I was hoping to be out for today, but it's not quite. So um, who am I? I'm at University of Illinois. I'm a research scientist and a director of research innovation. Um, I'm a former NSF program director and TTP champion uh, for, for many people on this call. I'm also the Convergence Accelerator Phase 2. I'll talk about the phases of it. Um, uh, on a completely different topic, I have a DARPA uh, SBIR Phase 2, which is going on right now uh, for the next year. And I have two recent um, startups, so one that was acquired by uh, the CBOE a year ago. So kind of the top level, what's a Convergence Accelerator? Um, it's in two phases, and there's, th their website has an immense amount of information, but it's in two phases, phase one and phase two. Phase one is kind of like get your act together, see if this is right for you. There's a bunch of teams. They narrow it down to phase two. Each team in both phases, you're paired with a, a venture capital coach. Um, the point is converge research, and I'll talk about what that means. And the, the goal of it is a real-world kind of outcome or product. There's a very structured curriculum formerly run by IDEO, which if you're not familiar is like this, probably the, you know, best design firm in the world. Now it's run through Stanford Business School. Also, uh, you know, obviously great curriculum. They expect some track integration, some synergies between people's projects. Phase one to two, they have separate evaluations. So this is one thing that's new to people. It's like you submit a proposal for phase two, but you also do a pitch. And the pitch is to a completely different team of people than that reviews the proposal. For phase two, um, from year one to year two, you also do a presentation and they could, in theory, NSF could, in theory, um, not give you money for year two. So having said that, you know, what is Convergence Accelerator? So if you were to take um, bits and pieces from SBIR, TTP, research and i and kind of merge them together, that's what it is. Uh, the official site, uh, what is he, what is uh, Convergence Accelerator? Use inspired, so it's, you know, that's NSF code word for real world. Application oriented, also code word for somebody's got to use it. Fed by basic research and discovery. So that, it's an interesting niche where, you know, there, maybe there's not a lot of products in the particular researchy space you're looking at. And in theory, you want to integrate teams from industry, academia, nonprofits, government, and other these the convergence things can be led by industry, and we, we have a couple on our track that were led by industry with academic, or it can be vice versa, or you could have no industry. Ours didn't have any industry people. So there's an ideation phase, a phase one, two, and impact. So I'll go through that. So one of the things that the accelerator is there to solve is, you know, what I observed in, uh, in kind of the early years of TTP at NSF, which is like many of us, not just in academia, but in general, have this notion of like, I'm going to build something awesome, people are just going to buy it or use it. And like that, that is just not the case. And uh, I can't emphasize that enough for 
academics who want to kind of sell something to people. So what does NSF even want? These tracks come out every year. I think it's up to maybe like track L or M or something like that. So NSF puts out an RFI um, where people can just say, look, there's a lot of stuff going on. And um, a couple of years ago, it was like a, a blue ocean or ocean economy or something was, was the track parallel to us. Lots of stuff going on with, with that. So um, people in research might say, you know, there, there's just a lot going on in this um, research area. I'm going to submit an RFI, and NSF, you should consider funding stuff in this area. So people submit these kind of like broad ideas. So the year that we did it, um, some of us submitted an RFI around kind of disinformation, misinformation, inauthentic behavior. NSF definitely did not want to fund anything in this area um, for many years. Uh, even when I was at NSF, it was a very hot button because it was so aligned with just politics. So NSF said, okay, let's hold a workshop to see if there's something there that's researchy and that there's a thing at the end. So we held this workshop on inauthentic behavior um, with the point being like, what are the, what are the themes that would really create actual interdisciplinary research and where's the need to create a thing? So the, a report was made and all these, if you go on the Convergence site, all these um, kind of like that report from the workshop we held, it, it, it's there. The findings are there. These are all open. So you can look through, and this is interesting to say, like I have this fuzzy idea out of a workshop, NSF's going to maybe like crystallize their thoughts about putting out a track. So it's interesting to kind of page through those to see what did and what did not make it. So then the annual tracks are announced. So these come out, uh, you know, once a year. This one came out a few months ago to say, hey, here's some new stuff. This year it's with equitable water and chemical sensing and bio-inspired design innovations. You look at that, you say, oh, I have like this cool idea. I'm going to submit a letter of intent. Um, it's not a commitment and they don't judge them. It's just um, NSF wants to know, you know, there's going to be like 5,000 people applying. So you submit a letter of intent and say, I'm, I'm kind of interested in this. Here's, here's, here's what I might have on a team. And again, it's not a commitment. So then you have this idea and how do you form a team? So now I'm going to start talking a little bit about um, kind of what, what we did. Um, all the tracks are different. All the teams are different. But this is just one approach, and I'll kind of just um, go back and forth about um, our experience with this. So forming a team. So I certainly saw this call because I was part of the workshop. Others had seen it, and just serendipity, um, the, our PI, Siwei Lu, uh, is someone that I had worked with um, at, we did a deep fake, mostly Siwei's technical uh, smarts and um, me helping present it. We did a deep fake for DEF CON the year prior. So. We did a deep fake of the Democratic Party uh, chairman with his consent, and we kind of uh, linked up and went our separate ways. Many months later, uh, we see this call, and we contact each other like, you know, deep fakes, we're kind of interested in this. And I knew some folks at Clemson who did disinformation, and at the university, they were starting a game study. So we said, you know, maybe like we should all talk. Maybe there's something there between all of our interests. So we just kind of mulled around, what, what can we do together in this team? So our first idea, so then we got this team together, and now you have to submit a proposal to phase one. So we thought, well, okay, there's some stuff with gaming and security and disinformation, um, K through 12, there's lots going on. Like there's not a, there's not a lot that's um, out there for K through 12 digital literacy in terms of misinformation, disinformation, this kind of stuff. So we looked at what was out there um, in terms of like, what, what, are we, what are we submitting to NSF as the idea? So we kind of did a survey said, where's there a need? Looked at other uh, potential uses. So we said, maybe we could build something like a cyber range or digital literacy, maybe some security training. So we actually, phase one is they're a little more generous where you can be a little uh, more loose in the actual idea. Like you don't have to say what I did with the first slide, which is we are going to launch a mobile video game in a year. Um, phase one is more like we have this idea. We're not sure that we have customers, and it maybe spans a range of different things, but we're going to try it out. So that's what we submitted. We said we're going to think about gamification um, to teach people about disinformation, maybe to seniors, maybe to K through 12. Our team was kind of bifurcated on our thoughts. Some people had very strong thoughts. So for phase one, we had a lot of um, letters of uh, cooperation from um, a couple school districts, some senior centers, um, Michigan Cyber Range, because we just kind of weren't sure where it was going to go. By the end, and I'll talk about this, um, as you can hear from our game, we've, we decided to focus on older adults. Why is this? Part of it was just the numbers as we looked at it. Um, 
older adults, as we actually pulled numbers on, you know, how could we have real world impact? We saw that disproportionately for scams and digital threats, just by far people over 60 are disproportionately targeted and financially impacted. And we thought there was something there with confusion, you know, when people are scammed. Um, I should go back to say, also part of our team, we're not just like the, the security or technical people. We also thought it was important to get in um, educators, like people who knew pedagogy, because we, we knew we were going to at some point kind of teach people things. So we did also have people who were um, education experts and um, experts of gerontology. So people who um, knew about uh, like how, how you interact with seniors. And nobody gets paid very much on these things. And that's one thing I'll talk about. It's not like a traditional, I'm going to fund five grad students and I'm going to like kick back while they do all the, the work. It, this is like, th this is not much funding. So, so going back to this, so we conversion older adults. Um, part of this was not necessarily our choice. So the numbers definitely led to older adults. Uh, you would think uh, K through 12, there's lots of K through 12 school districts. Yes, that's the problem. Um, Several of the teams in phase one who had focus on K through 12 were um, nudged, I would say, by NSF to move away from K through 12, mostly because, you know, as you probably all well know, districts and curriculum is very much um, uh, enforced and created at the local level. And uh, NSF felt that it was just too politically charged to get in that as a product. Focusing on seniors, you have a tangible group with tangible money effects. So that's something to keep in mind. So you get accepted into phase one, which we did. Um, and then this whole phase one is like ideation, refining your idea. So we have this huge idea. How do you refine it and get it to a thing you're going to actually sell? So in phases one and two, it is very time intense. Um, I would say, you know, for people who think it's just, you know, like money to go do your thing and, and pop, surprise, at the end there's a product. It, it, the convergence is not that way at all. It's, uh, I think, I can't remember if it's weekly or every other week. I think it's weekly. You have, a, at least in phase one, every week you're with, um, you know, for two hours every week you go through this curriculum. Again, it's, it's folks who are taking kind of Stanford Business School or IDEO or, you know, whatever it's going to be for the next few years. And NSF will walk through, they have exercises and a curriculum about, you know, how do you do storytelling? How do you prototype? Um, if you're going to do human-centered design, you know, what does that mean? Um, team science is your, you know, our team was pretty big. Um, you know, when you have a bunch of PIs, co-PIs, industry, and you have a conflict, how do you resolve it? It, it may not be like traditional academia where the PI is in charge. Um, how do you resolve conflict? How do you do pitching? There's also, so within uh, phase one, you have a cohort. So, uh, you know, it's, I think it was maybe like 20 or 25 teams, or maybe, maybe it was less than that. But all these teams show up together. And in theory, you're supposed to have this co-opetition environment where there's innovative ideas, and maybe you could share things and expertise. Um, in my experience, it, no idea was so um, synergistic with another that it was like, oh, it made sense for us to team up. I know for the, one of the recent tracks for um, maybe for, for 5G or something or, or other tracks, maybe it made more sense. I didn't see that a lot, but in theory, because you're all there learning, you can in theory for phase two kind of team up with, with people you're competing with. So this is a huge um, thing I would say, you know, and multiple teams have given feedback to NSF, and, and I have this on some other slides, which is um, – this tension between research and a product, I cannot underestimate just how um, divisive that can be in some teams. We have, a, we have a team that gets along, you know, fabulously, but there still is just a lot of, you know, if you have a co-PI who is hardcore academic, I'm providing my research expertise, they want to see research at the end. And it, the whole fight was like, what's my grad student going to publish? What am I going to publish? Okay, it's a fair question. NSF is saying you need to put a product out at the end. We don't, it's not that we don't care about research, but it's not as important. But the message is like, it's both important. Um, so that, that definitely can create some tension on teams as to kind of this, um, where do you prioritize one versus the other? So uh, kind of going back, so going back and forth to our ideation, how we settled on a mobile game. So on our team is um, somebody who was managing director for uh, gaming companies for years, and he's now at the university doing gaming studies. So we looked at things like, and again, 
to go back to this, um, so some of the fights were, you're, you're going to put something that looks like Candy Crush that people can just have fun with? You've got to teach them. You've got to nudge them. We've got to measure that they no longer believe disinformation. That's a very tall order. Um, so what we did is, you know, had lots of talks about what is the ultimate product going to look like? Look at Candy Crush. It's got a billion plus downloads. Words with friends, 10 million. This is 15 years ago, 10 million plus downloads. Uh, this match three, which is really simple, kind of silly. I mean, lots of people play it. So part of our ideation was just kind of this, this going back and forth between what's the real world and people do, whether it's silly or not, and what do we want to um, actually get, you know, societal impact for our product. So why a game? Uh, again, we set on smartphone games just because ownership. These, these are figures, by the way, from AARP. Smartphone ownership and use for games by age. Um, it, people playing kind of time, you know, whether it's uh, brain, brain games or kind of time waster games, uh, we saw that the, the numbers just showed us that, um, that older people do use uh, games quite a bit, do, do play games quite a bit. We also looked at, uh, again, a, a big discussion was, is it just them playing or was it with your friends? So we looked at, you know, what kind of games are people playing, whether, whether or not they're kind of silly. Do they play with friends, family? What do they do? So one of the things we wanted to do is avoid um, edutainment. So our, our, um, our game experts urged us, again, this, um, this is another big uh, point of contention on our team, but our, our kind of gaming experts and people who know um, edu education gaming, if you've seen that, um, and they kind of advise us that when you blur this line between fun, stupid, candy crush, and education, that it's kind of neither. It's um, disguising educational software. And I want to I want to nudge you to make better choices, uh, senior citizen. Disguising it as a game, um, they urged us to, to not do this. It comes like chocolate covered broccoli. And our user interviews completely show that because people were like, you're trying to sneak in education on me. So I, I guess my point here is um, people have done this in industry who, who want to help. I mean, there's a reason that there's a reason that many people are successful in these industries. Uh, so kind of, you know, maybe just like some insight. Uh, I definitely didn't know a lot about gaming, but some insight for that we did, um, you know, start to adopt is, and it, this led to some tension with NSF, is, you know, what makes a game popular? Um, if you do Duolingo or Among Us, um, you know, Among Us has something like 50 million downloads. It's a, it's a fun multiplayer, like 20-minute game. Um, but people like quick rounds. They like leaderboards comparing with their friends. They like levels and badges and they can just keep playing and it's, it's kind of mindless. Um, and that's what makes these things popular. Um, I will say that, well, I have that on a different slide, but uh, just kind of going through. So, so going back to what we're doing, uh, our game's called Deep Cover. We're, this is one of our very early iterations. Um, we kind of iterated, you know, for, for, for seniors, if we're trying to appeal to them, what, what kind of things do we do? Do we set on a, a kind of an old timey uh, spy theme game. So we did some iteration. We looked at, you know, what's the core gameplay, kind of the back end type stuff. And then the important thing, it, it's great if we think this is great, but what do users really think? So uh, doing the research with users um, is important. It was also, it, it can also be fraught with some tension um, for a few reasons. So. The demographic kind of the numbers research is fine, but we wanted to do some qualitative interviews. So how do we do this? We have um, people in our, in our team split out geographically. So we said, okay, we, we're just gonna we're gonna buy some gift cards. We're gonna set up uh, places and do some interviews with uh, older people. So at every stage, we tried to show them what we could, even if it wasn't perfect. So like we, we weren't gonna wait for a minimum viable product till it was done because then it's going to be too late. So at every stage, we kind of went to people and said, what, what do you think about this interface? Or what, what do you think about this? Um, you don't have to do a lot. Just kind of give us your feedback. And uh, what guided us to do that as we, we, we you know, because it, we did get some input from places like AARP is like uh, even people 60 plus, it's really, I mean, that's a large demographic, right? So you're looking 60 to 65, you know, kind of different chunks and also depending where you are in the country, depending on people's background, you know, seniors are not a homogenous group. So we, we um, within our team, we had a, a task force just to look at users. So we developed these user personas, just kind of, they guide priorities, they inform the design. So um, we have, I think I have, I don't know if I put some more of these. Yeah. So, so we, we created these with a, and when I say we, uh, one person on our team who, who really kind of knew um, user research, 
created these these cards to say, okay, here's like your your typical uh, user of our game, 76 years old. She's a retired middle school teacher in Texas. Um, kind of this is, this is our imaginary person. And we had a bunch of these. These are four. I think we had 10 of these total, like different types of people, different areas of the country, different interests, and said, you know, let's let's find some Barbara Jones and Howard Whites and other people to to give us feedback. And we, you know, this is a very early, this was like the first few months. And we just took these, you know, to different places and said, we're putting this game. What do you, what do you think of this color or this interface? Um, you know, we're, we're trying to tell you about uh, fishing. So what, what, what would you think if you saw a game that looked like this? It's very like super lightweight, just get some feedback from people. Um, some places we did it were like the county fair or the county flea market, rather. We, um, one of our uh, collaborators in South Carolina, she, you know, she went to the Pickens County Flea Market and got some, some feedback. Others went to a county fair. Others went to the library. Um, for many of these, we, we brought along these little questionnaires and, and some gift cards and just asked people, you know, things like, do you, do you use social media? Do you use apps on your phone? We wanted to get a sense of, do you, you know, if we're going to build a product for a mobile phone, are seniors going to use it? How do they get to these games on their phone? You know, we're Candy Crush or whatever. Is it, we wanted to know, is it them or is it their, um, you know, grandkids or, or friends? So, um, again, to build in, you know, take this with a grain of salt, but um, our, our team did have, you know, obviously has a lot of researchers on it. So this, um, their kind of input was uh, useful in many ways uh, to get us to think of things we probably wouldn't have thought of and that gaming companies think about a lot, maybe not as much as they should, which is um, if you if I'm playing a game and, and there's an avatar representing me, um, if I'm an older adult, how do I want to represent myself? Um, because that, then I have to take that and I have to, you know, we elected to hire a gaming company, which, which I'll talk about. So, I mean, these people are not inexpensive. So if you're going to go to a gaming company you've, you've, to build your product, which is going to be a professional product, you've got to be pretty clear on what you want them to build. So the research angle was like, okay, if, if, if nobody likes this avatar, they're just not going to play the game. So kind of um, helping us think through as we interact with older adults to do the user experience, you know, how do you want to be represented? Um, body type, accuracy, um, you know, do you, do you care about customizing it? And um, this kind of stuff. So designing, um, you know, no, no matter what your, your product is, you're going to want to think about um, designing for people. And I, and I see this in, um, you know, with, with my DARPA SBIR is um, the UI, the UX. I, I can't underestimate to everybody how you've really got to think about your users. So, you know, my DARPA SBIR is a very different type of user group. Um, this UI is a very distinct user group. So for um, older seniors, um, the font and the typeface was very important. So, you know, it could look great to me. I'm not a 75 year old on a phone. So getting some kind of advice from UX people, um, giving some money in the proposal to people who understand UX and design is very important. I think for any product that people are going to use, it's very important. So these are some prototypes of just our early uh, designs. You know, do you, um, it mostly would take this to the seniors and say, you know, is this uh, like the, the one in the middle? You want to customize this? Is it easy for you to figure out? Do you care? Um, do you, what, what kind of things do you want to uh, customize on the person? Location was a big one. Um, you know, do we pick a local location, you know, in Texas or New York City or London? Um, so all these things we kind of got some uh, feedback on. Uh, so as I mentioned, we, we um, as part of our phase two, we, we built in a pretty healthy budget for professional game developers. Uh, we could have done it through, I mean, my university has a gaming studio. A couple of other universities do when we looked at that. You know, do we want to, you know, train students and kind of the normal NSF, um, you know, benef broader impact type thing. But really, when you're trying to get a product out and make it something that's going to be sustainable in the future, fix bugs, improve it, um, broaden it to different languages, uh, we, we elected to just go with um, a professional partner. So we found this through through our co-PI and, uh, you know, we interviewed them and uh, they, they liked our mission. It, the game they're developing for us isn't, you know, they're not charging the same as they would for, um, I don't know, like Mortal Kombat or some other type of game. So that's been good because then we, we have somebody that we know, not only knows games and how to build them for people, um, 
but they also understand milestones and deadlines and supportability. So a big part, to go back to the NSF part, so all this is great, to go back to what NSF expects. At some point, they, um, through the curriculum, they talk about pitching. And I'll, I'll go at the end to kind of my um, critiques for improvement for, for the accelerator, which, which, you know, many of us have given NSF. So they, they prepare you to do pitches, which is they want you to do a 60-second, uh, which I did because I'm a fast talker, a three-minute, which my co-PI, who's a professor of communication at Clemson, did because he just knows how to communicate well in three minutes, and then a longer 20-minute, which our, our main PI did. So they wanted you to practice pitching uh, to different audiences at different levels. Um, and I thought that I think that's good for that's good for a lot of reasons. But the pitch is also part of what you get judged on in the accelerator. All this uh, culminates, uh, I don't think they have one this year, but uh, in theory, NSF holds this expo where in theory people can, you know, it, before COVID they can walk around and I, I remember going to this um, or show online and you can like show your wares and maybe somebody likes it and maybe they want to follow up and hand you a bucket of money. Um, I don't think they're going to be doing that anymore because people just basically didn't show up to do these things. Um, but there is a nice uh, kind of virtual brochure they have of, of the projects. Uh, so going back into, you know, when you, if you think about, and I think this is valuable for TTP as well, by the way, um, other ways to spend money, and, and many who come from academia would not, um, you know, the, people are sometimes averse to this, but um, really spending money, and again, right now, uh, my co-PI is meeting with our marketing firm, spend money on doing branding, marketing properly, coding, grad students are wonderful, but, you know, people move on or people cut corners. That's not their full-time job. So somebody who understands coding to a deadline and the back-end infrastructure support. Um, they just don't have to be full-time people, um, but kind of baking that in, I think, is important. Um, like, for example, this, 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 is, this was like our, our, our pitch from one of our co-PIs. I mean, you know, if something takes you 15 minutes to explain, one, this isn't visually appealing, and two, like – I can't even understand this. So kind of looking at these, it's hard, you know, because we come from an academic side, but to say like with the real world, this is just generally not going to resonate as a product pitch. So spending some money, um, so I'm, I'm leaving the marketing side in addition to, to other things, but our, our goals are just build brand awareness. So we're forming a um, part of our outcome, not just, is not just the mobile game, but it is also um a, a, a deeper platform so seniors can actually sit and have a longer, um, we're, we're building in some videos and it's more like a learning platform they can go through. But we're also forming a nonprofit. So that's our exit, kind of our exit strategy from NSF is nobody's going to be, you know, this isn't a moneymaker, that's not the goal, but um, our goal is to impact um, senior citizens and, and older uh, people and their awareness of scams. So Part of part of our goal for marketing is build our build our own brand. AARP also does a lot of this. Um, they don't want us to be competition. So our goal is, you know, which we're still refining, by the way, we still have another year, is like what, what is our brand and what do we want out of this um, nonprofit? Consistent messaging so that any of the co-PIs who went out, you know, we're building a standard pitch deck at the moment where our messaging is really consistent and, and it's clear as to what we're pitching. Um, our goals are also, you know, user metrics. W is um, is a point to get this in the hands of, you know, 5 million seniors, or is it just like something that's nice and sits in the Apple store? So building brand awareness, again, we're, we're in the midst of doing that now, which is, uh, we had a logo, which was pretty good, but um, we had some internal discussions. Is is the brand awareness of the mobile game, which that, that's ephemeral. That'll be around for a couple of years. The platform is going to be around longer. The nonprofit hopefully will be around for a very long time to, you know, kind of tying these and having an identity for the, the outcomes of our accelerator was important, it, along with a tagline. Our original one was uh, play, practice, protect. Uh, we had the marketing firm kind of look at that. They said, that's not bad, but um, they're, they're kind of batting around for us to get a new tagline and visuals, color palette, and, and promotion. So uh, these are just some of my random observations uh, on the accelerator. Again, there's there's lots on their site, so this is more just my experience with it. Um, the accelerator itself, the message this is like not to put anyone down on. I think it's a great program, but um, the messaging is confusing. It's um, commercialized, but don't charge money. So if our first idea, because the big 
push in phase one is like, you got to make money off this, just make money somehow, license it, sell it to somebody. So because these are seniors in social good, we said, okay, how about like we do the, if you want a different um, outfit or, you know, the, the things, the in-game purchases, which are like, you know, usually like 99 cents or something. So we said, okay, our, our break even to just, um, you know, charge a, a few, a few bucks to just pay for backend support uh, was this. And then NSF freaked out. What do you mean you're going to charge seniors money? Okay. Well, you can't commercialize and sell and, and then not charge. So it's like, it, it can be very confusing. It's, it's also like, you need to start a company. Most people are not going to start a company. You need to merge teams. Most teams, the ideas are just so different. Uh, it's with rare exception, you're going to merge efforts. Um, and then doing research, but also create something people pay for. So the Accelerator is a great idea. The messaging is a little confusing, and it's important to get a really good program director, uh, which we have. He's uh, Mike, Mike Posmentier, which many of you know and, and worked with for um, TTP when he was at DHS. The gaps, uh, there's also a lot of curriculum gaps. So, I mean, I think Michael had yesterday on just all the things that should have been in the NSF curriculum. They do not talk about intellectual property almost at all. Um, they don't talk about who owns it. We have five universities on ours. Um, there's nothing in the accelerator about what is the scope of it? Who owns the IP? It's to many of us, it's obvious it's the university. Even to some people on our team, they were like, but, but what do you mean? I made this. Um, all of this should be like day one of the accelerator. Um, are there things I should patent, trademark, license? Just this curriculum is like, you know, if you're a South Park fan, the um, under, underwear elves or gnomes or whatever, like we're going to do this and then profit. Um, the role of the TTO, again, as Michael talked about, so important. You know, now we're in the position of going to them about certain things, uh, but we have kind of educated ourselves. A uh, customer base, just, you know, really telling PIs, if you're new to this, what is a customer base? How do you get to people? How do you do these user surveys? Um, then there's a, a huge focus on kind of venture capitalists, which none of them seem very interested in these things, but um, on another kind of angle, uh, business terms can scare people in academia, um, even people who have the best of intentions. Um, you know, I, these are things I put in quotes that I've heard, which is like, we don't have customers, we have, we have users. Okay, well, I mean, the term is, you know, whatever, but it, it, they're, if they're going to pay for it, they're customers. Um, I've heard people say uh, throughout this accelerator, why would I ask users? I know what they want. Okay, well, I mean, that's great, except, you know, in rare, with rare exceptions. Uh, no one else does this. There's no competitors. Um, everyone's a potential market. I used to hear that a lot with TTP, which, it, like, I totally understand that if you're making a security product like antivirus, everyone is a potential market. You've got to start somewhere. So it's really thinking through kind of um, as you pitch this, okay, everyone potentially is, but who are you going to start with? Um, I'm famous in blah, blah, blah field. I know the best solution. Uh, that's, you know, generally not going to be the case. Um, and then a big one for us that for some reason, us meaning both our team and the accelerator is if you're coming from the academic world, the thought that you need an IRB approval to talk to users, that is just not true. If um, it's a huge, well, maybe it's a nuanced, huge difference. Um, doing research, research involving users and all the kind of IRB stuff around that, that is not the same as doing focus studies. It, it, people get really wrapped around the axle in this. And I feel like this is something that NSF should really talk about a lot more. Yes, if I'm going to write a paper and use the results of my Pickens County flea market uh, interviews, that's a whole different story. But using doing user research to make a product, you do not need IRB approval for that. And finally, and the last of the, of the curriculum, NSF's like, well, of course not. Why would anybody think that? And th this should be up front because, because, you know, in academia, we're so used to, to doing that. Uh, PI culture is hard to overcome, whether it's Accelerator or TTP. Um, Timescales are often misaligned. The, again, the proposal timeline versus like a hot idea you, you really want to get out there versus a hot product that might not be hot in two years so sometimes the time scales are misaligned um there's some you know i heard frustrations where you know even in the middle of the accelerator people are like i don't know why we're even doing this nsf should just do basic research um you know with a new tip directorate it's this you know it's an exploration of um how, how do you expand nsf's mission this traditional like using um, terminal master students or professionals, um, in my experience, is frowned upon a little bit. Um, 
but a lot of that comes back to just you know how how we fund um, grad students. Um, but that, but that culture is still a little hard to overcome. Uh, and I'd say an unwillingness. This is not everybody, um, but I'll I'll generalize. Um, sometimes there's an unwillingness to like to really listen to feedback of potential users, um, and that's that's hard to swallow sometimes. Other concerns, uh, a lot of time is spent on the curriculum versus doing things. So spending this immense amount of time on curriculum that's kind of almost meets the target but doesn't, um, it, it, it's very time intense. Well, tense. Uh, our track, because it was around disinformation, we uh, refactored our um, project to talk about digital scams, to talk about phishing and romance scams, whereas many others in the track still stuck with we're going to teach or mitigate disinformation. So in the midst of the um, accelerator, in the, the tracks, uh, we had several people FOIA'd and uh, we had congressional uh, hearings uh, targeting targeting the whole track, actually. So they actually went to all the universities. So, um, I mean, in general, you know, people people can do this with research, but our track in general, um, there was a lot, just a lot of attention because of the because of the topic area. There were a lot of press articles about the track saying, you know, NSF's funding sources of truth and disinformation and a lot of confusing press, which you know, makes it difficult when you're tr trying to get a product out there. Um, and, and kind of the kicker is NSF would not publicize uh, or do any uh, press announcement about our track. So when track two comes out, usually they're like, hey, we, we funded, you know, whatever these uh, projects and um, they would not publicize because of the potential uh, kind of blowback. Um, so that's that's my uh, high level overview. Um, you know, send me a love or hate mail or suggestions or uh, any of the above. Anyone have any questions for Anita? Here, just comments. Anita, this has come so far. Congratulations! I remember we chatted about it. Gosh, I don't know how long ago it was. A year, a year and a half. I don't know. Yeah, and we still have another year left. But yeah, yes. Yeah, thank great. you. That's really great. I have kind of a sideways question and <laughs> that relates to this and your DARPA work. So um, I'm working with someone now on a potential DARPA SBIR direct to phase two. Very interesting. Yeah. I was wondering, yeah, so I figured you'd know. Do you have any guidance um, on that? Because, you know, I just wrote my, S my uh, statement of work and stuff like that, but it just feels a little funky. Um, is this the one that you connect to me on, or is this a different one? Yeah, it is, exactly. Yeah. So the, so, um, my, the DARPA one that I have for around uh, cryptocurrency, sorry, everybody, um, is, is a direct to phase two. And that, uh, they are very, so I, I don't know, I, we can talk about the, this specific one you're talking about, but in general, for the direct to phase two, you have to show that there are customers who absolutely are going to adopt this. So you need, in general, I know each program's different, because I just wrote a letter for somebody else, you need to show via a letter that somebody is interested. So they don't have to say, I'm going to pay for it, but you have to say, I have an adopter. So in our case for the crypto stuff, we had, um, we, we had the CFTC, which, you know, government doesn't generally spend lots of money, but they said, we are so interested. If we had money, we'd probably buy this, but we want to see blah, blah, blah at the end. Um, it, you don't have to do that, but um, you need to have an adopter. And you need a letter from them that says that you can't just like refer to it. It depends on the program. In general, the letter is what they want that somebody says, um, we find we think this would be useful. And again, in the case of us getting a regulator to say we're going to pay for it just isn't going to happen. But unlike NSF proposals, like for we tried for ours to get NIST to say we would love to have this. Um, they're just not going to do it. For the DARPA project, again, the CFTC, which, which is a Commodities Future Trading Commission, uh, they said this is a really useful thing to prevent money laundering, blah, blah, blah. We would love to see this get funded because it's good for the national security angle So that versus like we're going to write you a check for it. But that was very valuable. <laughs> totally <laughs> valuable. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anita and Florence, we do have a question in the chat. They, uh, Mauricio, I would like you to talk about the letter. How much uh, does it need? How much uh, needs to be in it? And I've also seen some giving someone giving cookie cutter letters um, to people they want to support, it felt a bit too fake. So if you yeah, so, I, I, so Mauricio, I just wrote one yesterday for somebody cyber phase two. Um, and definitely it cannot be fake. It has to be, um, why do you find this useful? And how would you use it? 
So very specifically, like for, for ours, the CFTC said it is useful because nobody is tracking, in our case, nobody is doing cross-market surveillance to look for, I don't know, let's just say money laundering. We would find it useful because we could then go beyond blah, blah, blah and catch criminals. So it's got to be very specific on what's interesting and how would it be used, at least in my experience. Um, yeah, if that, and you, you can, you can um, get a hold of me if you, if you want to see a template or something. Uh, so Roberto, um, yeah, I'd say like TTP and Accelerator are so, so very different um, in terms of the expected outcomes. So the, the main difference is the Accelerator is extremely structured. Uh, for better, for worse, TTP, you know, I, I know with... I, I know NSF is reimagining what TTP is for, for the next kind of iteration. I know they've had some discussions, but currently the accelerator is highly structured. So you have to go through this curriculum. You have to do, you have to show them you've done some, some kind of user interviews. You have to do a pitch at the end to get money for the next phase and the next year. Whereas TTP, um, you get your money and there's, it's much, it's much lighter. So, for Accelerator, we had to meet with our NSF PD every two weeks. And I know people in the AI track, they had to meet with them every week. DARPA for the SIBR, we have to meet with them every month. TTP, it's more like, here's your money. We trust that at the end, you're going to produce something useful. It's, it's just much looser at the moment, at least. So uh, I'm sort of wondering how much time and money and resource you've spent on this so far and, and what the totality is. And I, I don't just mean the funding, right? Because it seems to me like you have enormous resources that you're bringing to bear here compared to what any reasonable commercial company in a startup phase would have. Can you just yeah, give us an overview of what, what they're providing you with and how much resource you get? So uh, that, this is something we talk about internally where we have these fights. So, fi I mean, between all of us friends on the call here, $5,750,000, which is what you get over the phase one and two, that is a lot of money. That is much more. I have, I'm part of a startup right now selling stuff. We have nowhere near that money coming in from anywhere. The argument is like, well, the university takes, you know, 50 to 60%. So it's really two and a half million. Okay, that's still a lot of money. And I think what we have spent is we have not spent, we have spent in time much more than that. So we have spent, you know, if you add up everybody's time and all this kind of stuff, and even with university overhead, we have spent probably, you know, six to seven million, I would say, of time on this. And what's it going to result in? It, I mean, let's well, face it, you could get this result for much, much less money. Well, well so I'm not complaining about the value yeah. for money. Um, try, so you, it includes graduate students and, and other folks who are being paid, you know, ridiculously low amounts of money compared to yeah. what you would pay in the commercial space, right? It does, but so for the for so NSF definitely for the accelerator we're the exception. We are we are funding not fully, but a few grad students. Almost no other tracks funds. You are really not supposed to. The argument, which was very you know our co PS were very vociferous, like I'm just going to have the students do the work instead of hiring contractors because for various reasons. That is almost the exception, Fred. Generally, they don't have students doing that. So you have professors and, and other, you know, long time professionals who have a salary, right? They have right. a salary in an office and all the overheads taken care of. So when you talk about that 50% overhead, that's because you would actually have to have that in the business, right? right. Like, yeah. Yeah. It pays for all the stuff. Yeah. For nothing, right? Yeah. It pays for all our, you know, the space and the, the academic support and yeah, it pays for all that kind of stuff. Then yeah. you also get publicity, right? A lot, a lot of free publicity. The, the government funding source, the university publicity, and you have multiple universities working on this, right? So there's enormous amount of collaboration. For sure for, I mean, when we launched this learning management platform, that is it's super appealing to AARP and various senior homes you talk to, that it comes from an academic side of people who are, who know the field. They know gerontology, they know security, they know. So for them, yeah, it gives street cred. Like the, we weren't just some bozos who made this game. We, you know, we, we kind of, we understand what we're doing. Thank you. Oh, Elizabeth, the team that developed. Yeah, it's, it's funny you say that the, um, so Elizabeth's asking, would we do other demographics? So our, um, our, our, this is what we talked about for after, um, 
after year one. So the game's going to be launched, you know, in, in November. So our, our, we talked about the roadmap a lot. Do we, do we stay with seniors and um, different themes? So our, our roadmap is to branch out to other languages, uh, first to do Spanish and then to do uh, probably Chinese uh, with the realization that it's not just a direct translation, it's cultural. So uh, in, you know, the Spanish speaking community, at least where I live, there's a lot of, um, you know, immigration scams uh, among Chinese grad students, right? There's a lot of immigration scams. Send some gift cards and money or ICE is going to come to your door. So we're doing language first for seniors. And that after that, after the accelerator is over, then our next step is to branch out to other demographics. Yeah, absolutely. But part of, you know, part of what I learned of this accelerator is, this, again, it's not just a translation of the scam. It's the culture and, you know, the way that someone in, in a tribal area is, is um, approached is going to be vastly different than somebody um, in, in, in just in another region. But yes, it can be adapted. And that's part of why the gaming people had us develop in a certain way. So the modules and kind of how they developed it in the back end was very modular and could be adapted. Hi, Anita. Thank you so much. It's good to see you. I turned my camera on, but it's early here. That's okay. I get it. <laughs> I had one cup of coffee. I spent three hours with an FBI analyst in um, Navajo territory in July, and he cautioned me about nonprofits that are profiting from the trauma that exists there. So I like the prospect of, of working with a nonprofit that's NSF-based because I don't think it will be exploiting in the same way that he described others are. So um, to the comment that was made that to me directly that someone will steal my idea, I hope they do. Um, there's such a problem there. But um, what I have in mind, I would, I would really like to talk about collaborating. I've been investigating this for a little more than a year and um, trying to pull it together, but wanting to be very careful. Um, with how, again, there's there's just so much exploitation going on in um, Navajo territory in, in particular, but other indigenous lands as well. Mm -hmm. But the innocence is is present. I you know I come from a rural area, and I I what you described for the older population res resonates with me, but also with youths. Um, they're just so there is an innocence, and I think part of that is due to a lack of access to the internet. In some places, they go to town to find a signal, and that's right. where they get into trouble. So, but I'd be very happy to collaborate. Um, so I'll reach out to you. Cool. Thank you and so I much. Should, I should say also, just in terms of the nonprofit, um, what what we could find there's there was only one other organization in the track that did a nonprofit, and these are the folks who, um, if anyone's from UCSD in the call, they they had a project that started when I was at NSF called Wi Fire. And they have just like, this is probably one of the most amazing projects I've ever seen. They really had their shit together. I mean, they got state money, federal money, school money, and they started a nonprofit all around um, first responders and fires uh, uh, and, and forest fires and, and data to support them. Uh, but even, and I won't talk about it now, but even starting a nonprofit out of this is, is fraught with like, you, you know, you need to talk to your university at some point. You need to depending on how the funding is going to flow, part of our driver to get the nonprofit up sooner than later was so that some of the grant money um, would flow through the nonprofit so that we could avoid some of the university overhead. So just kind of socializing that with the, with the tech transfer office and the VPR's office at universities, um, you know. So, so anyhow, setting up the nonprofit it, it is easy until it isn't. Um, mm -hmm. but, but for us, it's a good exit. Good work. Well, thank you so much. We had a follow-up question on the letters. Would a letter of support from elected officials or politicians carry any weight in this day and age? Um, yes, it would carry weight. So like for hours, we didn't get a letter, but we are going to be using uh, one of the Congress people in South Carolina because it's because of this like pervasive, like this is his thing and his it feels like it's just a big issue. So I've, I've seen these letters. I mean, it's not a letter of support. It's got to be something saying something tangible. But yeah, I, I, I don't think there's any reason not to. Thank you so much, Anita. That was a great presentation. Very helpful. Very informative. Okay, so we are going to um, continue on with our panel discussion on the future of TTP um, security. Um, and Jim Bathney is going to take over as the moderator of our panel. Thanks, Deborah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm uh, 
I'm Jim Basney. I'm the director of Trusted CI. Um, as Deborah says, I'm your moderator. And um, the good news is that Deborah is one of our panelists. Uh, so we'll hear some more from her um, in a moment. Um, so before I ask our uh, three panelists to introduce themselves and we get the discussion started, uh, let me start with some um, some logistics. Uh, please do be um, uh, thinking about questions for the panelists so that we can have an interactive discussion um, and use the the Zoom raise hand feature. You'll find it under the reactions. So when you're ready to ask your question, raise your hand. I'll, I'll call on you. You can unmute. Um, if you like, you can turn your camera on, uh, but uh, not required. And please do introduce yourself. Um, if you um, uh, want to adjust your name in Zoom, uh, if you go over to the participants list and right click on your name, maybe you want to add your affiliation to your name just to, to help with introductions so we we know who all is uh, joining the, the discussion. And so uh, please do be thinking about questions and comments for the panelists. We've got a good topic, the future of cybersecurity, TTP, lots of TTP programs to discuss and uh, uh, lots of, uh, uh, I'm sure we'll discuss lots of different ideas about um, future TTP opportunities. So uh, in alphabetical order, our three panelists this morning are Deborah, Florence, and Roberto. And so I'm gonna ask each of them to introduce themselves and, and make some initial remarks about this the, the panel topic today before, uh, before I ask them a few questions, and hopefully you all ask them uh, lots of good questions too. So, uh, so let's let's do it all alphabetically. So, Deborah, if you could uh, go first, please, with an introduction. Okay, so um, I'm up first. Um, again, as I said yesterday, I am the associate dean and uh, director of graduate studies at the University of South Alabama School of Computing. Um, my introduction really to TTP um, came through um, the I Corps program here at the University of South Alabama with Dr. Dr. Michael Chambers, who we um, heard from yesterday. Um, I have worked with him on the teaching team um, as part of our i -Corps program for um, the past five years. I -T -T uh, TTP and i -Corps are very similar um, in their um, goal and, um, and their processes, um, so the two align um, very closely. As far as um, the future of cybersecurity TTP, um, we really have to stay on top of things with the cyber threats getting more sophisticated. Um, we, it was just on the news this morning that two of the major hotels on the Vegas Strip were hit with a cybersecurity attack and paid millions of dollars in ransomware and still are not sure that their um, information was not leaked. Um, so the threats are getting more sophisticated. They're coming more often. Um, so we have to ramp up um, the efforts to um, prevent them. Our, of course, artificial intelligence and machine learning are going to play into that as those are um, super hot topics right now as well. So looking forward to the, top, to the discussion this morning. Perfect. Thank you, Deborah. Florence, you're up next. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll share a little bit more about my background, about why I care so much about cybersecurity. So I've been doing this forever. So <laughs> my first... My internship when I was in college was at Grumman, um, so it was in the DOD space, you know, Department of Defense. So, you know, when people say zero trust, I'm like, duh, it's always been, that's the whole point. You can't trust anybody. That's why we need cybersecurity. So ever since then, I've been very involved in it. And I got involved in TTP, thanks to Anita and Alec, actually. Um, when I uh, graduated from IBM, I was a VP and a CTO there, and I actually um, ran part of the mainframe business. So you know, there's an encryption facility that's the most secure, makes it the most secure server on the planet. So I've always been in the cybersecurity space. Um, and they asked for thoughts because I also um, worked on the Emerging Business Opportunity Program at IBM. So building new businesses at this big company. And so I had the entrepreneurial side internally, and now I'm CEO of my own little um, firm as well. So I got involved then, and we learned together kind of, you know, because you can look at a problem and then sometimes you see new things, <laughs> you know, there's new parts of the problem or new potential opportunities. So I was very fortunate to get involved then. And then um, Anita um, and I worked together and we created a, a TTP award, you know, a, a proposal that could be worthy of a, an award. So I got a grant in 2016 
And then, um, and then Jim and Vaughn, <laughs> a trusted CI after I left internet too, said, hey, you want to come do it here? Like, how perfect is that? You know, it really should be part of the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. So I was really happy to come over and help out with that from about 2018 to 2020-ish, I think. Um, I remember we were at the Big Ten Center right before COVID shut everything down. Remember that one, Jim? They were saying, you know, check your email before you get on a plane. And then I came back and the next day I interviewed at Columbia for this role. And so, um, but I, I take cybersecurity with me, including the standards work. And I'm also on the Princeton Alumni Angels, so I work a lot with startups as well. So I'm delighted to help, you know, anybody think through this. And I'd love to talk about, like, new things that we could do together. Um, that would be a lot of fun and perhaps even more impactful because we keep learning and learning and learning, you know, and maybe, you know, a spark will occur and some new idea will come up. Great, Florence. Uh, thanks for that introduction. And uh, uh, next up is Roberto. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks for organizing this uh, workshop. Um, so, um, well, uh, I'm a professor in, at the University of Georgia, uh, where I'm also the director of the Institute for Cybersecurity and Privacy. And uh, my experience with TTP is admittedly limited, uh, but uh, I was part of uh, the DHS TTP, uh, Cybersecurity TTP program uh, at one point. I don't think that program exists anymore, as far as I know, um, unfortunately, because it was it was actually a great experience uh, in, in my view. So I'd, I'll be happy to talk about it uh, later if there are any questions. Uh, my um, involvement with that program was, was actually quite interesting um, in that, I mean, the way it happened in that, uh, so I, um, I had an NSF-funded uh, grant, uh, funded funded by OAC, the Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure, um, and uh, and basically that uh, project just went through, you know, research, uh, uh, you know, grant as as usual, and then at the end, um, you know, we developed an actual system for malware detection at the network uh, level, and uh, it turned out that. You know, we we tested it, we deployed it at uh, UGA uh, across the entire campus network, and um, the infos infosec people at UGA actually loved it. I mean, they they really wanted not to go down all the time because it was a proof of concept code, as you can imagine, in real world deployment uh, in a very large campus network, things can happen, right? And and so they they really wanted to. Um, Try to keep this uh, uh, software running, so our uh, funding was running out. So I, you know, happened to meet with the program manager, and and I said, hey, we we did all of this work, and NSF paid all this money, and this seems to be useful, but the funding is running out, and so now what? <laughs> and he suggested this um, DHS program, so we prepared a, a pitch, basically a presentation to DHS. And uh, Mike Bosmantier, in fact, uh, was uh, was the program manager at that time, and now he's with NSF. Um, and um, yeah, we got invited to basically uh, just uh, join the, the TTP program, and uh, and from then on, we continue with the development, and uh, we open source the code, so it it was not a commercial uh, tool. And eventually, got well. Besides the uh, continuous deployment to UGA which I think up to very recently uh, continued uh, as well. So this was uh, in from 2014, almost, I'd say uh, probably eight years of continuous deployment at UGA, which is which is good. Um, and then we also deployed at uh, another university, another large university. And uh, because it was open source, we got contacted by you know, people on GitHub um, asking for support for the code and so on. So it was deployed at some small companies as well, which was great. But then, of course, the the landscape itself changed, and uh, uh, and so the, the the system in the end kind of like became less useful um, because of all encrypted traffic and so on and so forth. The packet inspection, which was um, one of our main uh, main tools, I guess, for detecting malware and so on. Um, is is difficult now, right? So, so it, in the end, uh, that experience ended, um, but it was great. So, and um, that's yeah, that's that's it. That's my story. 
it's the full uh, life cycle uh, that you've been through, Roberto, uh, of yeah. the, the TTP life cycle. That's great. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, before I ask my first question, any any comments uh, between the, the panelists yet, uh, Florence or Deborah? No? Okay. Um, so um, everybody, please do be thinking of your questions and, and comments for the panel. Uh, let me ask my first question of the panelists. Um, so thinking about the future of TTP, are there approaches or programs that you would recommend as especially promising for future TTP efforts? We've heard a lot of, uh, about a lot of different NSF programs, a lot of different ways of doing TTP. Um, which, which ones would, would you highlight as uh, uh, deserving of special consideration for our, our, our attendees today considering TTP? Who wants to go first? Go ahead, Florence. I'll go. Thank you. So yesterday um, I was presenting and I didn't actually say what I do right now. So I'm at Columbia University and I'm executive director and PI for the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub and also PI um, for the COVID Information Commons, which is a portal NSF asked us to create to enable researcher collaboration regarding COVID research. And um, it's very complementary or integrated with what we do at the hub because our four main areas at the Northeast Hub are um, health, um, education, data literacy, responsible data science, which includes security, privacy, and ethics, and then urban total communities. And so one of the things I presented yesterday, and um, if there were any of you that, that didn't get it, Deborah has our slides, and I think she's going to share them. So in the COVID information commons, NSF said, you have to enable research or collaboration. We're like, okay, that sounds good. And um, what we found is that when we created this portal, they wanted it, they all wanted to participate, a lot of them, dozens of them, wanted to present to each other and participate with each other. Um, and so it became a very collaborative community. And in fact, some of them, we, we do webinars and we have a little prep call beforehand so everybody can practice. And on one of them, there were two PIs who were like right up the road from each other, one at USC, one at UCSD. They were both doing ground glass opacity lung research during COVID. And they were like, you're doing that? Oh, you're doing that? Oh, wow. You know, let's talk. And so they ended up talking and then one had one of the other students work in their lab and um, they submitted an NIH proposal together. And so, you know, a lot of us when we're researchers, we're in our lab. We don't get out much sometimes. Um, and so when we create these opportunities for collaboration, that's very focused on the topic because, you know, some of us are very analytical, very focused, heads down. This is what we're working on. And you find your peeps. You're like, whoa, you're kidding me, right? Someone else I can talk to. They know what I'm talking about, you know, and maybe we can do something together. So I would encourage us as a family to see if anybody would want to work on this together. I don't know if there would be, um, you know, appetite for it at NSF, but maybe creating like a portal in a community like the COVID Info Commons, but for cybersecurity. I think that could be very interesting to NSF. I think it could be interesting to other people now that everybody is getting hit with ransomware and, you know, humans in the loop and devices inside humans and even, you know, casinos, you know, people who don't even know who Armor NVIDIA is, you know, know what ransomware does, right? And so I think it could be very interesting to get support behind and I would be happy, you know, to work on that with somebody. So that's one thing that I think we could do. We create a collaborative community, even if they don't want to talk to each other, they can learn from each other. You know, when I was showing how you could look at each other's research and then you can click through to their project website you know, so you don't even really have to talk to him if you don't want to talk, um, but you can if you want to um, and, you know, do webinars and people who want to present their stuff come and people who just want to listen come. Um, and so creating multiple different um, ways that they can learn about what else is going on and collaborate if they want to, I think could help us move things forward. I know I was just looking at some of the Proto OKN projects that are being funded by NSF, the Proto Open Knowledge Network products. And there was one of them, um, and the PI and I worked on a different proposal together, and I saw some of the ideas we had in that proposal, which wasn't funded, and the one that got funded for her. I'm like, oh, that really worked out great, right? You know, the collaboration. And so I think there's a real opportunity to do that, and I think the government would be happy if we tried that. Great. Thanks, Florence. I agree. Those collaborations are, are really key. Um, so we might uh, we might have some uh, more discussion about building those collaborations. Um, uh, Deborah, what do you think about um, 
approaches or programs we might highlight today? Um, you know, I think for the cybersecurity, of course, there's the standard um, SATC and NSF funded um, projects that we need to look at. Also, you know, my affiliation with i um, those are great um, TTP programs. They're, um, like I said, the standard, but that's probably because that's what's available and that's what we can get funded. So um, if you're interested in um, implementing TTP, you can get that, hopefully get that funded through some of the NSF projects. Um, don't forget, though, to integrate that with your tech transfer offices. Um, um, as, we've, as we've seen just discussed today, um, that's not always an approach that's used, and you need to make sure that you're protecting your um, intellectual property as you go through this process. Thanks, Deborah. And uh, Roberto, you mentioned uh, DHS may not be the future of, of TTP funding, but um, but uh, what, what do you think uh, we might highlight for the future? Yes, yeah, so unfortunately that program uh, died as well, <laughs> died down. Um, I don't remember when, but a few years ago, if I'm not mistaken, um, it lasted probably for, I don't know, maybe five years or something like that, or maybe a little bit more. Um, so I I don't know what the best approach is, to be honest, but I can tell you what I would like to see and what I'm considering myself um, with a colleague, actually, Omar is, is um, connected as well. Um, we are considering um, SATSI TTP and um, so, sort of as a bridge to the next step. I, I not, I'm not, um, you know, I was not very familiar with the uh, converg Convergence Accelerator program, but, um, you know, from, from Anita's presentation, which was very useful, it seems to me that, uh, you know, in many cases, researchers need something in between um, because sometimes w what happens, at least in my experience, is that, yes, you have a research uh, product, right, uh, that, uh, that seems to be useful to others, but, but you, you need still a little bit of time to develop more and, and to really um, explore whether the, the, there is a potential for, uh, uh, for transition or not. And I, and I feel like the, um, both the DHS TTP in the past and the Convergence uh, Accelerator program were of the kind that um, like you have to commit to it, right? You know, go for a, go for transition. That's that's your uh, that's your goal. You have to spend a lot of resources on that. Um, again, you know, I, I I wish there were more opportunities to have a bridge in between the two phases. Um, to fa the, the two phases for researchers to to explore a little bit more whether they want to go uh, full full speed on on the transition side if it makes sense right for that particular research product to to actually become a, a product in the real world um, it seems to me from from my understanding which is limited um, you know the NSF TTP is probably the closest thing to to what I'd like to see. Uh, that that I can think of. There may be other opportunities. So if if anybody has any other ideas, uh, it would be great to to hear from them. You know, on that note, I'm wondering. Um, a, a number of agency has agencies have SBIRs, right? DARPA has them, NIH has them. I think NREL, ARL, like a bunch of them have them. Um, could that be another avenue? Do you think, Roberto? Um, so for uh, SBIR, you mean? Yeah, could SBIR kind of be, <laughs> you know, one of the options rather than TTP? I know TTP lets you hang out more on the research side. You don't have to get yeah. something out the door. I think STTR is a little bit more, you know, technology oriented um, versus business oriented. Do you think those are, are options that could help or not really? I mean, sure. I mean, these are sort of like different uh, paths, but the, the way I see it is that the NSF TTP case is would be ideal to me in the sense that, you know, you don't have to have a company or former company or or even collaborate with a company necessarily like very closely. Uh, you, you are still, you, you have your, let's say, research outcomes from a fundamental research grant you're basically bringing them closer to the point in which you might want to 
directly work alongside a company or form a company, right? So I'm, I'm, I was really talking about this phase in between uh, that, that um, you know, it's, it's risky, right? Because um, you don't know in, in the end if it's going to transition or not, uh, or even get to the point in which you try to, to really transition with a company. Um, and, and I feel like perhaps the, the only opportunity is, is really NSF TTP. I mean, you're still a professor, you still work with graduate students, you know, you do more development, you, you, you um, improve the functionalities of your uh, uh, research product and so on and so forth. And then uh, eventually you're like, you know what, this actually truly works and uh, let's go full speed on the TTP uh, yeah. experience. I don't know. I mean, Anita, you, 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 I don't know if you can uh, jump in, but you, you, you definitely uh, have experience with the SATSI TTP uh, as program manager. So I, I don't know if this still matches uh, sort of like what the uh, SATSI TTP is looking for, or maybe the program has also changed in, in time. And so, uh, so I know they're refactoring really for next year. I think, I think Alex said they might have, Cliff. Wang might have sent some slides. So I know TTP is refactoring itself because I think you hit on the key thing, which is there is this gap of, um, yeah, so that's CC, um, which is, I think Rob Beverly was going to join, but he's on vacation. So um, yeah, that's the program area that's like more, most closely aligned, I guess, with what a transitionable uh, thing might be. Uh, Alec, I don't know if they sent anything. Let me, let me go back to the very beginning there and show you where he kind of started here. He gave a few slides um, uh, and said, here's the, how, how not to write a proposal, for example. And I know these are common things. Uh, are they things you want to talk through? You may, um, want me to run through these bullets real quick, and then we'll get to the later part. So I think to get to, get to Roberto's question and maybe the other question, um, how, to, how not to write it. Um, yeah, I mean, so I think, Roberto, I guess your question of, you know, maybe you don't know the exact technology or innovation being transitioned. Maybe you're like, I don't even know if anybody's going to use this. How, how, do I, how do I even know if it's transitionable? So I think this is spot on. Don't discuss the readiness. Yeah, I think that this is right. Don't identify a partner. Right. So I think. I think this is where NSF is going, where it's more aligned with what you're asking, which is like, I don't know if people are going to use this. Can I use my money in this TTP time to do, you know, customer discovery? Um, what is the next slide, Alec? Yeah, we've heard this. Hey, hey, Alec, Alec, before you go on to the next slide, um, somehow the double negatives that this whole slide is about, you know, make it a little bit bizarre and harder to, to put through your brain. Um, yep. Don't not do this. Don't not do that. Um, right. I, I think it might be more effective if you said, here are the things that you're going to have to do if you want to succeed, rather than don't do these not things if you're not going to. I don't okay. know what it is. Is that on probably, a previous probably. slide? I don't know. Are there other slides that say, like they say, tell me what you do want, not what you don't want? Yeah. I, I agree. I am, uh, and and I'm not certain that I can have provide a good response to that. It's a good observation, Fred. We're just trying. Um, so, okay, to move on now. Yeah, and again, I know they're refactoring uh, what this means for within TIP and and OAC. So I don't want to speak for NSF. Yeah, these are some success stories. I mean, one of them and, being. And uh, I did want to do want to. I do want to mention that it's really easy to go out there and find these. And so if somebody would like to see these success stories, the numbers that, that come with them, the NSF numbers, you just go out there to the NSF and search awards and put that number in, and they'll pop up. So you now have at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight success stories that you can see. And you can also look up these search terms on these. And I'm sure we can get a copy of this slide without the cover on it if people would like to see it. And, and we will include this with our package of slides that goes with the workshop. And there's your so, next slide there. So, uh, so, uh, Alec, do, do we have information on the excluded uh, middle here? <laughs> like like how many how many of their attempts didn't get there? Anita, is that information? There's a little bit of not much information given out by NSF on uh, awards that were not funded. There probably are numbers. But, but I don't mean the ones that weren't funded. I mean the ones that were funded that weren't successes. I think so. Of these, I mean the big ones that were successful were Zeke, 
once that you know became accompanying a thing that last one radu cyan it, it's maybe like five percent of these were, were successful okay so 95 percent failure rates for commercialization attempts right yeah i mean i I don't want to speak with the PI and say failure, but I mean, no, no, no. I, I'm not asking you to speak for them. So, so you know, I, I think in simple terms, right? So, so, so if if you look at uh, at other spaces of investment, we'll talk about them later. The five percent success rate is really tough to live with as an investment. Yeah, not many of these uh, made it across the the. Five. I think Stingar, which is covered up, that re recently in the past six months, somebody <clears> might have either acquired that, but yeah, it's like five to ten percent. Yeah, I know DARPA has programs that do much, much better in many ways. Um, not not that all their programs do, but the, the ones I've seen a lot of those. There's another one, um, I think it's Navy, um, has really short, um, very inexpensive, like $50,000 funding levels that they give out very easily. And, and I, they probably get more than 5% uh, successful companies. That is companies that, that become profitable and last for some period of time before they collapse, which all companies eventually do, right? There's also NSF SBIR, but the numbers are very tiny for how many they fund in that program. Uh, Alec, what is the next slide? Yeah, I mean, that's just like third apple pie, use inspired initiatives. Okay, so I know, again, not to speak for NSF, but I know that um, Cliff Wang recently started is um, they're re kind of refactoring what it means. So I believe, yeah, so tip director is where convergence sits. Uh, the POSE program is another software you know, like software supportability program, access, CC transition. Um, this still doesn't talk about TTP necessarily. So next one. So I think, Roberto, part of, the, part of the answer is NSF is thinking more broadly about how TTP is being done. Um, next slide. Yeah, I think this. a lot of these are just... So I think to, to get to um, Akul's question of what what are some ways you can leverage the academic or this community for discovery? Um, so I guess there's two questions here. Is the TTP guidelines, what do they want? And how can you leverage what we do well, you know, the academic world? So I'll, I'll just answer that. I think um, I've seen people do things like just do a survey among students. That That is like not the right way to do it unless you're doing a student focused um, product necessarily. Um, but I think Leveraging the academic or this community, there are ways for, I, I think, one, using your university. So I personally am a fan of, it's not the tech transfer office, but many of our universities have kind of community, whatever they call it, community outreach or community offices. They are more than happy to help you. And there are also, again, especially if you're at a big university, there are little pockets where we found through a couple of universities, they have these um, senior learning centers that are a national network associated with universities where they have hooks into community groups where they. Uh... OK, so that's the last slide that uh, Deborah, did you want to talk at all about? That was the one that popped up first. Did you want to touch on the CC transition to cyber infrastructure resilience? Um, no, I'm good. I mean, it's just one of the uh, program areas with NSF that that should be of interest for um, anyone looking at TTP. Okay, let me go ahead and stop that. Thank, and thanks for letting me know about the screen. Sometimes you can share the app and sometimes you share the screen. I guess I got all my emails there. So here you go. I'm going to stop sharing and, and you can get back to the panel. And I'll send Deborah the slides. We did have a uh, question. Um, what are some ways you can leverage the academic slash this community to do customer discovery? Yeah, I think Roberto had a, a, a great example of that. Uh, you've got a cybersecurity technology you can deploy in your campus network and get feedback from the campus. Uh, we've got other cyber infrastructure providers in the community. We've got the NSF major facilities that might deploy, be early adopters of a cybersecurity technology. And so um, looking for the, the, the potential early adopters, customers that are right there on your campus or elsewhere in the, the NSF community might help you build that bridge then out to the general public or to the you know, Fortune 500 or, or, or who your, your next set of customers are. So that's, that's one option for that, um, for that question. But uh, what are other thoughts on customer discovery? Can I can I jump in for a second on this? Uh, um, so I I know that some some colleagues have had um, 
not great success in terms of working with their campus uh, IT, uh, for example, to, to deploy solutions and so on and so forth. Sometimes there are sensitivities that are, you know, different in different uh, parts of the country. Uh, personally, I, I think that's the way, really that's the way to go. Like if you form a relationship with, with your InfoSec uh, group, uh, IT information security group, or whatever the name is in your institution, um, it, it's really going to open up a lot of opportunities to to deploy, you know, many uh, of of the things that we work on, um, and and make them really practical. And typically, they really like uh, to to you know, assuming that the the, the research product, of course, is uh, useful uh, to them as well. They they really have a, a big incentive because. Yes, of course, their, their mission is, uh, you know, day-to-day -day, uh, management of the network infrastructure and, uh, you know, security uh, on campus. But uh, typically what I've seen is that they part of their mission is to facilitate, right, uh, researchers' um, uh, success as well. And and so they, they're, at least in my experience, they're very open. Uh, I've, I've had the experience both at UGA and Georgia Tech, um, and, uh, and it's been... It's been great, really. So, um, highly recommended to work with uh, with your uh, your campus IT. And uh, uh, lots of great ideas in the chat, um, including from Anita, leverage your university community outreach office. Um, uh, your uh, uh, look for community organizations in security for uh, helping with outreach, and of course, uh, social media is another important outreach option. Uh, for uh, for connecting with customers. Um, so uh, Florence, in your introductory remarks, uh, you brought up uh, a really uh, uh, great uh, challenge that's uh, we don't just need to connect with potential customers. We need to connect with collaborators to build our TTP team as we're working through the, the TTP journey. Um, and so I wonder if we might uh, have some discussion about different options for that. Um, so in, in Anita's presentation, she talked about the, the annual meeting of the different people doing the, uh, the conservant, uh, the, the accelerator, uh, convergence accelerator projects. And, you know, so attending these NSF meetings, I think, is one good way for us to share information, meet each other, find people working on similar, similar topics, um, having portals uh, like the COVID information commons uh, that you talked about, Florence. Uh, what are some other ways that we can we can build the team uh, for you know taking the next step in our cybersecurity TTP journey? You know, Anita put an interesting idea as always into the chat about Discord, where a lot of cybersecurity people hang out. Um, you know, or the DEF CON channel on Discord, or you know, whatever. So, as you know, you have to be careful. <laughs> <laughs> what you do uh, with, you know, in the community, because they have two different hats or three or five. So, um, but that's an interesting opportunity because they might know people with a challenge that your security could address. So it might be interesting to tee up like, hey, do you know anybody with a problem like this? You know, if that's, you know, what you're thinking of addressing and maybe, you know, you can find something like I say, you know, when, you know, you go to a bunch of bars and you're looking for someone to marry, you only have to find one. <laughs> you don't have to find 200, <laughs> you know. And so the same thing, you know, like Anita was saying, that if there's someone that, you know, would really benefit from this, that could be very valuable in your TTP. Um, so maybe like, you know, channels like that, Discord's a great one, you know, the DEF CON community um, Meetups, not so much. I've used meetups before. They tend to be very, you know, homogenized and not very um, deep. But I, I feel like when I used to work with the DHS folks, um, when Mike used to have his roadshow that went around the country, Mike and Doug, um, they would they would come in with a problem and the person who's going to use it. And a lot of times it would be their community. So I remember there was one from PNNL that PNNL was going to use or PNNL, you know, Pacific Northwest National Lab that Lawrence Berkeley National Lab was going to use. So they work with their peeps and they listen for the challenges and then they develop the solution and then they have a ready, a ready organization uh, to collaborate with and to help. So, you know, maybe if like, you identify this as a problem. You look around and say, 
who else might have this problem, you know, and, you know, then maybe kind of target. Um, so that's one thing that seemed to work well for DHS in my perception. I think the, uh, that uh, DEF CON uh, Discord uh, ideas is a really good one. Um, uh, uh, lots of uh, lots of good ideas. Thanks, Florence. Um, yeah, and they have movie night every Friday night. Um, so if you're lonely, it's at eight o'clock Pacific, which is eleven o'clock Eastern, and you can watch a movie with them if you want. Anita also suggested just talking to people in security. Go to your local cons too. It doesn't have to be anything national. Right. We've all got limited travel budgets. Look, look local. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. Oh, go okay. ahead, Florence. One other thing I'll just mention is if um, if you spelunk a little bit through all like the TTP or SADSI or whatever, cybersecurity awards, you might find a researcher like I was showing you can do in the kick that's in an area that you're trying to address. And you could just reach out to them, especially with NSF. There's always an email address for a PI, not so much with NIH or maybe some of the others. Um, but you could just email them and say, hey, you know, I was thinking this, you know, or um, since our spam filters are so aggressive now with everything going on, or connect with them on LinkedIn or, you know, send an email to their lab that like a conscientious grad student would be, <laughs> would be responding to. You know, you might have to use different uh, avenues uh, but that's an idea, too, like find someone that's doing work in an area that you're trying to address. And they might be like, oh, my gosh, this is a godsend. I've been looking for an answer for this, you know, or let's work together. So like Anita said, talk to people or collaborate with them. It could be, you know, virtual digital talking. So we've had a good discussion about cybersecurity trends uh, that can impact the future directions of our cybersecurity TTP. How about marketplace trends that uh, that we should be thinking about when we're we're planning future TTP efforts? Are there are there changes on the horizon in the cybersecurity marketplace that uh, may change how we how we plan out our our business plan for TTP? How we engage with potential partners and and customers? What what do y'all think about that? Um, one of the emerging things that um, I see a lot, um, which hits home because I'm married to an insurance agent, but uh, cybersecurity insurance um, is becoming a big player in the marketplace. Um, so risk assessment and response planning and compliance. So you see a lot of companies implementing um, cybersecurity plans that's driven by their insurance um, and their insurance companies. So there is going to be more of a market demand for this um, from at the um, business level so that they can get the insurance that they need. They're, of course, um, very scared to get a ransomware attack. And um, so the cyber, cyber insurance is a definitely a marketplace trend. Uh Florence, Roberto, any, any other thoughts on that topic? Yeah, and I see Anita put in, I'm seeing increasing focus on risk GRC versus pure security products. And what's GRC? Uh, governance, governance, risk, and compliance. Right, okay. So that's like how boards talk, right? And so this is a topic at the board level now. You know, I was mentioning, I think yesterday or maybe today, that uh, when I was trying to create some cybersecurity strategies, you know, 15 years ago, there was no market there wasn't a market size because it was a gazenta. Either it was in what you did or people didn't know or it was invisible. It's not invisible anymore. So the good news is that they might have a budget for it where they didn't have before. Um, so it might be interesting to look at some of the market trends where those budgets are. Um, I know I have cybersecurity insurance for my consulting, and I don't do like, you know, big fat consulting at this point on those things, but it's worth having it because you never know. Um, but I would look for uh, places where you think there could be a market. The other thing is that cybersecurity, as you know, everything's connected to everything now. So you may have a target use case, but it would be interesting to look at the ecosystem of who would be affected if they're were something bad that happened that you're trying to mitigate. 
and then look at maybe some of the other players. So like when we look at, I was mentioning yesterday, this TIPS framework, trust, identity, privacy, protection, safety, and security for clinical IoT, clinical Internet of Things. Um, you know, there are the device manufacturers, there are the hospitals that deploy the technology, there are the payers who are paying for things, you know, maybe they would like to have different types of requirements and how they would charge people based on if they had good cybersecurity or not, um, the providers, the software manufacturers. So it might be interesting to look at the ecosystem that you would be hopefully positively impacting. So you may have more clients than you realize. And that might be an interesting uh, task. I wanted to uh, provide a different type of input, which is, um, well, maybe rephrasing, can you identify marketplace marketplace trends or uh, to can you identify academic trends that have implications for the future of DTP? And I'm thinking about artifacts. Um, as you might know, uh, the you know, several conferences now uh, have a sort of like a separate program, right, where you can submit your artifacts for evaluation, right, your paper artifacts, essentially, right. And I wish there was a way for, uh, in fact, I talked to some program managers at NSF uh, before, but like to provide maybe supplemental funding for sort of like the best artifacts that actually have potentially a, a chance to become to become something more right in in the future if developed further and uh, and and maybe you know consider those as um and also something like a i'm not sure i'm not sure if it's like a prerequisites for for an NSF TTP uh type of grant but but uh but consider them more seriously you know, in terms of how uh, you know, they they may impact um, so like future funding from NSF towards uh, TTP efforts. Just a thought. <laughs> yeah, the uh, you know the the journals uh, uh, giving us the framework for packaging up the technology into a reproducible artifact that can go along with the publication. That's that's helping us along the journey of having you know software or the, you know, technology that other people can use. Uh, that's that's helping us on the TTP journey, and 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 those artifacts can be good um, good to cite in the proposal for the next you know the next phase of your TTP. That that's a really interesting connection. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Florence. I have another comment or question, and I would love Anita or anybody's input on this. So, when you know we worked with Doug Mon and Paz when they were at a DHS, and they came over to NSF, and I was like, ooh, maybe TTP will be in everything now. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I think Congress might love that, you know, if we actually had results, not necessarily money that went to the researcher, you know, because it became a business, but actually focusing on transitioning it to practice, you know, as we, you know, Alec and some of the early um, workshops I came to that you and Anita did, you know, where it was like, you know, don't just write a paper, what are the other incentives? And I think it would be cool, and I don't know if that's part of what they're hoping to do, but they have to do it slowly, you know, get everybody in the boat. If um, if TTP could become more of an expectation or one of the potential goals for every award, you know, because that shows results that, you know, have, you know, what is, a, how are you using this for good? You know, how is it positively impacting the country, our citizens? So, I'm actually wondering if NSF might have a dream um, to add TTP to more of the uh, the awards. Uh, does anybody have a thought about that? Is that like a really bad idea? Um, people told you, don't let anyone say that out loud, or um, is it a good idea? Any thoughts on that? I, I do have a, a quick thought. I the people and Anita is the one that was there, and of course, right in the middle of all of this, and maybe even too close in some ways to see it. But there was a ton of resistance from, uh, particularly from the PIs that have been there a long time, for including any TTP in these basic research programs at all. And coming up with a structure that fit that people could agree to, I know, was a huge battle. And like I say, I know Anita experienced it; she was right there in it. So. Um, I, I don't know. It was very difficult. 
to uh, to be able to convince people that TTP was uh, was a good thing to do. Uh, good friends of mine that were program directors at NSF didn't didn't want to have anything to do with the project to talk about it, even though they had TTP in their program. So uh, I think the culture there is is basic research at NSF, uh, but but and they've come a long way. And of course, Anita, as she mentioned, she was a, a promoter of it, and we got got us going. You you and me, uh, Florence and and so Kevin. Uh, so it, anyway, it's uh, I think it's going to be a tough, tough road to hoe. And I know a lot of folks would like to see it. And as Fred, but as Fred said, you know, it's the investment's tough, too, because it's tough to turn these basic research projects into a successful startup. Um, uh, and Anita, of course, had some ideas about maybe using agencies more and other things like that. But I think it would it would take a culture change. Yeah. And it doesn't need to be a startup. So practice could be people are using it, <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to be people are paying for it. it doesn't have to be, it's a company. Um, but it just could be that it's doing good in the world. Now, as we know, you know, some of us are on a, you know, we're on a path of discovery and it takes a very long time for some of the research to get to the point that it actually can be deployed years and years and years. Right. I mean, I worked on stuff. Oh, I shouldn't say how old I am. I will. So in 1979 at NASA, when I was designing an insight to propellant production system for Clisto and Ganymede, and now they're going to go to Europa. God, you know how many years ago that was? Man, that took a long time. One of the reasons I left NASA. They told me it would be 20 years until my project went up into space, and in some cases, 40. Um, so, you know, it, it's interesting. It does take a long time. But if there's just like, you know, like a hat tip to it, you know, um, that, you know, think about how this could be deployed you know, in the real world, kind of the way I know when the the medical field came up with an acronym for real world evidence, like they needed an acronym, you know, to get people to focus on it. It's compared, don't you always want real world evidence when you're doing things with humans? But they had to, you know, they did that. Um, so people could talk about it uh, that way. So maybe, you know, there could just be more of a, a little bit of a cultural shift to have them thinking about it. It doesn't have to be, you have to transition to practice, but you know, maybe it's part of the REU part or something like they tuck it in as a cute little idea, <laughs> you know, research experience for undergraduates where they're looking at the future because they'll be here for it, you know, for another 80 years. Um, maybe some of us will if technology improves, you know, but maybe to tuck it in somewhere to see if it can get some legs to see if people are attracted to it. You know, I totally agree that NSF would have a hard time saying, let's do this. And I think that's how Doug felt when he came in, even though I think he would like to have done it. Um, but, you know, it doesn't mean we give up. You know, it's kind of like with climate change. You know, we created Earth Day so people would focus on it. That was a long time ago, you know, but, you know, we still talk about what we think we can do to make things better. So I think it would be nice if there was like a little something we could get started. So, so let me just say, I think one of the things that NSF, I don't know how if this was a change in need, I'll probably know, but that used to be a, a prominent feature in NSF proposals was the category of benefit to society. And and I thought that was a great category to have. What's going to be your benefit to society? Not a TTP, but uh, but just using that category. And and that leads to the second thought that I'm having here is that, we, that we've talked about in the past is being able to document success stories that are transitional and that are put into use, but that aren't aren't necessarily funded. I mean, there, as you know, there's a ton of NSF research being used that nobody has any ability to tie it back to NSF. And so having some type of a, a cultural adjustment or a, a long-term reporting so that, you know, uh, PIs might be required to, for example, off the top of my head and not proposing it, just suggesting, uh, that the PIs would agree to giving a feedback five years after their project ends. One, one paper five years after their project ends to describe what has happened with their idea since it left NSF. I, I'm just saying, coming up with a strategy to try and document benefits to society and making that a more prominent aspect. Anita, are you interested in commenting on that at all, if you're available? Um, I mean, that's part of every, you know, expectation, expectation of every NSF grant. I think there needs to be more I mean, I, 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 so I think part of what you say is, is correct. Culturally, within NSF program directors, they don't, there is a resistance to like real world putting out a thing. 
Um, but I think they're also, I mean, a suggestion I think from this workshop should be, um, there's got to be this push pull where PIs can only, I mean, it, it is not an insignificant amount of time to write these grants. I mean, it is a, a huge amount of hours. There's got to be, I think, which I, I saw when Mike Posman here was at DHS with TTP, there was this push pull where he went out and did, you know, he called it technology foraging. And I think that's part, I personally think that's part of what NSF should be doing. There's an awful lot of research that's dropped on the floor. There's a lot that's not funded. Maybe the panelists didn't like it that day, but it's still really good. I think there should be more of it internally. Let's go back and kind of figure out, especially in hot areas, what do we miss? And maybe do some encouraging of PIs. I think until NSF agrees to that, it's going to be the the uh, archaic system of spend six months of your life on this proposal that might get trashed in five minutes. And I think, uh, so uh, we want to support those researchers who are interested in taking the technology, you know, all the way into practice. Uh, but as we heard, that, that takes a while. It takes a real commitment. Not every NSF-funded researcher is, is interested in that long journey, but they may be interested in helping push that push it along to the next step. And so having that artifact to go with the research paper, having some some feedback saying, you know, here's why this technology that was produced as basic research is still relevant and is is ready for somebody else to pick up and and move along in the, in the next step, I think um, uh, uh, could be helpful. So if we can if we can get the right incentives uh, all throughout the process, so it's it's not Good on the researchers who are ready to take it all the way from basic research to to the startup company to commercialization, but also for the researchers that just are, are moving it down the road. I think we can work we can work on different incentives. Yeah, Florence, go ahead. No, I talk too much. I'm Italian and a New Yorker, so stop me if you need to. But. You know, I'm thinking about and the reason I brought up the COVID Info Commons, what we've done was we created a researcher working group and we created a student working group. And so and the students are allowed to come to both because they are researchers, you know, but um, if, you know, if folks want to be with other people that are mostly funded by NSF and NIH, that's that's what the researcher working group is. But if we were to create a community like that, um, it might help us find people who are earlier in their career or just interested in getting involved with this technology and seeing if they could do something with it. So if I look at Shantanu as an example, who was one of the PIs you talked about, Jim, and then I've worked with him and we had him present to the IEEE working group and I went to visit and they have this new AIM, you know, AI and IOT for medicine um, center that they've created, you know, to bring researchers, collaborators, and people who can bring things to practice together. You know, maybe um, he, he actually had a couple of students he actually brought to the TTP meeting with him. I don't know if you remember that in the corner in Chicago. They were like by the door in the left back corner when you walk in. Um, and they're the ones that were trying to bring it to practice. And then they actually worked with their technology transfer office and they contacted me and said, can we do an interview with you of how you think this technology could be applied? So it took years, but, you know, they, they were involved in it. And it might not be that you have, you know, grad students or students at your institution that are ready, but maybe there are other students somewhere, you know, that would love to get involved in it. So if we could create this community and make it, you know, like connect, like Anita said, talk to people, connect with people, meet people, share information. Maybe we can try to facilitate, you know, facilitate a collaborative community like that to give them an option that's not scary, that they don't have to go find it maybe. Maybe it can kind of come to them if they present what they're doing, um, you know, in a public way so that we can put it on YouTube. You know, people can find it like these little lightning talk videos we do that are like, you know, five to 15 minutes, not long, the researcher presenting their stuff. Maybe we can create like a kind of like a research marketplace in a way, not really a marketplace, you know, they hate saying market, but, um, you know, where they could uh, a research collaboration community for cybersecurity. And maybe that can can help give it some legs. Just a thought, you know, I think if we keep brainstorming together, maybe we can find a, a few ideas that we might want to try. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's well established that innovations move with people, and so you know uh, when people change organizations, uh, there can be a lot of good cross pollination of ideas and and innovations, and then students uh, being part of our research projects, and then going off into the private sector or going off into government, going to, to other organizations. That's another great way where innovations make their way out into the world, out into the 
in the marketplace, uh, I think another really powerful way of um, of transition to practice uh, uh, the, as the people go out into practice. I think the the innovations also go out into into practice. Um, so I'm uh, we've got about ten minutes uh, remaining on the panel. We're having a good discussion. I want to make sure that all the attendees uh, are have taken their opportunity to uh, to ask their questions or um, introduce um, any topics they want to make sure we get to. So. If you've been thinking of a topic that we haven't talked about yet, it's okay. We can take a left turn into a new topic about the future of TTP. Raise your hand, put something in the chat. Um, uh, uh, so don't don't be shy. Um, uh, so uh, while we wait for that hand raise or uh, that idea, let me uh, try for another uh, topic. Um, what do y'all think about the future of open source software as a, a future TTP, cybersecurity TTP avenue? Uh, we've got the um, the POSE program with NSF, Pathways to Enable Open Source, open source Ecosystems, and there was uh, an NSF Dear Colleague letter just this, just this week about the importance of cybersecurity in the open source software ecosystem. Um, do do y'all have ideas about how uh, how we can impact the cybersecurity of open source software and can and uh, use the open source software channel as uh, as a as a way of doing cybersecurity tech transfer is that getting easier is, is it getting harder what's who has experience with that i maybe i can go um try to answer well the second part of your question um is it getting easier I think so. Uh, so when I when I participated in the DHS TTP program, so our um, our system was open source, and the idea was to keep it open source, uh, and in fact, uh, you know, fully open source with a um, you know um, uh, MIT type license, basically. Um, and but then it was. You know, it was very difficult to understand, okay, so if um, going through the program, if one day, you know, we, we want to form a company behind to support this uh, system, how, how do we go about doing that? Um, and I think even, even at, at the program level, uh, talking to, uh, you know, people from, I think that there were some sessions with people from Stanford, for example, giving advice on how to form companies and so on and so forth. It was not quite clear to me if, if at that time, um, you know, there was enough experience, um, at least within that uh, TTP program to, to kind of um, support or encourage or guide, um, you know, participants into, into that uh, path, right? So creating a business uh, based on open source software. Nowadays, I think there are so many examples, uh, especially I think in the machine learning area at this point and data science area. Uh, and I think it, it's gonna be easier uh, for, um, you know, for, for an inventor essentially, right? To, to, to go about saying, okay, we, we keep this, the basic software open source, but then of course we, we can charge for support and for advanced features and so on and so forth. I think, I think it's much more clear now. Uh, than it used to be in the past. Yes, Mauricio, please go ahead. What I was going to suggest is uh, take a look at a company called Percona, because that's pretty much a business model. And the uh, original president, Peter Zaitsev, he's more than glad to talk about, you know, how did they get to that point? So that's my suggestion. Can you put the the link in the chat, Mauricio, for that company? Sure thing. Great. Just found it. Okay, that he can do it. You know, the there's another organization called ADSA. Actually, there are a number of ADSAs, the American Dairy um, something association. <laughs> Uh, there's an American, uh, there's a ADSA, which is an academic data science alliance, and they're actually um, working with Helios, I think, on some of these ideas, and they're going to actually have a leadership meeting, um, a quarterly call, 
um, to discuss open research, open scholarship, and academic data science. So that's a little bit different, but it's kind of connected. Um, and I don't know if any of your organizations are part of that. So usually your data science institute would be a member. I don't know if anybody can join. But um, so I think there's, you know, more and more. Um, they had a workshop earlier this year uh, with the Alliance for Open Scholarship to build guidance for open science in the data science community. Um, and it looks like they have the text on their website. So let me look for that and put it in the chat. I don't know if that's another organization you'd want to work with, but it could be interesting. I think the connections between cybersecurity and data science, cybersecurity and ML are, are of course, uh, both really a very promising active connections right now and, and, and uh, definitely for the future as well. So the next topic for discussion um, is Fred Cohen and his A2E approach and the tools he has available for us. So Fred, the floor is yours. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes. I can. When I try to share my screen, it decides I can't share my audio. <laughs> so uh, most folks uh, know me. I have a long history uh, in cybersecurity and, and doing research and development, and but also uh, many are probably less aware of the many things that I've done to bring things um, into practical application in the commercial space. Um, oh, there you go. Uh, we'll just start at the first slide. Perfect. Um, next to the the slides. Sorry? Just tell me when to move to the next pages. I, I, I will. Um, thank you for helping me in this way. Um, Gator is next to me, and he'll introduce himself. And, and But just be careful, because he's going to tell you what he is, and then you're going to say, you know, put up the, the crossed fingers to protect yourself. Go ahead, Gator. <laughs> well, uh, I'm the, uh, I, I uh, occupy the dubious professional role known as a venture capitalist. Uh, I run a small fund that's focused on uh, primarily uh, commercializing innovation in uh, artificial intelligence and cybersecurity that uh, relates to public safety and national security. So I uh, have invested in several companies that are already past uh, you know, the seed stage, but then I'm also working with Fred uh, to uh, commercialize technologies at earlier stages, including potentially some technologies coming out of federal government-based research projects. So um, when it comes to um, asking questions of somebody who will or will not um, invest, um, I would say Gator would be somebody who uh, will or will not invest. <laughs> so just letting you know. Um, as we should all know by now, it's a long way between technology and adoption. And it involves a lot of things. These things you see listed, governance and management, marketing and sales, execution and fulfillment, intellectual property and special sauce, um, you know, the uh, litigation, uh, sorry, uh, execution and fulfillment, and then the, all the legal and uh, regulatory aspects of it. Um, it takes a long time and a lot of effort, and almost certainly you can't do it alone. Um, and so what we've created is an ecosystem to support startups getting from here to there. So let's just go to the next slide. So Alec asked me to put a table of contents in which I normally don't do, but here we have it. I'm going to start with how it came to be, what it is, how does it work, our plan and your part in it. And the commentary on the right side is for your enjoyment. We'll go to the next slide. <laughs> so, you know, being as I, I came up as an engineer and, you know, and like that, I like to look at numbers and try and figure things out with numbers. And uh, there's a, really widely used and, uh, and cited paper by uh, Wilt Bank from Willamette University who looked at investment in startups by angel groups. And this is, uh, these are groups of typically, you know, tens to hundreds, and, and in some cases it gets up over a thousand um, investors. They're angel investors. They're not at the venture level. Typically, on average, they'll invest $25,000 per year per individual. So if you have a thousand of them, that gets to be a substantial amount of money. And they do in-depth due diligence. And in particular, the angel groups he looked at are the ones that, that go and do this in-depth effort to try and figure out whether this is actually worth putting their hard-earned money after taxes into it. 
with the, the hope and expectation that someday they'll have more money than they put in. Um, they also support those companies. So once they put money into a company, well, one of the folks that I know from one of these groups said, uh, he only uh, invests in companies that are within 100 miles of where he lives. And he says, I like to visit my money. Um, so, you know, the study covered 10 years after investment. So you put your money in, it's now 10 years later, what happened? So 70% have not returned the invested capital. Okay, so that's, that's we'll call that the failure rate. But not even that, that's, that doesn't give you, get you home. 22% return between 1x and 10x, one times the investment and 10 times the investment. So 92%, if you do the calculation and wave your hands a lot, 92% of your investments come to nothing. They, they break even. So the only way you make money is on the last 8%. So 4% return between 10x and 30x, and another 4% more than 30x. Um, and this is a paper now, it's you know, 10, 12 years old, and people cite it still, and there haven't been any other studies that are better. There have been a couple of follow-on studies that indicate more or less the same thing. The interesting part, and the reason it's worth investing in this space, is because the internal rate of return, that's the return on investment, but you haven't gotten the money out yet, um, is about 24% per year, which comes out to about 9x in 10 years. So you multiply your money by 9 in 10 years, but it takes 10 years to get there. Um, venture capital, by uh, comparison, typically invests for 3x in 10 years, which is 11.7% internal rate of return. The average exit time at that point was four and a half years. The average exit time right now is probably about six years. So let's just assume these facts are correct. And the question is, how can I invest to get those returns? How can I multiply my money by 10, uh, nine, nine times in 10 years? And so the other thing about statistics is what they say is that if you invest in one company, your odds of success are low, okay? um, you know, 8%. But if you want to get that average return, you probably need to have something like 45 investments. Okay. Now, let, let me just do a quick calculation. Uh, $25,000 times 40 is a million dollars. Uh, does anybody here have a spare million dollars to put at risk? Just just raise your hands. I can't see you all, but I, I will bet that not many of you have raised your hands. And there lies the problem. Um, so, you know, if you want to get a 95% likelihood of a return, how do you fix this problem? So uh, my approach was to find a niche with rising votes. So AI, for example, is probably at this point a niche with rising votes. But remember, you're not going to get out for six years, so it better be something that's going to continue to rise for the next six years or three years from now when it stops rising and the people who got in three years ago are saying, yay, we got out. Everybody else is going, oh, no, <laughs> and, and losing everything they put in. So you need something that's going to last long enough. Um, and so the idea then is to invest in a portfolio of companies in that niche. And you have to design it so that the failures aren't 100% losses, which means you need the contractual mechanisms and the, the ability to reuse the people so that a person in a company who's a good person in a company that didn't succeed has an opportunity to move on to a more successful company. And maybe even the more successful ones can buy out the less successful ones. Um, and then you want to make sure that these successes leverage those failures and you try for positive cash flow. Part of the problem is, yeah, getting money 10 years from now is a good thing, but it would be nice if you can continue to eat between now and then. So you, so you need to be able to get some cash out of it along the way. So, and, and did I mention I'm not a billionaire? Okay, I'll mention it now. I'm not a billionaire, so I can't just throw out you know, a million here and a million there. Eventually it adds up, right? Uh, by the way, the people that invest a billion dollars a year, they still can't invest, you know, in companies at a million dollars because that'd be a thousand investments. And if you're going to do any kind of due diligence, you can't do diligence on a thousand companies in a year, even with a team. So probably you're looking at 20 investments per year at max, which means $50 million per investment. Uh, but they're not going to be investing in my companies until they're worth $50 million. Next slide. So all I need, oh, that's the, thank you. You moved too far. So the question is, how do I hack the system? Because I don't have a pile of money and I, you know, and all this. So let's start with what it takes to succeed. You need a good CEO and a good team. 
a good technology, excellent marketing and sales, proper legal footing, out, an outstanding capacity to fulfill, and money and time to get there. And so then the question is, what do you guys have? And, and for the most part, people that are trying to start companies and people you know, that have developed the technology and, and research or something, and that you're trying to transition to practice, you may have a good technology, you might not, but you'll have some technology, and you probably have a technical lead and a, and a limited team. So the question then is, what do I need to succeed with your technology and your lead? And the answer is everything you have plus everything else. And that's the big idea. That's where I went, aha, all I need is everything else. No problem. So in order to get the everything else, I had to build an ecosystem to help grow companies. Let's go to the next slide. So started this in about 2016 for Angel to Exit. I've been doing startups for a long time. The first uh, really successful one was in the 1980s, started in like uh, 86. Um, that one, um, I guess we ended up going from eight to 250 employees in less than six months. Um, we, it turns out we exited when another, one of our competitors went public first, so they ended up buying everything out. So we suffered the consequences of not going public soon enough uh, but everything buying out is not all that bad a thing, right? So maybe a couple of years ago, we were at um, 100 people using our technology per year uh, to start the process of, of getting their company going. We built the technology over time using technology we already had in place for other purposes. We repurposed it. We have a platform. We have events, all sorts of stuff we'll talk about. So basically what I did over the last you know seven or so years was build it, you know, if there's a build buy decision, I don't have a billion dollars, so I had to build it. Next slide. So here's the way we look at things, the way I look at things, um, and the way we structure things for analytical purposes and for doing metrics on companies and for doing valuations and other similar things. Um, the, you know, these categories, governance um, and management, um, marketing and sales, execution and fulfillment, intellectual property and special sauce, financial uh, situation and path forward, and the legal situation. And what you need is people that know about all these things, not just somebody off the street that says, oh, I have a degree in accounting. Um, you need somebody, for example, one of our uh, folks that does uh, the finance, uh, is, uh, he was retired um, CFO, Chief Financial Officer for um, American Express International, which is composed of maybe 100 or so small companies. So he's effectively been the CFO for 100 small companies simultaneously. <laughs> so he's got to know what he's doing and has been successful at it, right? So that's what you're looking for. Typically, these are you know mature people. I mean, look at the governance space, right? Yeah, a lot of these folks are ex-CEOs you know, CEOs or current CEOs. Um, and the key here is they've seen this movie because – you know, what goes wrong is almost always something that somebody has seen go wrong before. So that's what you need. You need those people that are really good at what they do in these different areas. And you can trust me when I tell you that having spent a lifetime trying to be good in all of these areas, nobody is good in all of these areas. <laughs> Just period. Um, so, so you can't do it by yourself. Um, so we built the ecosystem. We have a bunch of stuff in it. And you know, we'll talk a little bit about it maybe later. But Let's go to the next slide. Okay, another thing you need if you want to be efficient and effective and not spend a lot of time and money is the technology to support growth. So to start a company, we start with metrics. That's that thing in the bottom left-hand side. And, and we ask about 48 questions of the company, and, and there are about five different levels of answers, and we describe the information you would need to back up your answer because there's a basis for claiming that you're at some level. So when you say, now our product is ready to go on the market, right? And then so we, we have a description that says, well, here's the 25 things you need to have documented to demonstrate to me that it's ready to go on the market. You don't have those 25 things. You're not ready to go on the market. And it's the same for each of those 28 categories. So we start with metrics. And then the metrics also go into a portfolio. You know, I'm not looking to start one company. I'm looking at, well, this year we're starting, I'll have a slide a little bit later on it, but we're trying to start an average now of one cybersecurity company per month from scratch and, and trying to do that on an ongoing basis. Think about that 
four years of that will get you, you know, 48 companies. And that would be enough to have a portfolio of cybersecurity companies likely to get that level of return. <clears throat> okay. So you then need some sort of a model that says, you know, here's how it all works, here's how it all fits together, and you need to be able to manage it. So we have tools to support all of this stuff, including go-to-market development. You know, we have a, a tool that takes the characteristics of the customers, takes the aspects of, of your company, and then automatically associates those with each other to figure out which of those aspects of your company are appropriate for that customer base you're trying to sell into. And then it uses, you know, a generative AI to do a preliminary generation of um, expressions of memes to communicate to those customers, which you then have an expert that goes and fixes it because, you know what, ChatGPT is great at making stuff up and it, it's the, the greatest BS generator of all time, but we do need to be truthful <laughs> in what we tell our customers or, you know, maybe not. Next slide. And then we have events. So without activity interacting with other human beings, things aren't going to work. And, and there's a, a trick to this. The trick is if somebody's going to give you money, if you're going to get money from somewhere, it's got to be somebody other than you or you're not going to make any money. So that means you need to engage with somebody else who's going to give you the money. And the more people you engage with that have the money, the more likely you are to get some of it. <laughs> so fundamentally, you need interaction. So we have a monthly open advisory call. Basically, anybody that interacts with us that says, oh, we'd like to tell you about something, we say, come to our free advisory call. You'll get a couple minutes to talk. Everybody else will get a couple minutes to talk. We'll ask questions. We'll see whether we sort of get along well enough to move forward. And if so, we'll go to the next step. Plus, the other people in the room, besides me, might be interested, and they might say, hey, get in touch with me. Let me help you here. Oh, I can do this. Oh, so they get together and you, you form, you know, individuals form groups. And we are overjoyed if three people on our call get together and do something successful and it doesn't involve us. Because, you know, we help grow companies. That's what we do. And if it helps you, then that's good for us. We also have a weekly closed advisory call. This is a call among the advisors that are signed non-disclosures that we work with. And we have about 25 folks that, you know, showed up on yesterday. Um, and we talk, this particular group is heavy in the cybersecurity space. And um, you wish you were in that room. And no, we don't record it. And if we recorded it, then you would not be able to do what we do in those calls. So a lot of fun, really interesting. But also, it keeps your mind going, right? Getting your mind to, to think about these issues, getting more opinions, getting more points of views in a friendly, you know, relatively safe place but with smart people who will disagree with you. It's important to have people that disagree with you and challenge what you say. We also have a monthly CEOs forum. This is for our CEOs. The CEOs from all of our portfolio companies get together on the call and they help each other succeed. So part of the game here is you need synergy to succeed, right? If you have a little teeny company, a couple of people, three, five, 10 people, you know, you may not have all the connections of the other guy that has three, five, or 10 people. So when you get 10 or 15 of these folks together every month, one of them says, oh, I ran into somebody who'd be interested in what you have. Oh, great, introduce me. So that you introduce each other. Maybe they know a better insurance broker than the one you're dealing with. Maybe they, don't, they know a good lawyer for this kind of intellectual, intellectual property prosecution, right? Whatever it is, it helps, you know, to have friends and people who have seen the you know, other parts of the movie <laughs> that you're watching. Um, we also have the Cyber Show. Um, breaking news on the Cyber Show. You can listen to this on KMBY Radio, uh, 1240 AM, Wednesdays at 9 AM Pacific time, if you're here. <laughs> but if you're not, you can listen, obviously, over the internet. Um, there's, there's a live feed, and the recorded shows are there. This is a way that companies reach the general public. So the, the, ch the station has maybe a million listeners at any given time, 100,000 are listening. So that's 100,000 people in this area of the world. Probably 10% of those or more are accredited investors. It's at 9 a.m., so it's you know the end of drive time, the beginning of take your kids to school time, and then a lot of people listen from work. So that gets companies exposure to that environment. It also allows us to have interesting discussions with people with expertise in the field and help people learn about cybersecurity. We have a segment called Fraud, Spies, and Lies, and How to Defeat Them that's named after a book. So we talk about a fraud, you know, this kind of fraud or that kind of fraud, and how it works and why they do it. 
and then you talk about how you can you know, not be affected by it. Um, so then we also have uh, ELN and conferences. We just yesterday acquired um, ELN Enterprise Leadership Network, and they have a cybersecurity conference uh, every other month, and they're going to have one every month next year, where they have CISOs, Chief Information Security Officers, and other people in similar positions that get together. And this gives our companies the opportunity to get in front of their real customer base if they're selling cybersecurity stuff. So, you know, these are the people at those large and medium enterprises that will actually buy it. And whereas it's not a whole customer base, it's a place to get answers to those questions, to listen to opinions, talk about subjects, and so forth. So that's another thing that, that you know, you need in your ecosystem, and you heard other ways of doing it. Well, this is how we do it. And then we have GoToAngel. That's where you can present your company in front of, uh, you know, potential investors. We'll send the information, but you have to fill out GWiz. You have to fill out the the growth wizard, so we have metrics on your company, and it's in a standard form that investors can look at and understand, as opposed to your custom spreadsheet, which nobody can understand, probably including you after a day of being away from it. So that provides a means to get in touch with investors. Um, so the events uh, provide all of those things that you heard about from these other types of accelerators. And just for context, Angel to Exit is, according to the folks uh, uh, that do this in the regional newspaper, the sixth largest accelerator in the San Francisco Bay Area region of California. And we're like 60 miles from San Francisco. <laughs> so a pretty big region. Let's go to the next slide. So this is the program we have for uh, cybersecurity companies. And we're going to call it our psycho program because, you know, you got to be nuts. Um, uh, they, of course. The, 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 maybe the most important thing to learn about being in the business of cybersecurity is nobody wants it. They only get it because they have to have it. And, and I'll give you an example. You can ask any customer this question, and you can bet on the answer. You have an, you have an option. You can spend $20,000 right now on a cybersecurity program, or you can take your family on a vacation this year. Which one is it? <laughs> okay. Uh, how about bars on your windows? You know, we have a beautiful view. It's wonderful glass, but you know what would really make it better would be bars. Oh, what, I really, no, nobody wants bars on their windows. They have them because they have to. So, so fundamentally, you know, this is pushing a heavy rock up a steep hill with somebody jumping up and down on top of it and a, a chain tying it to the valve. So our goal is to start one psycho uh, cybersecurity company, one psycho per month, it might, we might be talking about the founder when we say that. Um, and we have support. The support includes the half-time executive assistant. That's somebody who can just take the load off of the trivia that you have to do every day to just get everything done. Um, we have a half-time top of sales civ person, somebody that can generate about 100 sales leads per month um, uh, and sieve them down to like three or four of them that might actually be interested who you can then talk to. Um, uh, we have a chartered accountant that'll do the books, you know, so so they'll have read-only access to the bank account and the credit card and all that stuff, and they'll generate a set of what amounts to um, auditable books so that investors can put money into the company and know that they're going to get the information from an independent third party about what's going on financially. Uh, we have an advisory board, and, and the advisory board brings experts that help advise the company in different areas. And they're not just cybersecurity experts, they're experts in finance and accounting and sales and marketing and the other things you need. You know, the deal is, you know, you don't really need help in the things you already know about. What you need is help in the things you don't know about. We also have a CFO assistant. We have a, the radio show presence. We have a variety of tools for helping to grow companies, not for cybersecurity. Well, we also have those tools, but that's different. And of course, the conference presence. It's a standard plan, sort of. Basically, you get three months to plan it. We work with you on a weekly basis, an hour meeting every week, plus some additional meetings to help plan out this thing where you're going to get investors. At that point, um, if you have a good plan and if the investors say yes, then 30 k a month burn rate for nine months. And the goal is in nine months to get to some place where you can generate enough cash to sustain the company. And if you can't get there, if you can get close, you might still be able to get more money. But if you get there, you'll probably be able to get more money if you need it for growth. Now, I just want to note, you know, what we heard here was, oh, you know, funding of, you know, five, six million dollars um, over a couple of years and another couple of years to go. 
to build all of this technology out. Well, that's kind of money you're not going to get from any startup funding group that I'm aware of. And I'll just ask Gator about this because he knows all about that. So, so what does it take to get, say, five or six million dollars a year burn rate? Uh, well, to get an investment like that, typically investors are going to be looking for a company that's already generating north of a million dollars a year in what's referred to as annual recurring revenue, uh, which means you have signed contracts with credible customers uh, that uh, add up to more than a million dollars uh, a year in, uh, in book revenue. Uh, that's uh, a relatively you know, steep hurdle for most startups. I would say, again, on the basis of statistics that we see in the software space, typically 80 to 90 percent of founded companies aren't able to clear the million dollar ARR uh, uh, hurdle. So that would give, I think, some sense of uh, you know, the challenges of attracting you know, that type of capital from, from private uh, investors. Yeah, and that takes time to get there. And every once in a while, um, I have what a, a friend of mine in industry calls the dumb money. <laughs> and, and every once in a while, you find somebody that says, oh, $5 million? That looks interesting here. <laughs> um, I've never actually met such a person, but I, I've heard rumors, and I've actually met a couple people that got funded that way. I've only probably met 20, 30,000 people in the last you know couple of years. So maybe every one in 10,000 will come across that. Um, and so in any case, then there's more money if you're successful, if you need it. And just in 2023 to date, we've had about eight tries. So we're at month nine, so we're a little bit behind. Um, we have three entities that are um, sort of running, actually. A couple of them are, are just going to start running in the next probably week. Um, and then uh, we have two that are sort of pending. They're, they're in that three-month period. And we try to always have two or three in the three-month period. Um, so, so we will hopefully get to 10 or something like that total this year instead of the 12 we aimed at. But next year, we'll get to 12 and maybe have to make it up by going to 14. I'm not sure. So that, that's where we're aiming. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so look. There's a lot of stuff to do to get from where you are to where you need to be to be successful. And I'll give you a little bit of motivation. You know, TTP is about getting people to use the technology that's developed. And that's great. And, you know, so when you devise these uh, programs to give to AARP with nonprofits, that's fabulous. And getting that government funding behind it is fabulous. But if you want something that's going to grow and sustain and really have a an effect on the world changing it. There are sort of two things that I know of institutionally over time that have done this. And one of them is religion, and we don't do that. And the other one is a successful company. And, and other than that, nothing really works to grow to the point where you can have a global effect. Now, having said that, you know, I've done research in my day and still do some. And so, yeah, my research in computer viruses early on had a very large effect on the world. But if you look at that effect, the commercialization of that technology that created this multi-billion dollar industry, it's probably a hundred billion a year by now, that whole industry got created by commercial efforts, not by that research effort. So, and, and by the way, it didn't happen overnight. I'll, I'll just give you a sense of this. Typically from the creation of a new technology in cybersecurity till its adoption is 20 years, widespread adoption. And, and so 20 years, just think about this. If you patent something, the duration of a patent is 20 years. So probably if you came up with a great idea, you invented something really clever, you took it to the patent office, you patented it, and it was in cybersecurity. Um, if it's becoming popular today, that's because that was 21 years ago. <laughs> so just trying to tell you like it is. So there's a lot of long way to go. You need to be able to measure things. You need to be able to have governance in place. You need to be able to manage the people and the process to grow. You need to be able to explain it to others. One of the folks earlier on said, oh, man, we had to meet, you know, once a month with these folks, sometimes more often than that. Our advisory boards meet with every company and the head of the advisory board once a week. It's a one-hour meeting every week with the head of the advisory board, the whole advisory board once a month. And 
you have to have monthly reports that go to the financial folks and every quarter you need, you know, basically a thorough financial review. And, you know, it takes supervision. It takes a team of people. And the idea that you're going to do something every once in a while, no. You're going to have periodic processes. The most important thing towards that success once you get started is to mature the company to where it's running at the managed level of maturity, right? So you start out the first time you've done nothing. So you're at no maturity. You did it once. That's initial. You get a repeatable process. Something can happen again and again. The same inputs produce the same results, at least on a statistical basis. Then you get to where it's defined, so you have it all documented. After that, you get to manage where you're measuring things all the time and adapting them, not based on what already happened, but what you anticipate is going to happen based on what you're measuring. So when you're going to you know, do a sales process that takes nine months, you better know before nine months whether something's going to sell or not. Not the specific sale, but statistically. And if you're metrics are telling you that you know you're a third of the way there and your and your numbers are lower than they should be you need something to fix that now not six months from now when you find out that you didn't make the numbers and you're out of business so maturing the company is critically important and then it's all about understanding and improving to get from here to there so there are a lot of stuff to do let's go to the next slide i think that might be the last one there might be one more so look there's an opportunity in front of any of you that want to work, you know, really hard for five to 10 years at almost no pay with very little support and funding to grow a company and then become, um, uh, get to an exit where you only own 5% of the company and it's worth $50 million. So you've worked 10 years for $250,000 or <laughs> you can try it our way, which is, you know, you end up deciding along the way, you know, how to scale, how much to scale. Um, and where to take money and when to take money, and you make better decisions about this, backed by people that are serious in the space, um, and with the assistance you need. And when you think about it, you know, if you need a team of 20 people to get this thing going, then, you know, if you think you're going to have 80% of the company that's going to be worth a billion dollars, uh, there might be one in every million companies that does that, but mostly that's not what happens. I'm overjoyed to take questions and comments, and, and if you don't ask me good questions, I will make some comments that you won't like. I don't see anything in the chat, so does anyone have any questions? If, if it's okay, Fred, could I add a few bullets in here? You can shoot away. So... In full disclosure, I've been working with Fred pretty closely since uh, since we had our last workshop. And actually, Fred and I have known each other for 25 to 30 years, but uh, he and I have been working closely. And I just want to be sure that you all understand what this why, why he's here today. The, the topic of our workshop is the future of TTP. And so we've heard a lot about prior things, and, and, and Florence is doing some new things, and, and Anita did a great job of describing an accelerator and, and their changes coming to, to uh, i -Core. But I, I believe that it's extremely important to introduce Fed, uh, NSF investigators to opportunities like Fred uh, provides here. Fred has, uh, when he talked about the events that he has, you don't have to be an entrepreneur. You don't have to own a business to learn about how to grow businesses with Fred, you can join his calls, you can join the cyber show, you can be part of that now and, and get to know that stuff. Or if you have already got a business started, Fred's available, the A to, uh, Angel to Exit, A2E, is available there to help you. That's, again, the really point that I want to make. I think the future of this is to have folks passive uh, mentoring, and we offered that at South Alabama. We thought that was a good idea to have a mentoring program for companies that wanted help, but we didn't get any calls. The phone didn't ring. We're the Maytag repairman, but but Fred is the person that can actively help you grow, and I'll give you an example of, a, of one of the bit of expertise he provides. Technologists are not great CEOs, and Fred has a forum where he is cultivating and maturing CEOs that will join with technologists to start to, to grow a company based on the technology that comes out of an NSF grant. 
So I, I, I just wanted to make those general comments because in Fred's talk, took me a long time to get those bullets out of talking with Fred because Fred gets so excited about the, the things that he's doing and, and the way, but, but the bottom line is there's nobody better at it than Fred. And so I wanted to, to make that pitch for you. Well, thank you. And just, just to clarify, the reason Alec knows how to shoot is because he's an ex-Marine. <laughs> this is true. All right. So since nobody's asked any questions or made any comments in the chat yet, I just want to comment on a few things I heard earlier, which are going to make you unhappy. So one of them is, is somebody talked about zero trust. Okay. And I got to tell you this concept of zero trust where we don't trust anybody for anything is not only not workable, it's impossible. And you could not survive if you actually lived in that way. You could not walk across the street because you wouldn't trust the concrete you're walking on. You couldn't go out the door for the same reason. So the idea that we, we aren't going to trust anything and or verify everything, and we're going to do it at, at the finest granularity is not realizable. And, and this is something that's been known for many, many years. And so what it is, is a breakthrough in marketing technology, right? The term zero trust is something that caught on and, and they managed to get the president to sign off on it. So now zero trust is in the military and now they start to try and implement and, and by the way, mostly what they mean is identity management, <laughs> which has been around for a long time. Um, but, but you try the zero trust thing, <clears throat> you try to push it too far, and what you find out is there are no tools. If you had the tools, the complexity of operations is way too high, and you keep end up trusting things. In fact, the one thing that you do most is aggregate risk in the zero trust tools. So what you've done is trusted the tools and the tool makers instead of trusting the people. Now, there's another really important aspect of that, and and that is that you cannot work with somebody you don't trust, okay? Why do insiders at high levels of corporations get away with it? Why do they get a golden parachute instead of a boot in the butt? Now, the answer is simple. The CEO, the CFO, if they don't trust each other, they cannot work together every day. And psychologically, they cannot tolerate the notion of not trusting the person that's sitting next to them. And yeah, the bad guys exploit that. But you know what? The vast majority of everybody out there is not a bad guy. They're good guys. If we turn our society into a society of paranoid schizophrenics, I don't think we're going to be better off. So what we need is something to reasonably identify people that aren't trustworthy and deal with them in a manner that helps the society as a whole. And the net effect of that will be that we don't have, you know, the, the larger number of untrusted people having a larger scale effect. Um, so, so I think that that's one area. Another thing I heard was about with regard to MGM, uh, you know, the, this uh, break in uh, in Las Vegas in the last couple of days. Um, uh, the comment I heard was something to the effect of, um, you know, we're, they're not really sure about the leaks, right, what was actually leaked. Okay, so here's the actual effects. They had an automated system for letting people in their rooms. People could not get into their rooms. So, you know, I guess a third of the rooms where people were trying to get in, you know, to go to the bathroom or go to bed at night, they couldn't get into the room. And, you know, there isn't somebody with a bypass key because it was all electronics. They had to shut that down. People could not get into their rooms. That is not a leakage of information problem. That's an operational technology denial of services attack, right? A failure to have availability. So, so people, and, and this is uh, in, throughout the industry for many years, they keep saying that, that, you know, oh, somebody broke into the Pentagon cyber systems, but no, no classified information was leaked. That's correct. All they got was all the supply and logistics information about you know the weapons getting to somewhere and the, the road they were traveling on, to planning to travel on. And, and so the next week, those people got bombed and they didn't get there because that technically wasn't classified information at the time until it became part of an operation. Okay, guess what? It's not the leakage of the information, um, but uh, of the classified information. It's the leakage of the unclassified aggregated together to get you the information you need. And that's what's happening in targeted attacks right now. 
spear phishing, right? Spear phishing attacks. Here's an example of a spear phishing attack that uh, was done intentionally by somebody authorized to do it um, against a CISO of a company who, who has a consultant. And they said, just keep doing it to me. And when you succeed, I'll buy you dinner. And when you fail, um, you'll buy me a case of beer. Okay. So one of the attacks he did was he got all the details off the internet about the man and his family and his kids and where they went to school. And he started, you know, getting um, into a social media environment where the child was interacting with the child, claiming to be another child, started to get information on the child about the school, what they liked and all this stuff and got into the deal with their friends. And then one day decided I'm going to send a message with the logo of the school, with a fake website from the school that says that there's a lockdown at the school and your child is potentially in danger. <laughs> okay. Um, but don't call the school. We're overwhelmed with calls right now. Just call this emergency number. <laughs> of course, he calls the emergency number and is told, you know, here's where you go to pick up your child and took, you know, took his car in a rush out of work to go to that place where there was no child. There was no event. There was no incident. <laughs> Sorry. You know, gotcha. Right. So that's the level at which people are doing intelligence operations to get, you know, the information they need to do these social exploitation attacks. And it's not about leaking secrets. It's about gaining access to publicly available information and about how you react to somebody who calls up a grandparent with the emulated voice of their grandchild saying, Grandpa, I'm in jail. I need bail. Can you just give me your credit card number? You know, can you just here, you know, click here to pay off, pay off the jail to let me out on bail. I'm scared with the child's voice. That's what's happening out in the world. Um, and the last one was somebody said, you only need one customer. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Well, maybe if you're selling to DOD and your one customer is, you know, the, the army and you're selling all the shoes to the army, you know, for the next 20 years, okay, if you can get that contract, that's fine. You might only need one customer. But almost any business that we're going to fund is going to have to have a volume of customers generating sufficient revenue with low enough costs so that the investment can be returned in a substantial multiple in a defined period of time. And it has to be a sustainable business because at the end of the day, nobody's going to buy it five years later if you just sold the last one you're ever going to sell. So having now said that, are you still have nothing new to say? Okay. Well, I can be patient. Any questions or comments for Fred? Uh, just one quick question. The is me Said Reza. Uh, you talked about the zero trust. Hi. Uh, that's a great. Uh, yeah. But IBM, if you, IBM also introduced the zero trust framework and DOD also using that framework. So what's your thoughts on that? They had no choice. The president said you will adopt zero trust. The military had to say we're going to adopt zero trust. So they have something that they're going to call zero trust. It's not about zero and it's not about trust. It's about identity management. So IBM says, well, if you're going to sell to the government, which we do, we need to have something called zero trust. So they came up with something called zero trust that met the list of things that the DOD said constituted zero trust. And, and they'll offer it to the government, right? If the government says we want purple shoes that break down in five weeks and the president says we need it and there's a procurement for it, then you can bet that there will be a shoe company that will sell it to them. Sound enough. Thank you. Yeah, they just for clarity. So I, I you know, I uh, have been uh, posting memes out on the internet. Don't trust zero trust, right? Did that for a while, uh, and and there are all sorts of reasons. And I wrote a series of papers. If you go to all.net, a l l dot n e t, you can read monthly articles. I've been writing them there for the last twenty five plus years. It's probably getting on towards thirty years now. And so we write, wrote a series of articles just walking through um, all of the, the various claims about zero trust, right? And all of the claims, they're pal palpably inconsistent, right? They talk about getting to a basically infinite granularity, but they never do, right? Um, they talk about not trusting anybody, and the way you don't trust anybody is by trusting the system that says you don't trust anybody, um, and, and so forth, right? So all that's been written up in detail, but that doesn't stop the machine, the money generating machine from working. 
So what they've basically adopted is identity management practices that have been there for a long time. And so, you know, identity management's a good thing, right? So they're just using the name. That's what I said. It's a breakthrough in marketing technology. They've used the name as a method to market something that's actually useful to people into that environment. Now, one of the guys I worked with for a long time, he was the head uh, researcher, uh, sorry, uh, analyst for the, the advisory and consulting service at Gartner. And what, what he said was that, yes, I know all that's true, but you know, when people go after the zero trust thing, on the path to that, they do better identity management and that's good for them. So he said, I don't mind that they call it zero trust, right? the fact that the term is inconsistent, that the memes surrounding it are lies, that it won't actually ever get you to any level of perfection they claim, it doesn't matter because they are improving along the way. And I think that's a healthier attitude if your goal is to sell things and help people, right? Whereas my attitude is, hey, <laughs> I'm gonna tell it like I see it and that's just what it is. One thing, though, I would uh, just uh, chime in briefly on the zero trust perspective, which I think maybe the first or second conversation Fred and I had with each other. Uh, the the challenge of that concept for security engineers in practice, when working in an organization, for you know, from my point of view, is the marketing around zero trust tends to divert organizational leadership from the notion that it's still important to pay attention to uh, signs of insider threat, uh, signs of uh, you know, vulnerabilities or uh, difficulties in how the command chain for an organization is structured. Uh, it takes attention away from understanding kind of how does governance of the organization work and governance of the IT chain for an organization work and how those things fit together, uh, you know, which are related to identity management and good identity management tools can make all of those things work better, but in and of themselves, they don't eliminate the need to pay attention to those topics as topics in their own right. See, now, that's the difference between somebody who can talk to people with money. <laughs> <laughs> I, put the, I put extra honey coating around the same message, Fred. Yeah, yeah, just uh, adding the layer, I actually. <laughs> of course. Well, yeah, that's sales and marketing. So yeah. somebody uh, asked about uh, successful companies and such. So if you go to a2e.co or angel exit.com, in the upper right-hand corner, you see a quarterly update. It's part of our transparency program, and you will see all of the current pro, uh, companies that are in our investment profile and some statistics on exits and so forth. And if you go uh, uh, under the menu at the top middle and look at the free articles, you can read free articles for the last however many years that we've been doing those articles, once a month. And one of those is about exits. Now, it's a couple years ago, but it talks about exits you know, since the 1980s that I've had because people always ask about exits and so forth. There are also articles on all sorts of other things you might like to know, and there are free videos and, and other such content. So all.net has cybersecurity articles and information and tools forever, uh, well, since the 1980s and some since earlier than that. Uh, whereas Angel to Exit only has articles about startups and about uh, you know the aspects that we're talking about here uh, just for the last seven or eight years. So that's a that's a resource to look at. So um, rather than you know what is it? Uh, I want to teach you how to fish rather than you know hand you fish. <laughs> one uh, just to uh, just to do a little bit of again extra marketing, and this one is not uh, actually this is a portfolio company of Fred's that I'm not affiliated with. But I would highlight one company that Fred's an investor in that's been uh, pretty successful is a company called Link to, uh, which is actually a secondary market. Uh, platform for equity in startups. Um, and so uh, what's nice about that deal, which, you know, Fred's also you know, been in for a while, uh, is for companies that grow and scale. It's, it's one way to generate liquidity for, you know, founders and early employees. 
uh, in a more systematic way using secondary markets, which, you know, there's actually a number of professional VC and other funds who now acquire uh, secondary shares after a company has been founded and funded. Okay, sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, so th there are other, you know, very successful companies uh, that are there, but but um, I haven't invested. So look, as investors go, when Google came out, I said, no way. They're not, how can they ever make money? They're not charging for anything. <clears throat> and and I was right. I, uh, <laughs> so, um, no, so it, it turned out that I missed that advertising thing, right? I didn't realize they were an ad agency, not a an internet search engine. Aha, clever. Um, and, you know, so... I have not invested in some of the most successful companies in the world. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think <clears throat> one of the, if, if you have an experienced investor who's done this many times and you ask them, you know, have you had any failures? If they say no, they're either lying or they're, well, they're either lying about an experienced, being an experienced investor or they're lying about not having any failures because, you know, the numbers are against you in terms of pure quantity. And, and that's why you need the high gains, right? The high rewards for the risks you're taking. The take it that my argument is that zero trust is really transferring the trust and responsibility. And it's worse than that. So, um, look, identity management. I want to go back to identity management because I think it's a really valuable lesson in, in successful um, transition of technology to practice at an enormous scale. So the idea behind it was essentially that instead of you have a user ID and password on each system out in the world, and we manage that by managing your user ID and password on each of those systems with somebody who's the systems administrator for that system, um, is not scalable. What identity management did is it says, well, we have the phone directory, so we'll use the directory, and basically you'll log in using the directory, and the directory will point to all the places you're allowed to do stuff, and instead of signing into each one, we'll sign in once and then have access to multiples of them. And as that grew, what it ended up doing, all that theory, all that clever technology and such was worth nothing until they figured out that instead of having one systems administrator for every dozen systems, I can have one systems administrator for every oh, dozen thousand systems. So it was about a thousand to one reduction in cost and yes, the risk was aggregated. On the other hand, the automation behind it made it so that you can set more of the settings right more of the time. So on the average, that automation does better than the human being at setting all those bits for protection and authorizing and, and then removing users. My goodness, trying to automatically remove users from 100,000 systems is nuts. Um, you know, with, without that kind of automation, when you try to get a systems administrator to do it, there's no chance. You can't remember who was there was one of the big problems in security for a long time was the fact that users that were no longer authorized had did not have their authority removed yet and so on and so forth. So identity management in the late 1990s was transformative and allowed e-commerce to work over the internet. So that, that breakthrough in technology, when it got transitioned to practice, became critical, extremely successful, because it saved money by an order of magma, by three orders of magnitude, saved money in managing systems. It enabled the internet that you know now to exist. So that's the kind of transformative technology, that's the business case for identity management. And that's why it was adopted, not because of some security benefit, it was a cost benefit. If you look right now, software bill of materials, is the same thing. It's waiting to explode. Because right now, when you have somebody break into a system or you have somebody that, you know, the log4j library that was found to have a problem. So what did people do to mitigate it? Well, what they had to do is figure out every system they had that had log4j running on it. And the way they did that was, well, first manually to go to check system after system, and then they automated it, probably with a secure shell remote login or something like that. <laughs> to go to each system and see whether log4j was running. And if so, then we had to fix that system. And then we had to go create a script to fix it on those systems. 
We created that script and a bunch of systems failed because that fix didn't work well. Well, all that time in figuring it out, figuring out what I have to fix where, was time that, that when you use a, a software bill of materials properly, you can track every system that has that dependency in it almost instantly in a very short period of time and then use patch management to automatically deploy updates after a reasonable check. In the meanwhile, you can then figure out which systems you have to isolate or firewall or, or implement an additional protection on temporarily while you do the repairs so that you can continue to operate. So that's going to save orders of magnitude. It's already saving orders of magnitude of time in mitigation costs for companies that are starting to adopt it. So there's a technology as an investment, it's got to go. So don't bet in one company, bet on a couple dozen companies across the space because as those boats rise, some of them are going to still fail. Okay, that's what we're looking for as an investment strategy. That's what we're looking for in a startup, in a company that's going to change the world. I don't, Gator, is that? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the objective is to find uh, companies that have you know, truly useful technology that is both going to be commercially viable and going to make you know, a positive uh, you know, impact. I'm not a huge, uh, a huge fan of stuff in the advertising space, uh, because for, even though it's been a great source of uh great source of money and revenue for Google, Facebook, other very successful companies. Um, but I think tools around identity management, SBOM, are things that can improve greatly how e-commerce works, how deployment of software works, how implementation of cloud uh, you know, programs and you know, integrating various tools you know, at the company level with you know, computing tools at the cloud level, how all of those things work and fit together. Uh, in a way that can eliminate a lot of uh, security vulnerabilities right now and you know, genuinely make the world better and create a return on investment by you know, saving a, a large amount of money for private companies from the losses they incur right now via you know, data, you know, data breaches, denial of service, operational hijacking, you know, all sorts of things that, you know, are, that companies are prone to now due to you know, these various SBOM you know, related vulnerabilities and integration issues. So we've wasted another perfectly good hour <laughs> talking to folks about all the things they should do to become multi-billionaires never and to transition their technology to where it's widely used in a practical sense. But we, uh, you know, what's the saying? Yeah. You don't have to go home, but we can't stay here. Yeah. So, well, it's obviously, uh, obviously, uh, yeah, we look forward to uh, hearing from anybody on the call that has an interest in, uh, you're learning more about Angel to Exit and uh, your ways to potentially collaborate. Thank you, Fred. I think that was great. Um, we have your contact information, or we've posted your website in the chat, um, and the slides will be distributed. So thank you so much. Um, we do have a chat this morning. I'm sorry, a lightning talk this morning. Um, I'll probably pronounce this wrong, but Sahu Zhu. Marzal, um, if you would like to um, present on your topic, um, her title is auto, or the title is "Automating Cyber Threat Management in University Networks and Beyond by Adapting, Implementing, and Deploying Academic Research Results." Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Shu Huai Xu. I know it's challenging to pronounce. Uh, so I'm professor in computer science from University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. And I joined the uh, uh, UCCS in 2021. Prior to that, I was a professor at the UT San Antonio. Um, so this is the something I'm very excited about, uh, but I want to pick, pick your brain to uh, help me uh, I will tell you kind of my vision of the roadmap I would like to do, and they, uh, uh, so that you, I, I hope to uh, uh, receive some advice or feedback. So this is exciting in the sense that we as a professor in academia, we have done a lot of uh, fundamental research. We publish many papers uh, at the uh, high quality, top quality venues, but 
um, uh, it's as a, this workshop is about, it's actually very hard to uh, uh, um, transition them to practice for many reasons. Um, uh, yeah, we can, if you have time, we can deliberate that. So this is exciting because my OIT director of operation is excited about this. Uh, so we are partnering and my former institution, I have been trying, I, have, I had tried to work with my OIT there, but they are not uh, interested in, in a sense. Okay, so yeah, so I feel this is kind of marriage made in the heaven. Uh, so I've worked with uh, my OIT, so we uh, uh, have a connective, uh, had identified a lot of problems in our, uh, our OIT uh, cybersecurity. Uh, posture, which actually I think is a representative uh, to a certain extent, uh, which I'm going to uh, elaborate. First, uh, there is, isn't enough or sufficient cybersecurity stuff. Uh, at the UCCS, we only have three FTEs for uh, uh, entire UCCS cybersecurity. So we have uh, a, a 40 plus. Uh, staffs for the entire OIT, but only three uh, the, are uh, doing a cybersecurity. So this is a kind of uh, ironic because we have, uh, at any moment in time, we have about uh, tens of thousands of computers connected to the network. And the big headache is that uh, it's actually many thousands of uh, computers that, uh, from uh, from uh, students, faculty, staff, the BYODs. So they, 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 are, uh, uh, they are like the, like the you see, it's only computers, uh, not as uh, well managed, uh, or not even managed at all. And uh, this number three FTE, uh, according to my colleague who has access to a, a report by Educas, which is basically a, a, a higher education institutions, OITs uh, staff. If you join them to uh, kind of do take their survey, then you have access to the report. So according to the twenty twenty two report. The national, uh, the medium about uh, among all the uh, uh, higher education institutions, actually only three FTEs. I was shocked to see this uh, uh, number, but it, it, it is true. So the, uh, the second problem is that the lack of a cybersecurity budget. Uh, so at the UCCS, only about 200K per year can be spent on cybersecurity security, okay? And this 200 is barely for like paying the license of the 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 kind of a bare metal or very basic defense firewall IDS and the SIEM. Um, and this 200 k is actually slightly above the medium among the higher education institutions in 20, uh, 2022. So the medium was uh, uh, 180 k. So this again is astonishing. Uh, Essentially, it says that the uh, uh, OIT uh, staff, they just uh, barely do something that can keep it wrong, uh, keep, it, uh, keep it going. Uh, so um, according to our data, like just within one week, uh, the week of September 3rd this year, our fire was as like a, a about a two meaning or slightly below two million uh, alerts. And our IDS has uh, about a, uh, almost a 20 million <laughs> alerts. Essentially what it says is that they forget about it. They don't look at it at all. Unless there is some very uh, specific intelligence. The third problem is that there is a lack of automated uh, cybersecurity solutions with full coverage. So I highlight the full coverage because as mentioned above, we already deployed many kinds of tools, firewalls, IDS, and even some SIEM. However, these tools are from different vendors, okay? Means that these tools, they don't talk to each other. So it's just a one tool covers one piece of the, the network, another tool covers another piece. And even we piece them together, the total coverage may be only like 40% of the entire network uh, uh, system. Uh, for example, because the BYOD is not a cover at all. Uh, and then uh, a, even, a, 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 yeah, so piece them together, we cannot even coverage more. So this means that even if our OIT uh, has uh, more money to buy tools, 
that doesn't solve the problem because again, the tools from different vendors just work on their own, cover one piece of them. But then from an OIT perspective, they want to have 100% full coverage as a holistic uh, view. If you they want to do that, they, they have to do it manually. And it's impossible because they have three FTEs, only have three FTEs. So uh, because of the edge costs of the report, because of like our uh, F a, a staff and the budget are among the, or about the, um, the median. Uh, so I would say this phenomenon would be a, a, a somewhat or quite a representative. That means that many, uh, uh, university networks, they suffer this problem. So that is, uh, this is actually from a long conversation with my OIT. Um, so that actually triggers this. I've done a lot of research, uh, fundamental research, base, basic research. So I want to tra transition uh, our research to practice, basically to automate uh, a range of processes and uh, uh, at the same time, aiming to achieve 100% coverage. Uh, including the BYOD devices. So this is, uh, I feel very exciting and unfortunate because I think this is a, uh, a marriage uh, made in heaven because of your OIT actually, they wanted to do something. They realized the problem. So that's why my OIT director back a, couple, a few years ago already deployed a system called Splunk. The basic idea is that he already wanted, the, I want to connect the data as much as I can. So it turns out that uh, even the data connection is not uh, uh, a like a hundred percent coverage, but uh, we already work on the plan. How can we achieve uh, uh, the full coverage data connection? And then we can leverage the data uh, to do uh, to transition our research. Uh, so this is kind of the background of the 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 the, the, the idea we are uh, or the project we are conceiving. And then uh, this is my vision moving forward, and this is the, the most important part, I, I want to pick your brain uh, because you know this TDP much more than I do. So I'm thinking we're gonna do this, transition our practice, and then for a few years, we're gonna test it in our network and maybe a, lot of, a few other uh, universities. And uh, we're gonna, we plan to open source our system. And if like this, uh, the feedback from these universities who tested our system, uh, to not positive, then I plan to uh, uh, commercialize uh, our uh, technology. Of course, we have to like uh, uh, further develop a lot more sense because uh, like uh, here we only like um, a, like a few years we can only work on, on like a few specific tasks. Actually, I will prioritize the list of the tasks to do, meaning to transition our research into practice to provide the service. Our OIT currently. Uh, putting this way, most wanted. So uh, that's kind of like my, uh, so if you would like uh, the feedback from uh, uh, the my OIT and uh, a few other universities are positive, then I'm thinking I'm gonna probably create a company and then do SBIR, uh, uh, that kind of thing. So that's uh, that's uh, like my my vision about this. So I would, uh, would love to hear uh, from your, uh, any advice, comments, feedback. I'm going to stop here. I only have one slide. This is slide. I think this feeds right into what the previous uh, people were talking about in the focus of NSF um, and some of the TTP between research and the actual product. Because it sounds like you have a great product um, or hope to develop a great product, um, which then can be transitioned. That's the plan. That's the goal. Not, not to beat a dead horse, but I will, you know, point you back to both Anita's program, the Accelerator program, i -Corps, and also to A2E as, as places where you can get lots of resources. And also, we have a, a, a web page associated with this project that has a, a guide for PIs and some connections to uh, uh, some, some other mentors and other resources that might be helpful. Thanks very much, Anita. Okay. Thank you. I will definitely look into that. Thank you.